After the brutal war of 2204, in which the superpowers of Earth stopped just short of annihilating each other, an uneasy peace settled over what was left of civilization. During the next 50 years, governments of the United Peoples of Earth struggled to rebuild. Prosperity was just beginning to return. That's it, honey. Let out the string. The wind will do the work for you. Look at my kite, Daddy. It looks so pretty. Wish I could fly above the trees. Wild and free. Daddy, what's happening to the sunshine? Daddy, I'm scared. The whole of the planet Earth grows dark, darkened by the shadow of thousands of unidentified warships, suddenly and mysteriously multiplying in the heavens, like a massive plague of locusts. Where did they come from? Who are they? We are Dominion. In the name of the leader and his council of the seven, we claim Earth and its galaxy for our own. Escape is impossible. Resistance useless. Your weapons can do us no harm. Surrender, and you will not be killed. Military reaction is immediate. Ten. Nine. Deadly eight. missiles from all nations are launched yes. to seek yes. and destroy Yo. this unidentified Nine. threat. Dos. Uno. <laughs> Your feeble attempts are noted. You were warned. Now you will feel the power of dominion. The missiles, Earth's last desperate hope, zero in on the dominion warships. But before they can reach their target, the missiles smash into an invisible energy force field spread out across space. Peoples of Earth, hear me. If you continue to resist, there will be pain and death. All resistance ended. The governments of the United Peoples of Earth surrendered to the dark reign of the Dominion. The game begins. Dominion. Origin, unknown. Power, awesome. Its rule, evil and cruel. Dominion conquered Earth in one brutal master strike, destroying all freedom and justice. Mankind descended into slavery. But Dominion is not invincible. There is a major flaw in its plan. A secret that can be used to destroy it. But can the secret be found in time? This is the story of that search and the rebels who lead it. This is the secret of Dominion.
The year is now 2294. For over 35 years, the Dominion has prospered. Where freedom once flourished, the Dominion now rules. A continual state of war exists, and Dominion warships, heavy with arms, patrol interstellar space. No quarter is asked, none is given. Inside the lead fighter of a Dominion squadron, Colonel Stephen Richards notices one of his pilots drifting off course. Richards to Protogen 6. Watch your vectors, Lipton. Sorry, Colonel. Ignition activators are malfunctioning. Try to hang on, Lipton. Yes, sir. I'll try, sir. Colonel Richards, we're coming up on the rebel planet Cygnus 3. It's on my scanners, Major Connors. Closing on Cygnus 3 at 300 kilometers. Hold it. Lieutenant Lipton, you're out of formation again. Sorry, sir. Can't seem to hold course. Warning lights. Antimatter fuel leaking into the prime chambers. Request permission to break off and return to base. Permission granted. But tell maintenance I want some answers when I get back. Yes, sir. Lipton out. General Derek doesn't approve of your attitude toward maintenance, Colonel. Connors, my men put their lives on the line every day. I mention this problem for your own good, Richards. A word to the wise. Stow it, Connors. You're just a humanoid. Your threats don't impress me. Dominion Corps Command expects us to conquer new worlds with fighters one bolt away from the scrap heap. Your words are close to treason, Richards. This isn't the time or the place for this discussion. I merely follow my programming. All right, gentlemen. Time to go to work. 200 kilometers. Insert disc 7 into your trigger pulse systems. Geo scanners show 20 seconds to assault run. Arm your Mison cannons. We're entering Cygnus 3's atmosphere. Full power to modulators. Ten seconds. Mark. Colonel Richards, scanners indicate a rare target of opportunity. A rebel hospital. An excellent chance to increase our kill ratio. Forget it, Connors. I won't be a part of that and you know it. All units, stay with your Cygnus 3 assault plan. You've got a bloodlust, Connors. Commence firing on my command. Three, two, one, fire. Sir, they aren't sending up any fighters. Caught them completely by surprise, McGee. Most of their fighters are burning below us. Stay in assault mode. We'll take out their control. Incoming enemy fire. Two o'clock. That was close. McGee! Your approach is too low. Can't control it, Colonel. Power level reading shows activation has stopped. Switch your energy flow to alternate. I'm trying. Negative. My circuits are burned out. McGee, go to reverse thrust. Blast your way out of the dive. You've got to slow down. It's no use. Jumping like crazy. B buffeting. Starting to break up. I can't do it. Break off. Break off the attack. Get out of range. Assemble in Sector 917. Kick in hyperspace. Now. Connors, how many fighters did we lose this time? Three, Colonel. One to enemy fire. Two to malfunctions. If we're going to die in combat, I'd like to think we had protogents that at least gave us a chance. Let's get back to base. Your beloved General Derek and I are going to have a very distasteful discussion. Colonel Richards, come in. Sit down. I prefer to stand while I say what needs to be said. And just what needs to be said? General Derrick, over the past month, 15 of my men died simply because their protojets were unfit for battle. Because your technicians failed to do a proper job of maintenance. Lower your voice in this room, Colonel. You are not in a debating chamber. You are in my office and you will behave accordingly. My men are my only concern. Colonel Richards, I wouldn't risk a court-martial over this. Now you listen to me. I can guarantee you new protojets by the end of the month. Your guarantee comes a bit too late for men like McGee. Who? McGee! He died today while you sat there behind your desk. Be very careful, Richards. Don't go too far. I don't believe we have anything else to say to each other, General. If you don't mind, I've got to check on repairs. You do that. 
Good day, Colonel Richards. Good day, General. You can come out now, Connors. Giving orders not to be disturbed, General Derrick and her humanoid begin a curious ritual. Go into recept mode, Major. Receptors operational. Access file TX-10. TX-10, open. General Derrick's eyes only. File title, evidence against Stephen Richards. Is the file up to date? Completely, General. All mission observations, all conversations in this room, including the one that just took place, there's damaging evidence against Richards. Good. I want him out of my way, Connors. I've never trusted him. But his background... I've told you he's not one of us, haven't I? It's in the file, General. He's a threat to my absolute authority in this sector. And I won't have it. I've heard him threaten you, question your orders, and now the maintenance demands... Yes, but to bring him before the Council of the Seven, insubordination won't be enough. The file must prove Richards is a traitor. Perhaps the hospital reference in today's mission report will be helpful. Hospital? What are you talking about, Major? An unprotected rebel hospital came up on the scanners during the assault run. Richards refused to destroy it. Acting against my direct recommendations, he gave orders to bypass it. It's all in file. Any loyal Dominion officer would never hesitate to wipe out a rebel target. Good, Major. Very good. One more nail in his coffin. Seal the file. TX-10, seal. Further instructions... Watch him, Connors. Continue the file. One day soon, Richards will make a mistake, and then I'll have him where I want him. Watch closely, dear one. I will, General. You can count on it. On board the Dominion command ship, Colonel Richards is on his way to inspect his squadron's protojets when a stranger beckons to him from the shadows of the maintenance bay. Colonel Richards, over here. Who is it? What do you want? My name is Carl Phillips, and we need to talk. It's important to both of us. Well, come out from behind that blast guard if you want to talk. I can't be seen with you, Colonel. There's no time to explain. Just look at this image, please. What? It's my father and... And me. Over 35 years ago. You knew my father? The people who raised me told me he was a hero. He was a hero, but on the rebel side. I know. I was there. That can't be true. You're crazy. Your parents were a brilliant scientific team. They developed the plasmonic diversity drive, the basis for the first rebel fighters. My parents? Rebels? Listen to me. I'm risking my life to convince you that you're fighting on the wrong side. What happened to my parents? When the Dominion overran the main rebel base, I got away. But your parents were captured and killed. How do you know all this? I can't tell you that. But proof is on the star system Canis Minor. That star system went supernova over two years ago. Every planet was burned to a crisp. The ice moon Centiga survived. But it could only last a few more days before the power of a black hole pulls it in. Centiga? It's nothing but ice. Go there. In the research lab, under the floor, you'll find a holographic recorder. It contains a message for you from your parents. It's important. An incredible story of true, but you could be a fantastic liar. I'm not lying, Richards. You haven't much time. Phillips, I'm going to stick you in the base stockade on some trumped-up charge. But and listen, then I... I'm going to the Ice Moon Santiga. If I find out this story of yours is a lie, you'll pay for that lie with your life. Deep inside the Dominion command ship, General Derrick enters the cold metal interior of the interrogation room. Connors, why did you bring me down here? And who is this? This piece of human garbage was in the stockade. I thought we could conduct his interrogation more discreetly down here. Ah, oh, he has useful information for us. I'm sure of it. 
He is not what he pretends to be. Speak plainly, Connors. I have no time for humanoid riddles. The traitor Richards left a few hours ago, General. Destination unknown. He put Phillips here in the base stockade, charging him with striking an officer, a Lieutenant Green. I still don't see your point, Connors. Richards lied. Lieutenant Green is no longer on this base. How do you know that? I couldn't resist running the name through my memory banks. Green died in space a week ago. Well, well. Perhaps Richards has made his mistake, my pet. Release the restraint on the prisoner. <clears throat> now, Phillips, what do you have to say? I refuse to speak. Don't worry. He'll tell us everything he knows after I give him this. What is it? Twenty milligrams of phenoparaglycide. Phenoparaglycide? Why, that's... That's the truth, drug. I'm going to do a complete mind probe. But you'll rip his brain apart. Is that necessary? Yes. But before he dies, General, he'll tell us about Richard's unauthorized little trip. This is your last chance, Phillips. Tell us what Richards is doing. Tell us. You won't use the truth drug. It was outlawed years ago. You're wrong, Phillips. You're hiding something. And I mean to know what it is. Connors, give him the injection. No, no. Quiet. Hold still. Now, Phillips, let's hear your secrets. All of them. Nine hours have passed. Richards is deep in space. Suddenly... There it is, the ice moon Centiga. And the black hole is pulling it in. I must be crazy coming here. Wait, what's that? A building jammed into an ice wall. Power hover. Could be the base station. Maybe, just maybe, Phillips was telling the truth. Atmosphere probe extended and on green. The air's breathable. This must have been the research lab. Space observation equipment over there. Old trophon tubes. Phillips said the recording device was under the floor. There it is. Now, how do you operate? This recording is for my son, Stephen Richards. Three second delay until the start of message. Son, your mother and I are about to try and rescue you. One of our friends, Carl Phillips, has already escaped. He will find you, Stephen. Trust him. We have uncovered a secret while working on Emerald Tree. The secret of the Dominion. If we fail in our mission to rescue you, you must know it. Hurry, Robert. They're coming for us. Tell him about Emerald Tree. There's no time. We're done for. No, not yet. Stephen, the secret is in the Emerald Tree. To destroy Dominion, first you must destroy the... They're gone. Lord, it's cracking. Got to get off this piece of ice. The black hole is pulling it in. There. Set for blast off. Come on. Pull together. I'm moving backwards. The black hole is pulling me in. Got to break free. Hyperspace. The ice moon. It just disappeared. What were my parents trying to tell me? Secret of dominion? In an emerald tree? Communications link on flasher. Should I answer? Of course, no one knows where I've been. Colonel Richards, awaiting message. The message is from me, Richards. I'm right behind you. Connors, Derek's henchman. What's he doing out here? Oh, Major Connors, an unexpected surprise. That's right, traitor. And I've brought some friends along with me. The odds are five to one against you. What are you talking about? The general and I had a long talk with someone named Phillips. He was a spy. Can you imagine it? He told us all about your little jaunt to the ice moon Santiga. 
He died, Richard, trying to remember how to scream. You killed Phillips? Of course. But you're the one marked for elimination now, Richard. General Derrick gave the order herself. Corps Command wants you dead, traitor. I might prove more difficult to kill than you think, Connors. I sincerely hope not, because the moment you die, I become squadron commander. A pity. A brilliant career, and you throw it all away to find your rebel father's memory. Any brave last words, Colonel? No, Connors. No more words. Vector's set. Shields extended. Trigger pulses armed. Bravo! He's right behind you! It's four to one now, Connors. You'll have to do better than that. Red line! Red line! Power boosters aren't responding, Major. Breaking off to return to base. I'm tired of these malfunctions, Lipton. Get it taken care of this time. Daniel, take Lipton's place in formation. Three to one, Connors. Turn inside him, Daniels. You got him. Fire, Daniels. Fire. Good shooting. His starboard engine is torn apart. Yeah, real good, Daniels. Too good. Gotta find a way out. Power re-entry. He's trying to escape. Heading for Sydney's tree. I'm right behind you, Richards. Can't miss at this range. Cease fire. Readouts confirm. There is no way he can survive the crash. Mission final. Protojets return to base. Gunners. Well, 25,000 meters left, falling at about a thousand meters a second. There's a forest below. If I can make the angle shallow enough, I just might have a chance. Manual crash shield in place. I'm going in. Use my left arm. What's that? Hover jets? Hold on a bit longer. Help me. Please. Help me. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 2, Rebels Roused. Among the standard charts of the solar systems, chart R94 shows a small planet known as Cygnus 3. It orbits its sun every 20 hours. The temperature, geography, even the atmosphere are similar to Earth's. In the year 2294, this planet serves as the base of operations for a courageous band of rebels led by General Aldous Zane. When Earth was conquered by the mysterious Dominion, these brave resistance fighters fled to nearby star systems. Cygnus III became their command center and for over 30 years, they have desperately opposed the Dominion. As our story begins, the General's daughter, accompanied by her personal robot, is on her way to Launch Bay. Testing is about to start on two protojets captured from the Dominion in a daring raid. As usual, the robot Beta has something to say. I really don't think you should try the hyperspace system today, Christina. We don't know the protojet's command center well enough, if I may say so. You may not say so, Beta friend. I won't have you second-guessing my command decisions. Now, I've already given the order. We test hyperspace today. Well, I didn't mean to question your... Good. Ju then there's nothing more to discuss, right? Right, but I... Oh, but what? It's really nothing, I suppose... 
forget I mentioned it, Christina. Oh, wait a minute. Don't walk away like that, Beta. You can't just leave me wondering what you were going to say. Uh, do your sensors warn of some danger? Are the Dominion fighters sabotage? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Then what is it? Beta, are you all right? Oh, I'll put it to you straight. I didn't want to worry you, but... I think I'm getting a case of Traga measles. Measles? <laughs> Wait a minute, Beta. You can't get Traga measles. You're a robot. Easy for you to say. I have the same red spots you had when you were seven. It's all in my memory banks. See for yourself. They're popping out everywhere. So now just let me have a look at you. Oh, Beta, that's rust. Rust? Yes. You mean I'm not going to be forced into downtime? <laughs> Don't worry, Beta. We'll take care of those spots with a nice hot oil dip uh, right after we test those protojets. A lube bath? Now that's luxury. Oh, I feel better already. I thought you would. Oh, here comes the terrafoil. Looks like the generals. You two need a lift somewhere? Thanks, Father. We're on our way to Launch Bay. You know, you and Beta make quite a team, Christina. That's true, Father. Very true, sir. An excellent team. Perhaps even better than excellent. Quiet, Beta. Oh, there are times when I wish you hadn't programmed his memory banks with my life history in, in such detail, Father. It seems to confuse him about his operating condition. <laughs> I'll bet he's the only beta model with a bad case of hypochondria. General, I must protest. I have difficulty diagnosing my own symptoms, that's all. It's not my fault I've been programmed to be as human as possible. Now, don't get upset, beta friend. I'm not upset. <laughs> you two be good to each other, hear me? Christina, your whole squadron did great work capturing those protojets during the raid on Argon. We just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It was luck, really. Lieutenant McCormick and I will complete the checkout flights today. Maintenance still has a few modifications, then the final insignia changes. The protojets will be mission ready soon, General. Dominion protojets will make a big difference for us in the field, Father. They're, they're state of the art all the way, including hyperspace capability. We might be needing them sooner than we think. Sector 2 Recon filed a report noting a significant increase in Dominion fighter activity near the planet Ventress. They've requested backup firepower to safeguard their freshwater reservoir. We are indeed lucky to have our own water source on Cygnus 3. Many of the rebel planets depend on the Ventress reservoir for all their fresh water. Dominion interest. Hmm. Doesn't sound good, does it? Come on, Beta, we've got work to do. If Ventress needs support, Father, we'll be ready. Their water supply must be protected at all costs. General Derrick waits impatiently for the results of Major Connor's mission. The shooting down and killing of former Dominion Colonel Stephen Richards. Bridge, this is General Derrick. Has Major Connor's returned from his uh, search and destroy mission? No, General, but we have a coded transmission just in from him. Decoded for me. It's already done, sir. Log 6382 reads as follows. Richard's fighter located and downed. Survival estimate zero. We have sustained some damages. Returning to base. That's the entire transmission, General. Is there a reply, sir? No. Just tell Major Connors I'll need a full report when he returns. I'll see that he gets the message, General. Bridge out. Richards, I never really trusted your rebel heritage. It was bound to claim your allegiance someday. And your humane concerns were becoming an annoyance. You made a mistake, Richards, and I intend to capitalize on it. Now that you're dead, my precious humanoid Connors can at last be put into a position to advance my ambition. But Stephen Richards is not dead. He lies severely wounded deep in a heavily forested area of Cygnus III, his Dominion fighter a blackened mass of twisted metal. Inside the wreckage... Hello. Uh, can't move. Left arm bleeding. I got to get out. No. 
Oh, I can't make it. Concentrate, Richards. Stay awake. Oh, strange. Trapped on a rebel stronghold after what I've just learned about my parents. My crash must have been detected by someone. Uh, can't last. The crash of Stephen Richard's protojet has been detected on Cygnus 3. Red alert conditions have been sounded. Security brief. Red alert. This is an emergency. Penetration of Cygnus 3's atmosphere has been detected. One intruder now down on the planet's surface. Pilot, to your hovercraft, immediately. To your hovercraft, immediately. Orders, General? McCormick, you and Christina begin the search at once. Any word from intelligence, Father? According to the radar platform in Sector 2, several fighters entered our outer atmosphere. A single lead fighter, followed by two or three others. Whose fighters, Father? There was a positive ID. Dominion protojets. But the mystery is, they were in pursuit formation, appearing to fire on one of their own craft. But that, that doesn't make any sense at all. Shooting down one of their own people? Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe. Maybe it's a decoy, McCormick, to throw us off the real target. Find out. Locate the craft and report back. But be careful. It could be a trap. On the Dominion command ship, Major Connors reports. Come in, Connors. That is. Now tell me. You're certain Colonel Richards was disposed of properly? Scanners indicated direct hits to his power system. He definitely lost all ability to maneuver his fighter, and no one could have survived that crash. It was beautiful. So much for Richards. Let's move on to more important things, like the data on screen two, Connors. What do you make of this? Those are the locations of rebel planets, along with the resources on each. Food, fuel, water, power plants, minerals, and so on. A very detailed list, General. Those planets are the key to Dominion's total control of the galaxy. If we cannot convince them to become our allies, then we will have to destroy them one by one. A most ingenious plan, General. But where do we begin? Use your higher functions, Connors. Don't be so human. I pose a question. What is the one resource the rebels must have to continue their fight? The answer is water, General. All data confirms it. Of course. Fresh water. Which of these planets holds the rebels' largest supply? Ventress, General. In the star system Gamma Penta, it is the main source from which almost all of the rebel planets get additional water supplies. Oh, excellent. Then Ventress will be our first target. You will prepare the assault plan. Priority one, Connors, is the water. Destroy it or the planet, whatever gets the job done. Right away, General. Oh, and Connors, your good work in that Richards matter just completed has already been noted in the right places. I've seen to that, Colonel. Colonel? Why, General, I'm flattered. Don't be. I arranged your promotion to make me look good. After all, you are my creation, you know. Yes, General? Is there anything else? Call me when the assault plan for Ventress is ready for my approval. And it better be foolproof, Connors. Is that understood? Perfectly, General. Perfectly. Over a densely forested area on Cygnus 3, Rebel Hovercraft search for the Down Dominion fighter. We're in Sector A-17, Beta. Are we near those coordinates radar control gave us? Coming up on that area. I'm going to need your good eyes, Beta. I can't see much through all this foliage. Keep scanning. That wreckage must be here somewhere. Radar scans operational. Colonel, I may have spotted something, 
There's a large area of broken trees to my right. Where are you exactly, McCormick? Uh, uh, 60 degrees off your port side, Colonel. Hovering about 100 meters off the ground. Get Beta over here for a look-see. Roger. We'll be right there. What do you think, Beta? Spot anything yet? Yes. There. I'm zooming in now. Positive ID. Dominion protojet. Badly damaged. Do a med scan, Beta. Definite life form. Human. Vital signs extremely weak. But I think we're in time. Can you put us down here? With all these trees, there's not much room, but I can do it. McCormick, lock your controls into auto assist mode 2. I'm taking over. Roger, Beta. Auto assist mode 2 and locked. A bit tricky bringing two of these down at once, but here goes. Nice work, Beta. I'd say satisfactory. Okay, McCormick. Let's get out and see what we've got. Laser pistols on stun. On my way, Colonel. Look how his fighter tore through those trees. Imagine, someone's alive in there. I'm surprised it didn't explode. Can you spot any movement? A little closer and I could do a full med scan on the human inside. Be careful, Beta. This could still be some sort of trap. This is close enough. Beta, what does the scan indicate? Human life form. Severe concussion. Broken right leg and left arm. Fractures of the third, fourth, and fifth ribs. Possible internal hemorrhaging. He moved. Did you see that? Yes. His insignia shows he's a Dominion colonel. Should I contact Dr. Michaels back at base? Affirmative. Order a medical transport to these coordinates and tell them to hurry. I don't understand. Shot down by your own people? Why are you here, Dominion colonel? Why? In the briefing room on board the Dominion command ship... The plan for a strategic attack on Ventress is being reviewed. The plan is quite simple, General, but very effective. With Lieutenant Lipton leading the assault on Ventress, a total of five protojets will be deployed. Lieutenant Lipton? Thank you, sir. We'll rendezvous over the planet's main water supply. Each fighter will have six half-ton canisters of the water-soluble poison cynivore on board. They'll be released into the main channel of the River Oros, disintegrating on contact. Simple, effective. There's no way it can fail, General. The water supply on Ventress will be ruined for generations. I like the plan, Colonel. But it will require pinpoint accuracy to be completely effective. Isn't that so, Lipton? No problem, sir. After Colonel Connors outlined his plan, we locked onto the target area coordinates the last time we were over the planet. I'm certain we can complete the mission. Well, then the rebels are aware of our interest there. The element of surprise is lost. General, the rebel defenses on Ventress are totally inadequate. I don't believe they'll give us any trouble. You're sure about that, Connors? Because you're gambling your future on those assumptions. Remember, Colonel... You serve me well, or you cease to function completely. I assure you, General, absolutely no one knows of our plan. Major Connors is wrong. At this moment, a message from the planet Ventress is being transmitted to mission control at the Rebel base. Attention. Attention, Cygnus 3. Only time to say this once. Dominion fighter craft transmissions picked up on high energy probes during practice assault run this planet. Dominion plans to poison water supply with cyanivore. Situation desperate. Help requested. A short time later, in a hospital corridor on Cygnus 3, Dr. Adrian Michaels refuses General Zane's request to interrogate the Dominion patient about the Ventress message. I'm afraid the severity of the concussion has made him delirious and incoherent, General. He's semi-conscious and heavily sedated. It's no use, sir. Nothing he could say would make any sense. Just listen to him. Ah, uh, sacred. Destroy. Uh, emerald. Oh. 
Just a minute or two, Dr. Michaels. We're wasting time, General. If you want this man to survive for future interrogation or exchange, you've got to let me operate. What did he say a, a, about a secret? Has he mentioned the planet Ventress? No, definitely not. Oh, first destroy. Uh, secret. Emerald tree. You're right, Doctor. He's not making any sense. Orderlies, move the patient into the OR and prepare him for laser surgery and bone fusion. Let me know the minute he regains consciousness and keep an armed guard outside his recovery room at all times. Affirmative, General. But I can assure you, this one's not going anywhere for a while. I was hoping for some inside intelligence information on the Ventress assault. Well, he was, he was only partly conscious, Father, and in too much pain. Christina, your squadron is ready for launch. You and McCormick will use the captured Dominion protojets. Remember, cyanobore poison cannot be allowed into the water system on Ventress. The Dominion must be stopped. Fighters cleared for sequential launch in five seconds. Three, two, one, launch. All fighters, stay on frequency 7. Check in, McCormick. Checking in, Colonel. We're all in formation. Myself, Lieutenants Chernick, Baker, and Donaldson. Okay, let's run over this once more. Timing is everything. Beta? Intelligence reports show five Dominion fighters already on their way to Ventress. Christina and I will go in first. We'll take out the lead fighter before he gets to Ventress atmosphere. I come in on the left, and Baker takes the right. Chernick and Donaldson will cover the escape route. Remember, they're carrying deadly poison. We can't let them near the River Oros. That's the priority, gentlemen. We've still got a long way to go, Christina. But my long-range scanners show five Dominion fighters carrying heavy loads closing in on Ventress. We won't be able to intercept them in time at normal speed. All right, McCormick, you and I will use hyperspace. Baker, make sure the rest of you rendezvous at Ventress as soon as possible. Roger, Colonel. Setting coordinates. Coordinates set. Ready, hyperspace. Ready, Beta? Ready. On my mark. Three, two, one, hyperspace. Coming up on the backside of Ventress, Beta. Estimate contact with Dominion fighters in less than five seconds. Coming into sight. I've got a visual. Starting our assault run. Lead fighter neutralized. He's turned back. Colonel, we've been spotted. They're coming directly at us. Take the one on your right, McCormick. Beta, we'll target the two on the left. Target's plotted. Vector's coded. Let's go. Good job, Beta. Perfect, if I may say so myself. Mayday, mayday. Hit and losing power. Damage to both lasers. Dominion fighters closing... Using evasive maneuvers. Get out of here, McCormick, and that's an order. Watch it, Colonel. You can't get those Dominion fighters by yourself. I'd better before one of them gets me. You won't have to, Colonel. The cavalry has arrived. Baker, your timing's impeccable as usual. I'm right alongside you, McCormick. You heard the order. Give way to the fresh troops. With pleasure, Hotshot. These last two clowns are all ours, Colonel. Come on, let's go get them, Chernick. <laughs> Like your style, you two. McCormick and I owe you one. See you back at base. Roger. Baker out. <laughs> a most satisfying way to spend a day. Glad you enjoyed yourself, Beta. Uh, oh, goodness. Oh, my. Something's happening to me. What's the matter now? Auto sensors indicate I have a raging fever. 105 degrees, Christina. It must be Mergon fever. These are the same symptoms you had at age 12. And it was Mergon fever. I remember it. Oh. Nonsense, Beta friend. You're a robot. You can't get Mergon fever. Uh, you probably just need a new thermal shield. Trust me. Well, Mergon fever or not, there was something the matter. But you're probably right, Christina. I've adjusted my internal temperature control and... I'm feeling better already. <laughs> A bit hot under the sockets there. <laughs> Head us back to Cygnus 3, Beta. 
Maybe the Dominion prisoner has regained consciousness by now. I'm more than just a little curious about him. He's got a lot of questions to answer, and his answers could prove to be extremely interesting. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Dream? More clues follow in Episode 3, The New Allegiance. Dominion Homeworld is located on Vega, a planet of hot lava, sulfuric geysers, and deep protected caverns. It reeks of the death it cultivates throughout the galaxy. The leader and his powerful forces choose to headquarter in this place. They are comfortable here. In recent months, several dramatic setbacks have plagued Dominion Corps Command. General Derrick has been summoned for an explanation before the Disciplinary Council of the Seven, headed by the cruel and powerful Igra Thor. General Derrick, you may sit down if you wish. Thank you, Igra Thor. I prefer to stand. I speak for the entire Disciplinary Council of the Seven. You have been brought here to explain your recent mission failure. What have you to say in your defense, General? I need no defense, Igrithor. My sector has produced more conquered planets in the galaxy than any other command. You are bold, my dear. And ambitious, too. Traits the leader admires and encourages. But results are what we want, General. And your recent losses are not to be condoned. Does the Council make its position clear? I will get the leader all the results he desires. You can count on me, as you always have in the past. That's good to hear, General. But words are cheap. The leader demands immediate improvement in your sector, or your command position will be in jeopardy. Dismiss. <laughs> Stephen Richards lies in a hospital bed on the rebel planet Cygnus III. His protojet was shot down on orders from Corps Command. Now the rebels want answers. Who is this Dominion Colonel? And why is he on Cygnus III? Dr. Michaels, is the patient well enough to answer some questions? The surgery was a complete success, General, but there's still the danger of concussion, so keep this interrogation short, please. If you need me, I'll be on rounds. Now, Colonel, do you know where you are? Before I crashed, my readouts placed me over Cygnus III. Do you know who I am? You're probably General Aldous Zane, the rebel leader. I must say, I never thought I'd be face to face with you, sir. This is my daughter, Colonel Christina Zane. She led the recon force that located your protojet. I owe you, Colonel. Then repay me with truthful answers to our questions. Let's start with your name, Colonel. And why your protojet was pursued and shot down by your own Dominion forces. First, I have to ask a question of my own, sir. Did you have an operative named Phillips inside the Dominion? What about Phillips? He contacted me. told me an amazing story about my parents. He sent me to an abandoned rebel base for holographic confirmation. It's not... Your name, young man. If it's what I think it is, hope it is, our search is over. What search? Are you Stephen Richards, the son of the rebel scientist, Professor Robert Richards? Why, yes. But how did you know? We've been looking for you, Richards. I knew your father. Worked with him before he and your mother were killed by the Dominion. We sent Phillips to try and find you, to see if you would join us in our fight. But... How did you know where I was? We knew that as a boy, you were raised by Dominion people. I always felt I owed it to your father to try and contact you. But the years went by in silence. We were never even certain you were alive. Then a Dominion prisoner, during routine interrogation, told us the commander in his sector 
was a Colonel Stephen Richards. Philip's mission was to follow up that lead. So you sent Phillips to convince me I was fighting on the wrong side. Speaking of Phillips, where is he? Phillips is dead, Colonel. Dead? I put him in the base stockade on a trumped-up charge until I could check out his story. He was found out somehow, tortured and killed. Oh, no. He was a good man. I'm sorry, General. I feel responsible for his death. Phillips knew the risks involved. General, the patient needs to rest. Uh, just one more thing, Dr. Michael. Please, make it short, General. His signs are weakening. Richards, were you shot down because of what Corps Command learned from torturing Phillips? All I'm sure of is that before he fired at me, the squadron leader called me a traitor, a threat to the Dominion. I got the distinct impression my services were no longer required. Then the Dominion thinks you're dead. Well, that could be very useful to us, Father. Yes. Join us, Richards. Your father and mother would have wanted you to. Think about it. Because you can never go back to the Dominion. General, your paid informant from the planet Proton is outside. Ah, the alien called Krieg. I've been expecting him. Open the door, Connors. Yes, General. Come in, Krieg. You have something for me. First, we agree on the price, General. What I know this time is worth much. Well, that's what I like about you, Krieg. No sentiment to get in the way of business. Very well. Fifty gold standards. Two hundred, and not a standard less. We could get the information out of you other ways, alien. I deal with you, General, not with this slimy excuse for a Dominion colonel. Pay no attention, Connors. All right, Krieg. Two hundred gold standards. But this information had better be worth it. Yes. You know the planet Nitra? Of course. It's a repair station for rebel transports. We've tried to destroy it many times, but their defenses are seemingly impregnable. Not anymore. Tomorrow at exactly ten hundred hours, Nitra is going to experience a most unfortunate loss of power due to sabotage. Yours? Mine. The planet's defense shields will be down for about two minutes before their backup power source can be activated. Enough time to blast all those Cygnus III transports to little specks of cosmic dust. How can you be certain this power failure will happen so conveniently, Krieg? I just know. Take it or leave it. Will you have inside help? Let's just say money speaks with an alien tongue, too. Some of the proton workers on Nitra have expensive tastes, like mine. You have no taste at all, Krieg. Quiet, Connors. I'm curious, Krieg. What do you get out of this, beside my 200 gold standards? That's what I like about you, General. Let's just say that while those defense shields are down, the alarm on the payroll vault won't be working either. Very nice. So, both of us benefit. Now I feel I can trust your information to be correct. It's always a pleasure doing business with you, Krieg. Thank you, General. Connors, this is my chance to prove to the leader and to the Consul of the Seven that my sector is still the strongest link in Corps Command. Yes, the assault on Nitro will destroy every Cygnus III transport there. Then we'll follow up with an all-out attack on the Rebel Command Center. We'll crush the Rebel forces on Cygnus III once and for all. 900 hours on Cygnus III. The rebels anxiously await the decision of Stephen Richards. His knowledge of Dominion plans, strategy, weapons, and defenses would be invaluable to them. General Zane and his daughter discuss the situation before going in to see Richards. I just wish Phillips were here to back up Richards' story. Getting shot down right into our laps on Cygnus III seems almost too convenient, Father. I know. But we do have one source of confirmation. Beta, stay outside the door to Richard's room and use your sensors to find out if he's telling the truth. Remember, General, 
All I can do is monitor his tension levels and tell when he's not completely at ease with his answers. Well, that'll be a big help, Beta. Let's go in. Good morning, Colonel Richards. Dr. Michaels tells me you're much better today. Did you have a chance to think about joining us? That's all I've been doing, General. My head feels like it's about to explode. Colonel, are you absolutely certain that you were shot down in order to execute you for treason? Believe me, Major Connors left no doubt in my mind. The Dominion no longer trusted me. How do you feel about your parents? I still find it hard to believe they were rebels. But I don't doubt it anymore. Have you made up your mind, Richards? Yes. Thinking about Philip's death, the message from my parents... I've decided to join the rebel cause. A wise decision, Richard. You see, my parents told me they found the secret that could destroy the Dominion. Something about an emerald tree. I want to find it for them. Emerald tree? It means nothing to me. Oh, uh, Father, excuse me for a moment. Uh, I have to check on a friend. Where's she going? What do you think, Beta? Christina, monitoring his tension levels Ooh, convinces me he's telling that the truth. The door? Oh, that's Beta. You'll meet him later, I'm sure. Ah, oh, Christina, what does Beta say? What we all say, Father. Welcome to Cygnus Three, Colonel Richards. Pilots, our assault on Nitra will commence as soon as fighters are cleared for launch. I want every Cygnus Three transport destroyed. Synchronized digitals. Nine hundred hours exactly. Good hunting. Ready when you are, Lieutenant Lipton. Squadron is on green lights. Right, Barbo. Ready hyperspace on my mark. Program to Sector 116, the planet Nitra. Roger. And locked. Three, two, one, mark. <laughs> I have a visual on the planet Nitra. Probes continue to read full defensive shield power. There's still a couple of seconds to go before 1,000 hours. Sure hope those alien saboteurs down there haven't changed their minds. That's it, Lieutenant. Probes show no defensive shield. All power is out. We have two minutes. Fighters flank me at four, six, and eight o'clock. We're gonna take out every transport on those pads. Target area in sight. All fighters ready. Lasers, steady. Fire! Good work. The transports are vaporized. The whole area is a mass of flame. Let's get out of here before our two minutes are up. All fighters, back to the command ship. Lipton out. On Cygnus Three, General Zane notices a problem with Nitra's communication channel. Unusual. No signal from Nitra. Simon. Yes, General. I'm getting no signal from Nitra. Check the beam strength. Why, it's a straight line on the scope, sir. There's nothing there. Something has happened. Calling Nitra. Nitra Control. This is General Zane. Do you copy? Still a straight line, sir. Wait. I've got some. It's coming back. And keep it online. This is Nitra. Can, can anyone read me? This is General Zane on Cygnus Three. What's happened? Power source was out. Sabotage. We're sure of it. Dominion fighter attack was timed to the second. All shields were down. Nitra. What was the exact target of the Dominion fighter? The transports on the maintenance pads, General. They're all destroyed. Are you on backup power yet? Affirmative. Defense shields are back in place. Is there anything we can do to help? Negative, General. Our security people and disaster crews are on the scene. We'll handle it. Sorry about those transport signals, three. Nitra out. Christina, you and Lieutenant McCormick get the rest of the officers together and meet me in the briefing room. I have a feeling the Dominion isn't through with this. This could be the start of an all-out assault. The mood in the briefing room on Cygnus Three is a somber one. The loss of the transports leaves the rebels open to a devastating attack. All right, all right, everyone, let's have some order. I know I'm new here, General, but I may just have the answer to your transport problems. Let's hear it, Colonel Richards. I have a friend on the planet Opergia in the neutral Cygna Hydra system. 
She controls weapons, men, and ships, including transports. Her name is Duchess Bianca Azizi. Yes, she's advised us several times in the past. Advice is one thing, General, but if she wants to stay neutral, weapons would be out of the question. Well, McCormick, the Duchess and I have been friends for a long time. I saved her life once. Do you think if you asked her personally that, that she would give us the transports we need? It's worth a try, Colonel. Then we'll do it. McCormick, I want a long-distance scout ready for launch to the Cigna Hydra system by 1,200 hours today. On board the Dominion command ship, the plan for an all-out assault on Cygnus III is taking shape. So far, Connors, you've outlined a rather uninspired fighter assault on Cygnus III, and I am disappointed. But the wave of fighters is just a decoy, General. When the rebels think the worst is over, out of sector for our heavy battle cruisers blast their way in. Ah, that's more like it. Excellent, Connors. Unpredictable and very deadly. When Cygnus III is destroyed, the rebels will lose most of their ranking officers and their command center as well. They will be like a snake without a head that can no longer strike. A lovely thought. When will the attack take place, Colonel? Battle cruisers need time to get into position, but we should be ready within 24 hours. You have my approval, Colonel Connors. I await the results with eager anticipation. But even as Connors speaks, a rebel scout is on its way to the Cigna Hydra system to seek help from the Duchess Azizi. I don't believe we've officially met Colonel Richards. I'm Beta, Christina's protector robot. Nice to have you on board. Well, nice to meet you, Beta. The protector robot, Colonel Zane? One of the best. Beta, how much further to the Cigna Hydra system? We're almost there, Christina. I'm picking up a warning signal on the auto scan system. Well, Pergian Command crews are coming into view, Colonel Zane. Doesn't exactly look like a welcoming committee. Are you sure you know these people, Colonel Richards? Don't worry. Activate the communication channel. Operational. This is Colonel Stephen Richards to Opergian Cruiser. This is Opergian Command. You are violating neutral space. Bring your craft alongside immediately. That warning shot was to convince you we mean what we say. Bring your craft alongside. Request contact with the Duchess Azizi. This is Colonel Stephen Richards. Stephen Richards? Is that really you? Cease fire, men. What are you doing in a rebel scout? It's a long story, Bianca, but I think you will like it. Request permission to come aboard. Permission granted. See you in my quarters, Stephen. Out. Oh. Rebel craft, you will dock on level three, bay four. So, Stephen Richards had rebel parents. I like it, but I still find it hard to believe. The story is true, Bianca. All of it. I told General Zane I'd come here to ask for your help. I understand, Stephen, but I must be very careful. I cannot expose my people to unnecessary risk. Supplying weapons to rebels is very dangerous. What about heavy transports? We'd only use them if we absolutely had to. Bianca, I don't want to pressure you. Stephen, but... you're here to pressure me. All right. I'll give you four unarmed automated transports. Even this is dangerous for us. I don't know how to thank you, Bianca. It's not necessary. What you are doing is right. Good luck to all of you. Nearly 24 hours have passed since Major Connors drew up the attack plan for Cygnus III. On board the Dominion command ship, General Derrick watches final preparations. I've waited a long time for this moment. It's every bit as sweet as I imagined. Punch up visual scan of Cygnus III. Online, General. Our fighters are maneuvering into final positions for a Code 5 attack. The assault will be underway any moment now. And so, it begins. 
Colonel Zane, I have a visual on the Dominion lead ship. I see it, McCormick. Colonel Richards, you know more about Dominion attack formations than any of us. Take over command, and we'll back you up. But I'm not up on Rebel systems yet, Colonel. Take over. That's an order. Roger. Richards to all squadrons. Lock all sensors and weapons into attack mode beta. I beg your pardon. Correction. All fighters go to attack mode 34. Keep going, Richards. I'll interpret. Sorry about that. Switching to frequency 1502, the Dominion Battle Channel. Useful bit of information, Colonel Richards. And lock on. All fighters prepare lasers for activation. We will... Sorry to spoil your party, Connors. Richards? It can't be. You're dead. I... I shot you myself. You must have done something wrong, Connors. I'm still here. Traitor, this time I'll make sure you're dead. We'll see about that, Connors. Out. All fighters ready for Dominion attack, Colonel Richards. Remember, their antimatter storage tanks should be our prime targets. Good luck. Colonel, they're throwing their heavy battle cruisers into the action from Sector 4. We won't be able to outfire those monsters. There's only one thing that would outfire battle cruisers the transports that were destroyed on Nitra. We'll use the Opergian transports. But they're unarmed, Colonel Richards. The Dominion doesn't know that, do they? Richards to Opergian transports, start your move from behind Cygnus 3 now. Affirmative. Let's find out if they're taking the bait. Switching back to Dominion Frequency. I'm back, Connors. Ready to give up yet? Give up? Your pilots are good, Richards, but not that good. And the game has changed. Dominion battle cruisers have joined us. Very frightening. But a single armed transport could take out three battle cruisers. So I agree. But all rebel transports were destroyed on Nitra. Are you absolutely sure of that? Check the horizon, Connors. You have transports. Why did you get them? Going up against those transports would be whistling in the wind, Connors. You may have won this time, traitor, but I'll be back. All Dominion attack units, break off, return to base. Connors, up. Nice job, Colonel Richards. Congratulations. Not bad for a first effort. When Connors tries to explain all this to General Derrick, you'll be lucky if she doesn't have him deactivated and used for spare parts. Really? Colonel Richards? Watch your language. This is Colonel Zane to all rebel fighters. Let's head for home. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 4 of Spiders and Webs. The Orion Corridor is on the outer fringe of Dominion's territory. The corridor is formed by a double row of planets listed on the standard charts as the Orion system. Almost all of these planets are uncolonized. Their atmospheres harsh, hostile, barely tolerable to human life. Orion 4 is no exception. There is no permanent population here, only the hidden caves of space pirates. Renegades who plunder the space lane freely and greedily, preying on Dominion, Rebel, and neutral ships alike. Hiding out on the deserted planets, the raiders wait for an opportunity for profit. Weasel! Yo! Get me another drink! Coming up? I'm blasted bored. Orion 4 used to be right in the thick of things. Transports, gold shipments, weapons transfers. No more. Haven't had a bit of action in this lane for weeks. Relax, Spider. Our luck will change. It always does. My men are restless, Weasel, and that's not good. If they don't get action soon, they'll leave me for Strega's camp. 
blast him and his luck. That payroll scout they picked off last week was rich. Well, we could chance a fake signal, boss. It's never failed to bring something down to Orion 4. <laughs> the fake distress signal. My favorite, Weasel. But it's always dangerous. It pinpoints our hideout. But that's only important if they live to tell anyone. <laughs> right. And they don't, do they? Let's set it up, Weasel. We'll see what the spider can lure into his web today. <laughs> On board her command ship, General Derrick has been called to the communications bridge to receive an urgent message. A transmission for you from Dominion Homeworld, General Derrick. Ready to receive. Go ahead, Homeworld. Greetings, General. Is there something we can do for you, Igrathor? As a matter of fact, there is. In a short time, a Dominion tanker loaded with fuel for the leader's war effort is scheduled to pass through the Orion Corridor on its way to Homeworld Command. You're requesting an armed escort for the tanker, Igrathor? Exactly. Your orders are to get the Dominion fuel through that pirate-infested corridor. Without incident. Is that understood, General? Perfect. I will see to it at once. And General, no mistakes this time. Homeworld out. General, General, I think you should know. We've been monitoring a strange, unidentified signal from the Orion Corridor. What sort of signal, Colonel Connors? It is very weak and does not match any code or message that we know. Could it possibly jeopardize the tanker escort mission? I don't think so, General. But we'll keep monitoring it as we get closer to the Orion planets. It's probably just a satellite malfunction. Well, you have the assignment. I expect you to handle it personally. Yes, General. I'll see to the launch at once. And Connors, remember what Igrathor said. There will be no mistakes. The same distress signal is also being picked up at Mission Control on Cygnus 3. General Zane and his officers are trying to lock on to the exact origin of the signal. Any change, Christina? No, Father. We've been monitoring the signal here at Mission Control. It's still very weak and breaks up continuously. Beta, can you make anything more out of it? My readouts confirm Mission Control's findings. A repeater signal, no verifiable code, origination planet unknown, but definitely in the Orion Corridor. Colonel Richards, when you were with the Dominion, did you do recon as far out as the Orion planets? Yes, General, that was, and I'm sure still is, a Dominion patrolled corridor. But there's always been pirate activity there. That signal could mean anything. The Orion planets have atmospheres hostile to human life. If someone is trapped down there, they could need our help. Maybe we should send out a small scouting mission, Father. At least get close enough to find out where the signal's coming from. I could decode the signal at closer range. General, one of your scouts alone in the Orion Corridor is just asking for it. The pirates would have it stripped and sold before we knew it was gone. At least send an escort or two with some backup firepower. Christina, you and Richards take out a small recon squadron as soon as possible and find out where this signal is coming from. But be careful. Don't do anything else before reporting back to Mission Control. We're on our way, General. As the Rebel Scout mission closes in on the Orion system, the unidentified signal continues to grow stronger. On board Colonel Zane's craft, Beta tries to decode the signal and find its origin. Beta, what can you tell us now? We're almost over the strongest point of the signal. My readouts confirm the signal is coming from the planet Orion 4. Code's still not decipherable, I'm afraid. Beta, what information do you have on Orion 4? Star catalogs show Orion 4's atmosphere to be barely tolerable for humans, planet uncolonized, 
Landforms consist of swamps and sinkholes, no arable soil, temperature averaging 105 degrees Fahrenheit, humidity constant at 100 percent. Not exactly a vacation paradise. Richards, you and the others stay in recon mode. Beta and I are going in for a closer scan. Uh, Colonel Zane, the general told us to report back first. I'll do that as soon as I have something to report, Colonel. But we... We're going in. Zane, out. Locking on signal origin, Christina. It seems to be coming from those cave-like structures on the surface. I've got a visual on it. Oh, what a galactic hole this place is. I've lost the signal, Christina, and and I'm picking up three spacecraft moving in fast, unidentified, surrounding us. Take evasive maneuvers, Beta. Afraid it's too late for that, little lady. May as well go quietly. You're boxed solid. No vector points. Who are you? What do you want? We're here to answer a distress signal. We're here to help. How nice of you to accept our invitation. As to what I want... That depends on what you've got. Come on, Weasel. Let's see what prize the spider has suckered in this time. <laughs> Back at Mission Control, General Zane gets a report. I repeat, General, all we know is that Colonel Zane took her scout down to Orion 4 to locate and decode the signal. A few minutes after she entered the atmosphere, she disappeared from our scope completely. Did you try and contact her on Comlink? Affirmative, General. All channels have been jammed. Richards, I'm going to send McCormick's fighter group in as soon as they can launch. Stay there and try to pick up Beta's signal on frequency 13F. 13F, sir? That's correct. Beta's programmed to send whenever Christine is in trouble. If you can get close enough to zero in on it, it just might save her life. This is Colonel Connors to General Derek. This is Derek. Escort Fighter Squadron reporting in. We're about to enter the Orion Corridor, sir. We should rendezvous with the Dominion tanker at 1,200 hours, as planned. What about that signal, Colonel? Communications lost it completely. The signal is gone, General. It disappeared a short time ago. No doubt just satellite interference... As I thought. Very well, Connors. I want to know the moment you've successfully completed this escort operation. I want to pass it along to Igrathor personally. Don't fail me, dear one. Never, General. Connors, out. With Christina kidnapped by space pirates and forced down on Orion 4... Richards and McCormick organize a rescue mission. Colonel Richards, this is McCormick on your port side, along with Lieutenants Baker, Collins, and Stanwyck. What's the situation, sir? I've picked up Beta's signal on frequency 13F. It's coming from the planet's surface. Are we going in, sir? I've been thinking about Colonel Zane's chances, McCormick, and something tells me the less attention we draw, the better. Baker and I will go in alone. The rest of you wait here for further orders. Give us one hour. Roger, Colonel. But if you're not back in exactly 60 minutes, we're coming in. The General would have my hide if I let two of his colonels disappear. Sounds good to me, McCormick. Ready, Baker? I'm right behind you, Colonel. Then let's go. Head for the open area next to that marshland, Baker. And take her in easy, Lieutenant. We want to be able to get out, too. Roger. She'll go down like a feather. Don't forget the rescue gear, Baker. Roger, Colonel. Whew, it's hot enough to melt an asteroid. These marsh fighters are eating me alive. Footing's not too firm, Colonel. Watch where you step. I'll switch on 13F. Beta signal's coming from our left, Baker. Let's get moving. Now stay a few paces behind me and watch out. We can't afford to be caught. This mark is over my ankle. It's getting harder to walk. I'm... Baker! Baker, watch out! It's a sinkhole! Help me! I'm going down! Baker! Hidden in a cave on Orion 4, 
the prisoner Christina Zane is interrogated by the pirate leader. Well, my web has snared a rich prize, Colonel Christina Zane. You look surprised that I decoded your ID tags. Don't believe there's one in the whole galaxy I haven't broken. It's a business necessity. I hope you find the accommodations to your liking, my dear. This whole planet is disgusting, and you and your people blend right in. These ropes are too tight. I demand to be released. Ah, the little lady has some fight left in her. Good. I like that. It should be worth a great deal to the legendary General Alda Zane to get you back all in one piece. What have you done with Beta? Beta? My droid, you idiot. Oh. I'm afraid your beta has been deactivated and is awaiting immediate sale. He'll bring a very good price. Boss! Yes, Weasel, what is it? Can't you see I'm busy entertaining our guests? Yes, yeah, sorry, Spider, but Kruger just came in from the space lane. He reported sighting an unarmed automated Dominion tanker trying to run the Orion Corridor. Is she full? What type of escort does she have? <laughs> She's riding slow and heavy, Spider. With just an armed escort of Dominion fighters, nothing we can't handle, boss. Weasel! This is our lucky day. A famous prisoner to ransom and a Dominion tanker. That fuel will convert into a ton of gold standards. We'll be rich! <laughs> uh, what do you want to do with the girls, Spider? Yes, that is a bit of a problem now. Using that fake distress signal has made Orion 4 too conspicuous for the time being. After we steal the tanker, we'll need to move on to a new base. We'll take her with us. I don't like having a female along in the raid, boss. It's bad luck. Marsh gas has fried your brains, weasel. Don't question my orders. Just tell the men to get their gear together. Be ready to blast off at my command. But, Spider... Do it, weasel. Do it. Meanwhile, Colonel Stephen Richards is being pulled deeper and deeper into the sinkhole on Orion 4. Hurry, Baker! This slimy muck is up to my chin! I'm going to throw this grappling line so the hook lands behind your head. Grab the rope and I'll pull you out. Ah, got it. Harder, Baker. Pull harder! <sighs> Don't struggle, Colonel. You're not making this any easier. Just a few more feet. Thanks, Baker. That was close. But we've lost valuable time. Come on. We've got to find Beta and Colonel Zane. Well, will you look at that? Somebody's been collecting scrap metal and spare parts to sell. What a pile of junk. Sam, isn't that Beta, sir? Heaped up with those other droids? Yes, he looks okay. Turn that signal off, Baker. We'll alert every guard in the place. I hate to say it, but I think Colonel Zane's been kidnapped by raiders, sir. That's what it looks like, Baker. we got to get Beta moving again. Oh, no. They've removed the activator core. Well, I guess that does it. Let's get him back to the ship. Well, not so fast, Colonel. I believe it's Lieutenant Baker to the rescue again. You see, each member of the squadron carries spare parts, in case Beta has an emergency just like this. Oh, <laughs> the General's very particular about that. Let's see, I've got an activator core somewhere. Yeah, here it is. Amazing, Baker. The General seems to think of everything. I'll just put the new core inside this slot. There. A, B, B, Beta, 1, 0, 0, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Oh, Colonel Richards, Lieutenant Baker, I was certain my circuits would never work again. Beta, we need your sensors to find out where Colonel Zane's been taken. I'm not feeling quite normal yet, but I'll certainly try. Christina's not on Orion 4 anymore, Colonel Richards. She's not? Where have they taken her? Coordinates indicate Christina is above the planet. Above Orion 4? Well, the pirates must have evacuated for some reason, sir. That would account for no guards being around, no sign of anyone. They must have been in a big hurry to leave these droids behind. 
this is a valuable pile of junk metal and parts. Really, Colonel Richards? <laughs> I wasn't referring to you, Beta. What was that? Contact McCormick and see what's going on in the corridor above us. This is Baker on Orion 4. Do you read me, McCormick? McCormick here, I copy. Have you found Colonel Zane? Negative, but we did locate Beta. He tells us Colonel Zane is in your area, McCormick. What's going on up there, Lieutenant? We've got a Dominion fighter group escorting a tanker down the Orion corridor. They've been jumped by space pirates. We're out of range. Good fight, though. McCormick, Colonel Zane is on one of those raiders' ships, probably the leader's. You say they're in a dogfight for a large Dominion tanker? Affirmative, Colonel. And so far, I'd say it's Raiders 2, Dominion nothing. I think the Dominion may have just given us the answer to getting Colonel Zane back. McCormick, here's what we'll do. Bravo! Space Pirates! All units go to Code 5 Assault Sequence. Affirmative on Code 5. Scum like this will not be allowed to capture a Dominion tanker. But there's so many of them. Where did they all come from so fast? This is Barbeau. We've lost Butler. Wait. Additional fighters coming at us from 9 o'clock. But these aren't pirates, Colonel Connors. The markings indicate a rebel squadron. Rebels, here? Am I having a malfunction? I do not understand. Ian's fighter is down. The pirates plus the rebels outnumber us five to one, sir. Connors, the remaining fighters, break off the attack. We'll have to abandon the tanker. We cannot take another direct hit. Hyperspace, let's get out of range. Fire! Okay, McCormick. So far, so good. It's time for the second half of the rescue plan. This part's a bit more tricky. Form up around the tanker. Forming up is ordered. Standing by for further orders. Lieutenant Baker, you've got Beta with you. Is he able to pinpoint the location of Colonel Zane? He's working on it, Colonel. I have a lock, Colonel Richards. Sensors confirm Christina is in the lead pirate ship. Thanks, Beta. This is Colonel Stephen Richards, Rebel Forces, requesting communication with the leader of the raiding convoy. Do you read me? I don't know whether to thank you, Colonel, or blast you out of the galaxy to teach you a lesson. This is my territory, and I don't like to feel crowded. We have no wish to fight you for this tanker or anything else. Tell me what you want, Rebel. I'm losing patience. I'm proposing a trade. We have something you want... And you have someone we want back. The tanker for Colonel Christina Zane. Is it a deal? <laughs> deal? Give me one good reason why I shouldn't have both. The lady and the tanker. Every rebel spacecraft you see has its Mison cannons and lasers locked onto the same target. Your Dominion tanker. One move to take us out and we'll blast firepower at it like a hundred launch towers. We will do it. Count on it. You're bluffing, Rebel. You wouldn't risk an explosion in space so close to your own people. If you're sure this is a bluff, then call it. But if you've guessed wrong, pirate, your profit will be space ash. Can you afford to waste such a valuable prize? It's up to you, Raider. You got guts, Rebel. Your precious lady is worth much. But the tanker... Ah, the tanker is worth more. I believe they call this a standoff. Do you agree, then? The tanker in exchange for Colonel Zane? All right, Rebel. Agreed. But bring one fighter alongside my ship. Transfer will be made to the port airlock. But don't try anything funny. The lady is no use to you dead. Coming alongside to dock. Docking in five seconds. Three, two, one. Locking on. Colonel Richards, Steve. I don't know how you did it, but I'm sure glad to leave that place behind. Thanks. Let's get out of here before that thief changes his mind. 
Richards to Lee Brader. His name is Spider. Wonderful. Colonel Richards to Spider. The tanker's all yours. The rebel fighters will release it as soon as I give the command. I'll be waiting. Goodbye, my dear lady. For now. But don't be surprised if we meet again someday. You're a prize worth chasing. <laughs> Christina, are you all right? Just fine, Steve. McCormick, release the tanker. Our business is finished here. Roger. Nice to have you back, Colonel Zane. McCormick to all fighters. Break out of tanker escort formation. Regroup under Code B. Returning to Cygnus 3. Colonel Christina Zane's rescue from the space pirates will be cause for celebration on the rebel planet Cygnus 3. But for the humanoid, Colonel Connors, the lost tanker will mean yet another failure to report to General Derrick. And so, the conflict continues. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 5, A Galahad for the Dominion. Dominion, an unrelenting source of evil and oppression. Will its secret ever be found? What is the key to the Emerald Tree mystery? For now, the war goes on. Following the loss of a Dominion tanker to space pirates, once again, General Vera Derrick has been called to account by the dangerously powerful Igra Thor. General Derrick, we meet again. I do not see the reason for these repeated summons, Igra Thor. Do you not, General? It's quite simple. The leader is not pleased with your command. I am not pleased. We engage the enemy more frequently, Igrathor. So naturally our losses will be greater. An interesting analysis, my dear. However, the Council of the Seven has decided to provide support for your command. Until Sector D shows improvement. You... You expect me to share command in my sector? This decision is not open to question, General. You will obey, or you'll be tried before the Council of the Seven for insubordination. Who is this support person you refer to? You may have heard of him. His name is the Shire. The Shire? A bounty hunter? A murderer who was once imprisoned on the planet Satar? Oh, Dare you even suggest that I should take him into my command? Your sparring grows tedious, General. Bishaya will leave with you today. He will do what you have failed to do. Hunt down and eliminate the traitor Richards. You are to provide him with anything he needs to complete his assignment successfully. How long will this Vashaya be operating out of my command sector? You ask questions without answers. I control this game, General. Vashaya awaits you in your space shuttle. Dismissed. <laughs> The rescue of General Zane's daughter from the Space Pirates has resulted in Stephen Richards being promoted to Rebel Commander. Although the rescue mission was a complete success, apparently one casualty was overlooked. Christina! Christina! I heard you were at the base hospital. Are you all right? I'm fine, Steve. It's uh, Beta here who's feeling a bit out of sorts. Uh, uh. You took a robot to the hospital for treatment? <laughs> I keep forgetting that you still don't know all of Beta's strange little quirks. You see, Beta checked himself into the hospital. Hello, Commander Richards. Beta, you do look a bit under the weather. Ever since Orion 4, I've had a dysfunction in my joints. My metal connectors are expanded and out of shape. I can barely use my grasping and walking appendages. Well, it sounds like humidity got to your mobility connectors. Exactly what I was telling him. We're on our way to robotics maintenance to get him patched up. 
You see, Beta thought he had a bad case of alpha influenza. But you're a robot, Beta. Some of my symptoms were just like Christina's when she had alpha influenza. The general took her to the hospital. Now, don't worry, Beta. Robotics will have you up to speed in no time. I still don't think I understand. He'll be fine, Steve. Oh, by the way, I've been thinking about something ever since you rescued me from those space pirates. Were you bluffing when you threatened to blow up that Dominion tanker? Good question. I'm glad I never had to answer it. On board a Dominion shuttlecraft, returning to her command ship, General Vera Derrick makes her feelings known to the bounty hunter, Vashaya. I want you to know from the beginning, Vashaya, I dislike you intensely. But since you're here and there's nothing I can do about it, I'll give you the help you need to eliminate Richards. But the sooner you finish your business in my sector, the better. Might I add, the feeling is mutual. Vashaya, your tone is threatening to the general. Noted, humanoid. But it doesn't concern me. Remember, I'm here to finish a job you botched. What do you mean? When you were assigned the task of eliminating the traitor Richards, you made an almost human error. You were too sure of your sensors. You didn't even bother to check if Richards were really dead. The Dominion has no room for such errors of judgment. I'm curious, Vashaya. Just what makes Dominion Homeworld so confident that you can capture Richards? I have an edge. I know how Richards will think in strategic situations. We were in the Academy together as cadets. You were in the Dominion Academy? I've led many lives, General. Ikra Thor knows them all and makes use of them as he sees fit. It was my background with Richards at the Academy that led to this assignment. That's the personal matter. Come to the point, Vashaya. Your plan is... To use my knowledge of Richards against him. Example, he's a very soft touch when it comes to people he cares about. A definite character flaw. And you propose to exploit that flaw, Vashaya? Precisely. We'll transfer a contingent of rebel prisoners to the Outlands for execution. I'll arrange to leak this information to the rebels on Cygnus 3 before we make the transfer. Oh, Richards will try to rescue the prisoners. He won't be able to resist such a noble gesture. Richards has served aboard Dominion prison ships, Vashaya. He knows their weapon systems. He understands that any fighter attack would prove useless. You're not as dull as you look, humanoid. But an all-out attack would not be Richards' response. He'll use a small landing party and try to take over key areas on the prison ship. I'm sure of it. You seem to know your man very well. Your plan has merit, Shia. As it happens, the prison ship Zeta is orbiting above my command ship right now. It should prove sufficient for your needs. Connors, take over the controls. You can handle that, can't you, Major? Major? Nature. Your continued bungling is responsible for the loss of my high standing with Igrithor. Someone has to pay for that, Connors. Yes, General. Take notice, bounty hunter. I repay in kind. Never forget that. Cygnus 3, two days later. Commander Richards is called to a special briefing. So, we know the Dominion is transferring by prison ship over a thousand rebel prisoners to the Outlands for execution. General, did you say by prison ship? Yes, McCormick. The prison ship Zeta. The transfer will take place within the next 15 hours. How reliable is this intelligence, Father? It came from an alien, a proton mercenary we've dealt with before. Usually his information is sound as long as he thinks he's paid enough for it. What you're really telling us, General, is that the information may not be totally accurate, but you can't ignore it. Exactly, Steve. It could be a chance to save over a thousand of our people. But, General, any rescue plan will have to be executed with extreme caution. We can't rule out a Dominion trap. You're right, of course, McCormick. Steve, I want you to try something. Think the way Dominion Corps Command would for a moment. It might help us come up with a plan of action. Let's see... 
What strategy would Corps Command use in this situation? There was a flight training exercise from my Dominion Academy days. It involved camouflaging our fighters with meteors. Meteors, Commander? Yes. We used tractor beams to hold the meteors in position while we hid behind them. Now, that way we were able to sneak through the enemy's scanner range without getting caught. A bit unorthodox, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. Steve, how many people would you need to carry out such a plan? Oh, five. Myself, you and Veda, McCormick, and one more. All right. I'll go collect Veda from Obotics. Meet you in Launch Bay after McCormick and I recruit our fifth pilot. Uh, Lieutenant Stanwick, I think. Good choice. Remember, there's no time to lose. The lives of over a thousand of our people are at stake. 73, 74, 75 gold standards. There you are, Krieg. The balance due now that the job is completed. It was almost too easy. The rebels took the bait. Now it's up to you to spring the trap. Tell me, Krieg. How did you get the information about the prison ship transfer to Cygnus III? That's not part of the deal, General. My methods are my own business. Unfortunately, your services are necessary, Krieg. But you are a mystery. And I don't like mysteries. How do you manage to know all you know? And why are you never caught? You ask questions without answers, General. So I have been told. <laughs> Don't worry, General. You got what you paid for. You might say it was your move this time. General, Vishaya, Krieg at your service. You'll hear from us again. Ah, Connors. General... Command Control said you wanted to see me. Major, I want you to hear the final details of the plan to capture Richards. Proceed, Shire. I'll allow Richards and his landing party to come aboard the prison ship Zeta with little or no difficulty. Once on board, I'll have them trapped. There will be no escape. Very well, Shire. Since it's been almost 13 hours since Krieg planted the information with the rebels, it's time for you to transfer to the Zeta. If Richards is coming, he'll be arriving soon. There's a viewing console on level three of the prison ship. You can scan every section, see and hear every move they make. <laughs> Excellent. Once Richards is captured, all the praise will be mine for eliminating the most dangerous traitor the Dominion has ever known. Space. A black void, except for the flashing lights on four rebel fighters. They're on their way to the prison ship Zeta to attempt a dangerous rescue. We're getting close. Now check your attitude controls, McCormick. Attitude controls stable, Commander. All right, we're about to enter the meteor field. But keep your eyes open, everybody. Those rocks move fast. Lieutenant Stanwyck to flight leader. I think I found a meteor I can handle, Commander. Well, which one, Stanwyck? Everything I see is too big for tractor beam control. Over to the left, Commander. I'm almost behind it. That meteor's too big, Christina. His tractor beam will overload. They're off, Stanwyck, and that's an order. I can handle it, Colonel. Wait. What's happening? Red line. Overload. Now function in the power unit. Commander. Break off, Stanwyck. I can't. It, it's too close. It's, it's going to... McCormick. Take over Stanwick's point position. I copy, Commander. Uh, concentrate on the mission, everybody. Commander, over there. Two o'clock. Readouts confirmed those meteors to be within tractor beam limits. Uh, good work, Beta. Let's tractor on and get out of here. We can't waste any more time. Invisible behind meteors of enormous size, the three spacecraft drift toward the prison ship. It's getting late, Peshire. Feeling nervous that your plan to lure Richards into this trap might not work? You'd enjoy watching me fail, wouldn't you, Connors? Just observing your methods. If you ask me, I don't think Richards is going to show. By processing available data, I predict you're going to look very foolish within the next few hours. You mechanical cretin! I've had enough of you and your general! Don't touch me! 
this one hand, Connors, I could snap your control center at any time. There's something about me you don't know, humanoid. I was on Satar's prison colony for ten long years. They never tell you that Satar orbits a neutron star. A star that emits radiation. Very powerful radiation. Eventually it drives a man completely out of his mind. I must be allowed to function. I could terminate you right now with great pleasure. Do you understand? Yes. Good. Then I'll let you function a little longer. But stay out of my way. <laughs> Radar 1, calling Vishaya. This is Vishaya. What is it? Sir, we just picked up three unusual meteors. They're traveling in a kind of formation, as you predicted. Well, what do you know? Keep tracking them. Vishaya out. <laughs> I told the general I knew how Richard would react. The Academy meteor trick. He took the bait, Connors. How should we close the trap, Vishaya? Double the guard around the prison cells. Remove all but three guards from the docking bay. I want to give Richards all the rope he needs to hang himself. Unaware of the trap Vashaya has set, the rebel assault team arrives at the prison ship Zeta. With all power shut down, they maneuver with jets of compressed gas as they zero in on their target. There's the prison ship. It's big enough to hold a city. Fighters one and three, come in as close to me as you can. I'll connect umbilicals to both of you as soon as I attach to the prison ship. Do it as quietly as possible, Beta. Umbilical to the Zeta completed. And with no reaction from the prison ship. Good work, Beta. Commence umbilical attachments to fighters one and three. Roger, Commander. Latched and locked together. The Zeta and the three of us are now a single unit. Christina, I still think I should be coming with you. Believe me, Beta friend, following your orders and staying with the fighters is vital to the success of our mission and to my safety. Mm, all right. I understand my instructions and know what to do when I hear Christina's signal, Commander. Thanks, Beta. Now, McCormick, Christina, get into your pressure suits. We'll all rendezvous outside the Zeta docking bay. Remember to use the handholds on the umbilicals and stay close together during EVA. I copy, Colonel. Depressurizing. Okay, this is it. Here we go. Easy does it. Docking bay then ahead. Stay where you are for a moment. I'm going to swing around front and try to locate the guards. Can you see anyone, Steve? Negative. Oh, wait. There's one guard inside, but it looks like he's asleep. Come on, follow me in. Try to land just above the airlock, quietly. Coming in. I'm down, Commander. Colonel Zane, give me your hand. Made it. We're all here, Steve. Okay, help me with the airlock door. Not so much noise. Okay, now close it. Everyone down. The guard could see us through that spaceport. Going to equalize the pressure in here. So far, so good. Let's get out of these helmets. Commander, there are only three guards in this whole docking bay. That's odd. There should be at least a squad, if I remember correctly. We're going to have to take those guards out, Steve. Right. Phasers on disable. And don't miss... If we hit those refueling tanks, it's all over. Now, as soon as the door is clear, we move. Now, let's lock up these guards and get to the cell blocks. Hurry! <laughs> Look at them, Connors. Wandering around in total ignorance of their fate. Are the men in position? Yes, Fashaya. All right, Richards. Just keep coming. Only a little further. This is too easy, Commander. I'm getting a bad feeling. I agree. This has setup written all over it. How right you are, Richards. 
Drop your weapons. Guards, move in. Better do as he says. Very wise decision. Take the girl and her friend to a cell. Bring Richards to me. I've waited a long time for this. So, Commander Richards, we meet again. Well, well. The Shire. You remember me. I remember you. You and your landing party were trapped so easily, Richards. You must be losing your touch. And Major Connors. This is beginning to look like a Dominion reunion. Command ship to Vishaya. This is Vishaya. General Derrick is waiting to speak to you. She says it's urgent. Put her on hold. I'll deal with you later, Richards. Guard, take him down to the cell block with the others. It's not over yet, Vishaya. Believe me, it's not over yet. Connors, follow them down. And if he makes a wrong move, don't hesitate. I understand. And I don't care who told you to put me on hold. Vishaya, come in at once. This is General Derrick. Yes, General. Have you captured Richards? Of course I've captured Richards. Anyone else? A girl. I believe Richards called her Christina. And a young officer of no consequence. Did you say Christina? That could be General Zane's daughter, Vishaya. What was that noise? I'm checking the screens now. That explosion just blew off the starboard side of the ship. This is Radar 1, sir. Rebel fire has disabled warp drive. We're a sitting duck, sir. I demand to know what's happening. Impossible. We're under attack. Surrounded by rebel fighters. Vishaya, you and Connors take the nearest escape pod and get out before it's too late. Losing that prison ship will cost you. I promise you that. Aboard the crippled prison ship Zeta, General Zane joins his victorious rebel officers. Frankly, Christina, I was worried. But when Beta signaled us, we sent in everything we had and we won. I was very concerned about you, Christina. It took so long for you to signal that you had taken over the ship. Oh, Beta friend, I appreciate your concern. It just took McCormick and me a little longer than we thought to overcome our guards. Colonel, that sprained ankle trick of yours was great. Those guards were so surprised, the rest was a cinch. It works every time. And with all power gone on the Zeta, there was no way for them to escape or retaliate. Great work, Beta. Why, thank you, Commander. But it was nothing, really. So what's next, General? After we offload our people and the Dominion prisoners, I suggest we blow this prison ship to pieces. I want to make sure it will never be used to keep anyone in chains and misery again. The Rebels of Cygnus III have a victory to celebrate, but it's fleeting and temporary at best, for the Dominion never rests. They will be back. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 6, Diamonds in the Sky. For the past several weeks, Vishaya has secretly been working on a deadly ray designed to destroy entire solar systems. He's called in an expert to make final adjustments. The expert is Dr. Michaels, the same doctor who saved Commander Richard's life on Cygnus III. Lured to the other side by promises of wealth and fame, Dr. Michaels prepares to test the deadly new weapon, the cryon beam. Dr. Michaels, I feel it necessary to remind you of the importance of the weapon you're perfecting. You have to understand something, Vishaya. For the past few years, my work has been strictly medical. It's been ages since I've worked with cryon particles or anything else. Ah, but your expertise is legendary, Doctor. However, I will be keeping a close watch on you. I made a bargain, Vishaya. Remember what happened to the last scientist on this project? I know. But there's something I don't understand. 
His notes say that the cryon beam was to be used to cool the atmospheres of planets too hot for colonization, not for the elimination of all life. Yes. Well, there's a military application here. I understand this device is capable of extinguishing the suns that rebel planets orbit. Am I right, Doctor? Yes, but... Bashaya, the moment those suns die, the planets will grow colder and colder until... Why, the deaths of those people living on those planets would be... I'm aware of the end result, Doctor. Now get busy and order that test beam fired. Dr. Michaels to generator control. Generator control standing by, Doctor. Transfer power from all levels to the cryon beam on the test star. Acknowledge. Ten seconds to full power. We will fire on your command. Five seconds to test firing. Three seconds. Three on insertion. Two. One. Fire. The star has been completely vaporized. Beautiful. I'd say the beam is perfected. Brilliantly done, Dr. Michaels. What have I done? You'll have to excuse me, Pashaya. I've got to have some time alone to think about all this. Don't be too long. We have several more tests to complete before we give our report to General Derrick. A report of complete success with a cryon beam. A wonderfully Deadly new weapon. Unaware of Vashaya's new weapon, Commander Richards accompanies his friends to one of the recreation centers on Cygnus 3, Club Trispace 17. In the dimly lit interior, a turbaned host with a twisted smile greets them. How do you like it so far, Steve? <laughs> they sure don't have places like this in the Dominion. As crowded as this is, maybe the Dominion has a good idea. Is it always like this? Oh, most of the time. Too many people. Too close together. Breeding places for pestilence and disease. Oh, really, Beta? Just an observation. Watch your step, Blast. What did he say? Watch your step. Oh. This dabber. Good. This dabber. Thanks, buddy. Here's a little something for your trouble. Ooh, thank you, thank you, thank you. What was that? Oh, he's one of the Tri-Space aliens, Steve. I hate to interrupt, but I must state that I am very uncomfortable in this place. Your discomfort is duly noted. Now be quiet, Beta. Tri-Spacers run all these clubs, Commander. Excellent managers, even if they are a little difficult to understand. I shouldn't even be here. Oh, you can't work all the time, Steve. When you're not flying missions, you and Beta are trying to trace references to the Lost Emerald Tree Project. So far, I'm afraid we've uncovered very little. And all that data search is most taxing on my modulating converters. The Colonel's right, Commander. We all need a little time off now and then. Order, order. I am your service droid. Punch up your favorite selection, please. Quite a list. Let's see. I think I'll have that. I haven't had triclon stew in years. Make it two. Why not three? Punch order complete to release me from this position. Thank you. Order received. Order received. Oh, look. It's Valaminia. She's going to sing. voice. Who is she? She's an Altusian freedom fighter, a famous one. Altusia? It was conquered by the Dominion over 20 years ago, wasn't it? Correct, Commander. This is their national anthem. Dominion may have conquered their homeland, but the Altusians will never give up fighting for their freedom. That goes double for the rebels on Cygnus 3. Affirmative, McCormick, affirmative.
On General Derrick's command ship, a secret meeting is in progress. Good morning, General Derrick. Good morning, Connors. You seem cheerful. I take it your mission was successful. Routine. A trip to the earth mines to rotate workers. I always marvel at them. Gray, listless beings without hope. You wanted to see me about something, Major? I have correlated the information you wanted about Vishaya, General. Good. What are your findings? As you know, Vishaya has been with us only a few weeks. But already he's been responsible for allowing over a thousand rebel prisoners to escape. Not to mention the loss of the Zeta itself. And just what do you suggest we do about that, Major? Bridge to General Derek. This is Derek. The Shia on the warship Burgess is waiting to speak to you. Patch me through. Go ahead, sir. We've tested the cryon beam. A complete success. The rebels will die, General, without ever knowing the reason. Excellent. Is the beam ready to be used on Cygnus 3? We need to do one more test, General. I want to try the beam directly on a planet instead of its sun to see if the end result will be the same. The planet Caspia, I think, will be a nice guinea pig. I'll be in touch. Vishaya out. Well, Connors, I think we'll have to allow Vishaya a little more time to finish his work on this new weapon. There will be plenty of time to resume our previous discussion. But the beam will be Vishaya's success, General. Your command position will be in even more jeopardy with Eagle Thor and the Council of the Seven. Don't be too sure of that, dear one. If the Gryon beam is a success, I'll make certain the credit is mine. Battle stations, all personnel to battle stations, all shields, repeat, all shields to full power. Pilots to your fighters immediately. General Zane, what's happening, sir? The planet Caspia is sending out a distress signal. Hostile warships are about to enter their solar system. I understand, General. I'll have our fighters off in no time. Squadron 7, 9, and 13, ready for launch. Acknowledge. Acknowledge. This is launch control. Prepare for launch. All clear, launch control. Five seconds. Mark. Three. Two. Ignition. The battle to save Caspia has begun. Richards to all rebel fighters. Form into attack groups. I read two warships and about ten Dominion fighters engaging the Caspian forces. But I only see three Caspian fighters. Confirm. Only three Caspian fighters remain, Commander. Steve, concentrate your squadron's attacks on the Dominion warships. McCormick's group will help the Caspian fighters. Copy. I have the warship Burgess on my scope. Wait a minute. What is that on top? Running Dominion warships. Confirm Burgess outline. But there are new additions on top, Commander. Steve, take a look at your scope now. Dominion squadrons are breaking off. It certainly looks that way. But why? I believe I can answer that question for you, Richards. For sure. I should have known. All right, don't keep us in suspense. Why did you order your fighters to retreat? Because we won't be needing them anymore. Oh, this is perfect. I didn't realize I'd have such an attentive audience for my grand spectacle in space. Explain yourself, Vishaya. Watch the planet Caspia, Richards. Very closely. What are you going to do? Just keep watching, Richards. This is even better than I hoped. Ready to fire the cryon beam. Fire! Caspia just vanished. How could that have happened? Vishaya! Do you realize what you've done? You've murdered thousands of innocent people. I swear if we ever meet face to face again... If I were you, I wouldn't waste my time on thoughts of revenge, Richards. Because Cygnus 3 is next. And there is no escape. Shia out. We'd better report all this to General Zane. Cygnus 3 is going to have to be evacuated immediately. Commander, I just thought of something. 
Dr. Michaels used to work on unusual weapons projects before he became our base doctor. Maybe he can think of something to destroy this cryon beam. There is no file on the cryon beam, Commander. And Dr. Michaels left Cygnus 3 over a week ago for one of the outer systems. Too bad. He might have been a big help. Well, let's get back to Cygnus 3. If what we've just seen is any indication, it may not be there much longer. On board the Burgess, Dr. Michaels is having second thoughts. Ah, Dr. Michaels, you asked for a meeting. Vishaya, I don't want to continue working on the cryon beam. You want to leave this project? I don't have your stomach for it. Dr. Michaels, so far I've been patient with you, but don't push me. My tolerance for weakness is very low. You can't threaten me, Vishaya. Can't I? May I remind you, Doctor, that like the last scientist to work on the cryon beam, you are not indispensable. Do I make myself clear? Very clear, Vishaya. Now, Doctor, within the hour, you and I will be beaming over to General Derrick's ship to watch the destruction of Cygnus III. So don't go far. I'll be in my lab. Oh, Doctor, one final word. The cryon beam will be a success. Or you will become a memory. Yes, the beam will be a success. But at what price to me? Maybe you won't be on Cygnus III when I destroy it, Richard. I sincerely hope not. That would be too quick. Too easy. I want to do it my way. And if I get the chance, never doubt I'll do it, Richards. Never doubt it for a moment. Evacuation from Cygnus 3 has begun. But Stephen Richards is missing from mission control. He sits in the almost deserted Club Tri-Space 17, nursing his feelings of guilt and helplessness. Dobber for the laddie? Uh, no... I was looking for that gentleman over there. Listen, you and your people had better get out of here before it's too late. I wouldn't wait much longer. Oh, Danko, Danko. Steve, Steve, everyone's been looking for you. What are you doing here? I wanted to be by myself, Christina. I had some thinking to do about my part in all this mess. What do you mean, your part? What's happening to Cygnus III isn't your fault. How can you even think that it is? Christina, the Dominion knows I came here after I found out about my rebel heritage on Centiga. But they can't be sure what else I may have learned on that ice moon. That's why they tried to kill me once. They said I was a danger to them. You feel the Dominion has targeted Cygnus III for destruction by this cryon beam? Because you're here? Because they want to kill you? No, no. That's only part of it. Don't you see, Christina, if I could have figured out the secret by now, Dominion would have been destroyed. There wouldn't be any cryon beam trained on Cygnus III. Well, you can't blame yourself for that. You've done everything you could to trace the Emerald Tree Project and its secret. I know, but it hasn't been enough. Steve, we need your help at Mission Control now. Beta's waiting outside to take us back. Evacuation is underway. We can't stay here. The end of Cygnus Three. But I guess there is no other way. How do you overpower a death ray? At Mission Control, the evacuation of Cygnus Three is being carried out. Father, Steve and I are back, and Beta is plugged into Comlink. He'll keep us up to date on the evacuation and any emergency transmissions that come in. Good. We've got every launch pad working at capacity. Hundreds of thousands of people have to get off this planet as quickly as possible. General, Christina, I think I have the answer. I think I have the answer. Beta, calm down. What is it? I picked up a transmission from inside the Dominion on that special frequency Commander Richards told us about. It says we can destroy the cryon beam. How can we do it, Beta? Slowly now. 
so we can follow you. The transmission tells us to spread a wall of diamond phosphate crystals across the path of the cryon beam. The wall of crystals will act as a mirror and reflect the beam, reflect it back to its source. A wall of diamond phosphate crystals. Will it work, Beta? The information for an accurate confirmation is not available, I'm sorry to report, but it is theoretically possible. General, do you realize the odds on that information being valid? Steve, why would someone inside the Dominion send us a phony message about their own super weapon? They believe the cryon beam is invincible. But how do we create a wall of diamond phosphate crystals in space? Where do we even find the material? Scanning the maps of this planet, I locate deposits of that particular mineral in a dry lake bed near the Pelnar station at the equator. We transfer the material to fighters and spray a small area of space with it in a repeating pattern. I see. The freezing cold of space will make a kind of wall. How long do we have? Sector Recon reports no Dominion activity in our area yet. We may have the time to make our wall before they arrive. It's worth a try. We'll be gambling everything on this, General. What if the Dominion is trying to stack the deck? Working against time, the Rebels have accomplished the impossible. An almost invisible wall of shimmering crystals floats in space. Above it, three tiny Rebel fighter craft hover. Okay, McCormick, increase power to your tractor beam. The wall's drifting off course. Roger, Commander. Increasing power. I sure hope this is going to work. Wait a minute. Did you hear that? Scope indicates several warships coming into range, including one with that same strange outline. Yes, Commander. The outline fits Dominion warship Burgess. Christina, climb upstairs and get us covered. We'll position the wall between the cryon beam and Cygnus 3. Copy. Sane out. Chromic, are you ready? Anytime you say, Commander. Okay, lock tractor beam on 9. Advance power slowly. We can't afford to lose it. Keep advancing power. And the wall moves. The fighters maneuver it into position. The last hope for Cygnus 3. Observation Deck 5, General Derrick's command ship. General Derrick, this is the bridge, sir. We're picking up three rebel fighters on an intercept course. Stand by for further orders. Obviously a suicide squad, General. Bridge, this is Vashayev. Tell the people on the Burgess to disregard the fighters. They'll never arrive in time. Yes, sir. Bridge out. This is quite a moment for me. Stand aside, Dr. Michaels. The cryon beam will fire on my command. Three, two, one. Fire! General, the beam... It's not reaching Cygnus 3. Those fighters, they're supporting something. It's, it's a kind of wall. And the wall reflects the beam. Get someone to turn that beam off. Sorry, General, it's too late. They're dead. That's impossible. But true, General. Every person aboard the Burgess was killed the moment the reflection of the cryon beam hit. I estimate the engine should go any second now. Fantastic, Commander. I'd better report in. Commander Richards to base. Cygnus 3 base. Go ahead, Commander. The mission was successful, General. Cygnus 3 is safe. On observation deck 5, there is a long moment of silence. Dr. Michaels, what went wrong out there? I don't know. Bridge to General Derrick? Derrick here. A regular check of the daily log shows a transmission you might be interested in, sir. Play it for us. Attention, attention, all rebel forces. I am a scientist with information on a cryon beam. The beam can be destroyed, repeat, can be destroyed with a wall of diamond phosphate crystals. I don't like what I'm hearing, Michaels. That's Dr. Michaels' voice. Repeat, repeat. 
Price Brand confirms your observation. Quiet, humanoid. Oh, good. Act on this information immediately. My only regret is that I didn't send my name along with that transmission. You've just signed your own death warrant, Dr. Michaels. Guard, get him out of my sight. I'm going to take care of you personally, Michaels. You'll pay for this, Bashaya. The entire incident is a failure. A failure. Richards, you've won this time. But remember, all those who crossed me in the past have died. And none pleasantly. When we meet again, you'll wish you'd never been born. The secret of dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 7, Space Rats. A Dominion battlecruiser hides in the blackness of space. Its orbit is circular, miles above the planet Earth. In General Derrick's personal quarters, Major Connors displays a small, furry animal inside a special cage. It's ugly. Incredibly ugly. Yes, I know. Look closely. Don't worry. The plasmacine cage is very safe. Oh, the little red eyes are hideous. They shine in the dark, General. What is this creature called, Connors? Ratus spatium. A mutated form of rat. Able to survive in almost any environment. Space rat is the common name. It looks too small to be so dangerous. Ten centimeters of carnivorous fury. It lives to eat, General. Notice the enlarged head and the teeth. Little daggers of ivory. I'll drop a bit of food into the cage. Oh, vicious little animal, isn't it? Imagine an army of these creatures, loose on Cygnus Three, eating their fill. I am imagining it. I like it. If I were to place a pair of space rats on the rubble planet, within six hours their reproductive cycles would result in thousands of these creatures. Precisely what do they eat, Major? Anything, General. It's the key to their survival. Fascinating. Let me know when you are ready to begin the operation. Oh, you have pleased me, Connors. Thank you, General. These little creatures will perform perfectly, and the rebels will vanish from Cygnus Three. Deep in a hole carved out of the rocky, windswept rebel planet Cartone, General Zane explains the installation of a large metal tank. And so... We install these insulated water tanks in underground locations. Then we cover the hole with plastone, formed in camouflage to blend with the surroundings. Great idea, General. We gain water without the enemy even being aware of it. Not only water, Steve. We're building complete military structures down here, too. Watch out, General. The tank. They're lowering it in. A water source here will open up the entire southern polar hemisphere of Cartone for strategic operations. And since this is the dark side of the planet, it'll be completely hidden from Dominion reconnaissance. And that's going to be very important, Steve, because someday we hope Cartone will be the launch site for an all-out attack against the Dominion. Christina, Christina, we'd better get back to Cygnus 3. You and the commander have planetary defense duty tomorrow morning. All right, Beta. Are you ready to go, Steve? I'm ready, Christina. Thanks for the inspection tour, General. See you both back on Cygnus 3. The Shire receives a visitor on board Dominion's command ship. Major Connors reporting as ordered, sir. Ah, uh, yes. I just wanted to inform you, Connors, that I know about your matched pair of Ratus Spatium, carefully separated in plasmacine cages. 
I also know that you intend to set them free on Cygnus Three. But I told no one except... I've never trusted you, Connors. So last week, I had a small transmitter planted in your arm socket while you were in humanoid sleep mode. Transmitter? Arm socket? You had no right... I overheard your conversations with the general. No matter. I want you to go ahead with your plan. You do? Of course. With one difference. If it's successful, you'll share the glory with me, Connors. If you value your ability to function. Do we understand each other, humanoid? Perfectly, Bashaya. Good. Now get moving. I want those space rats on Cygnus 3 immediately. All launch personnel, clear the area. Prepare for launch. Launch control, this is Major Connors. Hold for final clearance. Launch of Protojet 13 in hold condition. Hold condition. Major Connors calling General Derek. Derek here. A final check on arrangements, General. My descent to Cygnus 3 will begin at 1600 hours, just after dark on the Rebel planet. The diversion is planned to coincide with your descent, as you requested. There should be no problem planting the animals near a base outpost. The confusion of the attack will provide cover for my landing. I will be supervising the attack myself. The rest is up to you. Derek, out. Launch control. This is Major Connors. Proceed with launch. All alert for launch of Protojet 13. Five seconds to launch. Three, two, one, launch. Quiet, my friends. Quiet. I know you're hungry, but you won't be hungry for long. Cygnus 3, minutes away from 1600 hours. Richards, Christina, and Beta enter mission control. Taking Christina by the arm, they lead her to a door marked Command Personnel Only. This way, Christina. There's something you need to see before we go on duty. Affirmative. The commander is right. You must see. Beta, you're giggling. <laughs> Affirmative. I can't wait. You're behaving very strangely, both of you. Right through this door. <laughs> Surprise! Happy birthday, Christina. But how did you know Never it? mind. Beta has something special for you. Now go ahead, Beta. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Christina. Happy birthday to you. What's happening? We're under attack. Take cover. Take cover, everyone. Beta, where are you going? Christina. As the diversionary attack begins on Cygnus 3, Major Connors moves in to carry out his devious plan. There are the explosions. Time to begin my descent. 4,000 meters. Three. All lights off. Must find a place to land. Here, I think. The trees will shield me from prying eyes. And there's an outpost a short distance away. Couldn't be better. Fifty meters. Soft landing. Come, my friends. Food is waiting. I'll use the trees and the darkness to reach the outpost building. Set the auto-releases on the cages. Soon you will be free, my pretties. And I will be on my way. Now, back to the protojet. Carefully, I must not be observed. Halt! Who goes there? Keep your hands where I can see them. Well, a Dominion Major. Quite a surprise. Yes, I'm as surprised as you are. Turn around. Move it. Welcome to Outpost 19, Major. Inside. 
and don't try anything funny. I'm going to do a weapon search. Don't even twitch. Into the cell. Go on. You're a strange one. No weapons, no papers. Just the name Connors on your jacket patch. This is Sergeant Benton at Outpost 19, calling Command Control. Command Control, what have you got, Benton? I'm holding a prisoner here, Lieutenant. A Dominion Major named Connors. Good work, Sergeant. I'll be there in five minutes. And keep a watch. There could be more. Out. Gonna leave you here in the cell, Connors. But I'll be right outside that door, with a laser pistol in my hand. Got it? Yes. You fool, thinking I would be unprepared for capture. Inside my thumb cavity, a vial of powerful acid poured into the lock. Now I can get out of this cell. Inside this flap on my body cavity, a small but effective phaser. Activate thermal sensors and aim for maximum body heat. No need to even open the door. The laser burst will go right through it. Goodbye, Sergeant. At Rebel Headquarters, Richards and Christina watch as Dominion protojets break off the attack. Their attack didn't do a great deal of damage. My Dominion background makes me suspect an ulterior motive. But what could it be? Well, I'm sure this was a diversion of some kind. A beta. Yes, Commander. Plug into the Master Communications Console. I want you to sift through all communications within the last hour to locate anything unusual. Rapid scanning of data always gives me severe sensor strain. But my personal health is of little concern when I can be of service. Beta, just do it. Immediately. Of course, Christina. Connecting. If there's anything unusual, Beta will find it. I've got it. What is it, Beta? Transmissions from Outpost 19. The first at 1,800 hours, 23 minutes, involves the capture of a Dominion officer, a Major Connors. Interesting. And what's the second transmission, Beta? A short time later, the lieutenant dispatched to Outpost 19 to pick up the prisoner found him gone. And the sergeant who called in the capture was dead. Connors was here and gone. He had a reason. Wait, there's more. The sergeant had been killed by a laser shot, but the body had been half eaten by something unknown. That's it. Whatever mutilated the body is the reason Major Connors was here. He's planted something on Cygnus 3. Something that could kill us all. Beta has located the Henderson reports. Reports of unusual events. 1900 hours, outpost 19. Lieutenant Henderson reporting. When I got here, what was left of the sergeant was directly in front of the door. Uh, there were what looked like small rats chewing on the body, but they scattered when I arrived. I took the body inside. Henderson out. Oh, 100 hours, outpost 19. Something funny out here. You know those rats I mentioned last time? But well, they've brought a whole lot of their friends to the area. I can see hundreds of them out there, staring at me with those little red eyes. What's taking you guys so long? Henderson out. Oh, 0300 hours, outpost 19. We got rats completely surrounding the outpost. There's tons of them. Maybe it's my imagination, but they look real hungry. Don't leave me here. Somebody help me! Using a terrafoil, the rebels speed across Cygnus 3, heading for Outpost 19. Get us there as quickly as possible, Beta. Uh, Dr. Close, your scientific expertise as a biologist and pathologist will be invaluable to us. I'm anxious to help in any way I can. 
We'll need an immediate analysis of the sergeant's wounds, Doctor. Commander Richards, you said that the man found at the outpost was severely bitten by something? Yes, and we thought you might be able to shed some light on what kind of animal might do that. We've got to know what we're up against here. Well, there's outpost 19 up ahead. That must be Lieutenant Henderson waiting for us. I don't see any signs of anything unusual around now. Over here. Over here, Commander Richards. Hurry. It's dangerous to remain outside. Those creatures left a few minutes ago, but they might return at any second. Where's the body, Henderson? I moved it inside the post, sir. I'll stay with the terrafoil, Christina. There may be a need for quick departure. Good idea, Beta. Well, there he is. Not a very pretty sight. What do you make of it, Doctor? Hmm. Hundreds of tiny bites. And look at this. A bite that goes completely through a bone. Christina, hand me that book on animal taxonomy in my medical bag. That's the one. Thank you. I can't believe it. I certainly never thought I'd see it, but it must be. What is it, Dr. Close? A rare animal, a mutation, but one that fascinated me as a student. What kind of monster caused this, Doctor? Far from a monster, Commander, at least in size. This is a tiny creature, no more than ten centimeters in length, with very sharp teeth and strong jaws. Rattus spatium. That's what they look like, all right. Why would Connors deliver such an animal to Cygnus III? He must have set two of them loose. They reproduce very rapidly. I'm sure he intends to have them overrun the planet. And they will. They'll eat everything in their path. We've got to get out of here immediately and warn the others. Space rats, they're coming back. Christina, we're being surrounded. There are tiny red eyes all around the terrafoil. Beta, move next to the outpost door. We're coming out. Roger, out. Christina, Henderson. Put your phasers on kill. We'll blast a path to the terrapoint. Ready? Go! On, Christina! Look out! The door, Beta! Quickly now! Everybody inside! Ah! My foot! One of them got me! Everybody's in, Commander! There's one on the door! Beta, get us out of here! Quickly! On the command ship, General Derrick lifts her glass in a toast. To Major Connors, may the planet Cygnus III be overrun with space rats eating their fill. Let us not celebrate too soon. Richards is no fool. If he can stop them, he will. Time is on our side. Already the creatures have begun to mate, and they will multiply endlessly. Relax, Vashaya. Richards is a clever, determined young man, but he has no special powers when it comes to the laws of nature. Of course, General. Perhaps I worry too much. Come, lift a glass. Let us savor the moment. Dr. Close and Colonel Zane are above Cygnus III in a hovercraft, collecting data and viewing the destruction caused by the exploding population of space rats. Dr. Close, look at that. The space rats have already eaten their way through half the forested area beyond outposts 18 and 19. Luckily, it's an area of low human population, but the plant and animal destruction is devastating. Reports from Mission Control, Christina. Nothing seems to work against the space rats so far. They've tried force fields, poisons, explosives... Do the reports indicate human death? We broadcast an emergency all-points bulletin to remain inside. Some humans were caught between destinations, Dr. Close. The death toll stands at 63. Based on the way the space rats are multiplying, I'm afraid Cygnus III will be a desert in less than four days. And then, we'll starve to death behind locked doors. Is there a solution, Dr. Close? There may be. Let's get back to Commander Richards at Outpost 19. There's something I want to try. It may be our last hope.
Back on Cygnus 3, there is a flurry of activity above Outpost 19. Okay, out there. Lower the tank. Dr. Close, the system we installed in this hovercraft baffles me. What can a receiver and four loudspeakers do to rid the planet of space rats? Those speakers will broadcast four tones played by the synchrodator here on board the hovercraft. The space rats should be irresistibly drawn toward the sound. Slow the winch, men. The water tank is in position, Christina. Thank you, Beta. Bringing the hovercraft down to within a foot of the tank. Hold it steady, Beta. I'm going out on top of the tank. Careful, Commander Richards. The rats are beginning to gather. I'm going to open the tank and slide the ramp to the ground. When I do, some of these rats will come up after me. Christina, give me laser cover. Ready, Steve. There goes the door to the tank. He's sliding the ramp down. The rats are going crazy. They're coming up the ramp. Cease fire. Cease fire. I'm coming aboard. Uh, there. Way to get that hatch shut. Okay, Doctor. It's all yours. Hope I guessed correctly. Look, the rats are pouring out of the woods, hundreds of them. Turn up the game. I think we've got them. They appear almost mesmerized by the tone. The rats are moving up the ramp. One just fell into the tank. And more and more. They're tumbling in by the time. Wait. What's that sound? The rats are imitating the tone. That's the last of them. Christina, use your phaser to cut the cable that holds the door of the tank open. The rats are still repeating the tones, Dr. Close, even though you've stopped the synchrodator. Yes. Hearing it is eerie. It's a ritual. A death ritual. They've stopped. Soon they'll go into a frenzy. Then, their final act of life. What do you mean, Doctor? Space rats refuse to wait patiently for death, Commander. When there is no alternative food source available, they become cannibals. Space rats live to eat, and they die the same way. Once again, the Dominion's plan has failed. The rebels of Cygnus III have survived to continue their fight for freedom in the galaxy. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 8 Double Trouble. The alien planet Delphi. Hot, burning acid rain slashes across the surface. Boulders wet with death litter the pockmarked face of a forgotten world. Lightning reveals a rebel shuttle on a rough landing site. Standing alongside the spacecraft, Commander Stephen Richards and General Zane are encased in full protection body shells to shield themselves from the planet's deadly rain. They're on a desperate mission seeking fuel from the hermits of Delphi. The seal on the shuttlecraft protects it from the acid rain. Same goes for us, as long as we wear these shells. Wristbands read normal, General. All set. We're heading for those orange lights up ahead. The hermits will meet us there. Why would anyone choose to live in a place like this? The hermits wanted a retreat where they wouldn't be disturbed. It looks like they got what they wanted. Watch it, Steve. Be careful. A puncture in your protective shell could, could be fatal, I know. We're almost there. Orange lights just ahead. Inside here. It's a kind of chamber. The orange lights just float. If I'm not mistaken, the designs on the walls are like temple carvings from 16th century Earth. We wait here. They will know. Ah, Excellency. You will follow me. We can't follow him. 
He's passing right through that rock wall. Follow humans. Do as he says. We walked through that wall like it was smoke. This is my third trip here, and I still don't understand how they do it. Stand in the yellow cone of light for decontamination. We're also being cleansed of travel fatigue and given a dose of relaxant. You may remove your shells. Welcome to our world. Commander, you think me strange and physically unappealing. It is a disturbing thought pattern to me. You will suppress it. You knew what I was thinking? I forgot to mention the hermits read minds, Steve. They call it mind sharing. You have never personally seen Delphian eye stalks before? I didn't mean to offend you, Excellency. You speak the truth. Good. If you did not, you would be dead. Follow. Delphi is honeycombed with corridors like this one. These moving ramps will take us well below the surface where the hermits live. Do they know why we're here? The fuel you seek lies at the confluence of the Delphian corridors deep inside the planet. It will be freely given, but you must remove it at your own risk and in your own craft. These terms are not negotiable. General. Look at the amount of fuel stored here. There are 3,000 cores of xanthronite fuel in each container, Steve. Well, there must be hundreds. The number you seek is 2,004. Enough xanthronite for a hundred of your years. But how do we get it out of these twisting corridors, General? A shuttlecraft would be capable of carrying the weight, but, but our pilots would most likely die trying to get the fuel out. Unless... Unless what, General? Devon, Excellency, there's one Delphian among you who could help us. One who has moved among men and aliens alike. Your kinship with the other and his death to you are known to me, human. But he hides from the world now. Devon, with your permission, I would like to speak with the other. Very well. I will communicate your desires to him. Wait here. General, who is this other? Ever heard of the alien shuttle specialist, Lucan? Well, who hasn't? He had incredible skill. An absolute magician in space. Lucan is unique. A Delphian who chose not to live the hermit existence. I remember now. Elysia. Yes, Lucan and Elysia. Their mind link was so powerful he gave up his Delphian life to share hers. Greetings, friends, eh? It has been many of your time units since we last met. Greetings, Lucan. I grieve with you for the passing over of the spirit of Elysia. Delphian mind sharing has eased the pain, somewhat. But the loss is great, even when shared with the collective consciousness. I apologize for intruding at this time, but... Lucan, without Delphian fuel, we don't stand a chance against the Dominion. And only you can teach us how to get our shuttles in and out of these corridors. To do that, I would have to go back into your world. You ask much. Lucan, you know our enemy. Your help is vital. Friend Zane, you rescued my beloved Elysia from a Dominion raiding party once, long ago. For that reason, I will do what you now ask. How soon could you be ready to leave? I have been many time units away from the controls of a shuttlecraft, but the asteroid belt in the RK sector should sharpen my timing quickly. I will meet you on Cygnus 3 in one of your days. Until then... Let's get back to base, Commander. Our whole future may ride on this. Good morning, Vashaya. Who is this? Major Connors, meet Lucan. Lucan, the alien shuttle specialist? How did he get here? I captured him, you idiot. Do you think he walked in here and begged to have his vocal cord severed? You severed his... He called me a lunatic. Me. Besides, his 
Delphian voice grated on my nerves. But he could have given us valuable information. How dare you question my methods, you simple-minded collection of spare parts? What's this? What's going on here? Who is this Delphian? That, my dear general, is the famous Lucan. Oh, I'm impressed, Connors. How did you capture him? I... The humanoid had nothing to do with it. I captured him. He was near my home in the R.K. sector when I spotted him. You live in an asteroid belt? Of course, General. A place both dangerous and strangely quiet. Do you find that unusual? I don't find it unusual, considering the condition of your mind. I warn you, Connors. A toy like you can be broken. Leave him alone, Vashaya. Tell me about the Delphian. I intercepted Lucan's spacecraft and forced him down on a small asteroid. Well, what information did you get out of him? None, General. Lucan can't tell us a thing. Vashaya severed his vocal cords. You did what? The important thing, General, is that I found his log showing his destination. Cygnus Three. He was to instruct rebel shuttlecraft pilots in precision maneuvers. Cygnus Three, We could have used this alien's knowledge to our advantage. Are you egotistical fool? Lokan called him a lunatic. Truth can be difficult to hear, General. This time you've gone too far. Stop it at once, Bashaya. Let me go. I must continue to function. Humanoid imbecile! Just be thankful I'm leaving you a voice. Inoperative, non-functional. You will not get away with this, Vashaya. Connors was mine. I command the sector, and don't you forget it. Listen to me, General. Our speechless friend's destination suggests a wonderful plan. An exchange of identities that will result Whatever in... Whatever you have in mind, Vashaya, it is your last chance to prove yourself useful. If you fail, I will not allow myself to be brought down with you. I will cut my losses. This plan is brilliant. Simply brilliant. Now, if you will excuse me, my dear general, I'll throw Lucan into a quiet cell. Then I'm going to take his place on Cygnus Three. With a little help from medical science. Inoperative, non functional. Anxious eyes search the sky above Cygnus 3. The shuttle specialist Lucan is long overdue. I can't understand it. He should have been here hours ago, McCormick. He could have been delayed by Dominion fighters, sir. They were noted in grid area 9 on our scanners. Are we ready for him, Steve? Duplication of the Delphi corridors is complete, sir. 120 kilometers of lights, 300 meters apart, making corridors that intersect at odd angles. If Lucan can train our pilots to move through that... Clear area for spacecraft arrival. Incoming vehicle. Tunnel number one. It's Lucan. Did you see that? He's coming in upside down. Unorthodox methods can prove very effective at times. He's on final. Hovering now. Look at that roll. A 180 from a hover just before touchdown. Exactly the kind of maneuver we need. Greetings, friend Zane. Greetings, Lucan. We were becoming concerned. Welcome to Cygnus 3. An unavoidable delay, I'm afraid. Lucan, this is my daughter, Christina. Pleased to meet you, sir. We're grateful for your help. I shall do everything in my power to make this visit worthwhile. And now, Christina, could you show me to my quarters? It's been a long trip. Of course, Lucan. Right this way. Follow me. Sir, I know this sounds crazy, but does Lucan seem different to you somehow? Different? I'm sure it's just the strain of adjusting to the world again. But now that you mention it... Oh, this is ridiculous. See you at the morning briefing, Steve. I'll be there, General. Tomorrow could be the most important day of our lives.
Pre-dawn on Cygnus 3, Pashaya's diabolical mind reviews his plan. Oh, 300 hours. Black as the inside of a tomb. Good. Time for me to plant the limpet mines on every shuttle I can reach. With a skill born of long practice, Fashaya moves noiselessly from building to building. But as he reaches the hangar... Halt! You there! Step into the light! Oh, Lucan, sir. Sorry to startle you, Sergeant. Just taking some spare parts out to my ship to do a few minor repairs. Yes, sir. Will you be needing any help, sir? No, but I thank you for your kindness. Your ship is docked with the Rebel Shuttle, sir. Just around that corner. Thank you, friend. That's perfect. Gullible idiot. Actually believing anyone would repair a vehicle at this hour. This must be the door. There they are. Now, all I need to do is attach a charge to as many shuttles as I can. And turn on the radioactivated detonator. The shuttles will explode on command. All right. Hold it right there, mister, and don't move. What is the meaning of this? You told me you were going to repair your ship, but you went right by it. Then I saw what you're putting on the shuttles. Explosive charges with tuners preset to a radio frequency. You would have made a very good investigator, my friend. Whoever you are, I'm taking you to security for questioning. Move it. Of course. You have the upper hand. Except for one thing. Ah, the wonderful element of surprise. Now, what to do with the body? Oh, brilliant idea. My friend, your funeral will be spectacular. I'm going to stuff you into the thrust output of this shuttle. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, when they fire up, you'll fry like a pig on a barbecue spit. <laughs> on the bridge of the Dominion command ship, General Vera Derrick has just received some very distressing news. This could put the entire Cygnus 3 operation in jeopardy. Has this unexpected development been verified? Lucan has escaped, sir. His cell is empty. Oh, I don't understand. He was thoroughly searched before he was put away. All we know is that the guard on level six is dead and Lucan has disappeared, along with one of our observation pods. Is it possible to alert Vishaya about the escape? No, sir. He ordered deep security silence, not to be broken for any reason. Then launch an automated explorer probe. I must know what happens to the Delphian. Do it. Immediately, General. You're on your own, bounty hunter. Succeed, and the glory will be credited to my sector. Fail, and the rebels will have done my work for me. Perfect. Oh, 0700 hours on Cygnus 3. Twenty shuttlecraft line the launch bay tunnel. A young pilot stands alongside each ship, ready for Lucan's instruction. Greetings, Commander Richards. I trust you slept well. Very well, thank you. Uh, Lucan... You wish to say something? Sometimes, you remind me of someone else. I can't seem to... Relax, friend Richards. It will come to you. Are the men ready to begin? Everything's set. All pilots to your shuttle craft. I'd be honored if you'd accompany me in my craft, Commander. I assure you, it will be interesting. I'd like that, Lucan. I might even learn something myself. You just might. Sequential launch in five seconds. Mark three, two, one. All shuttlecraft, 
three seconds of vertical climb. Add booster. Now, pay close attention, friend Richards. This is where it gets interesting. Try to move, Richard. Well, I, I can't. Paralyzing Isotron B. I don't understand, Lucan. Lucan, just let me turn this voice coder implant off. Voice coder implant? You see, I never told you my name was Lucan. Shia! What's the meaning of this masquerade? Look outside, Richards. Twenty shuttles in perfect formation. A pity all those pilots are about to die. You're mad. Perhaps. You're about to see a chain of explosions, synchronized to every other tick of this timer. It all starts with a fifth tick. Sort of a countdown to death. No! Don't do it! Do you feel power of this moment, Richard. Stop it! Stop it, Vishaya! It will stop itself, Richards. There. Even the quiet has a certain grandeur. Don't you agree? If I could move, but I... you can't. Oh, this is a great success for the Dominion. And for me, personally. Twenty rebel shuttlecraft. Oh, beautiful. I suppose it's my turn next. How unimaginative. No, Richards, you will live. Live with the knowledge that the rebels will suffer and die because you're one of them. That's part of my own personal revenge. What are you talking about? Don't you remember? Your testimony sent me to prison on Satar. Ten years of my life on a radioactive wasteland. You'll pay dearly for that. Satar wasn't my doing. You put yourself there. You murdered a man in cold blood, Vishaya. There had to be punishment. And now you'll know the consequences of that punishment, Richards. I've waited a long time for this chance to see you suffer. And there's nothing you can do to stop me. We'll see about that, Vishaya. Soon I'm going to destroy you and all of Dominion. Know about Emerald Tree. Emerald Tree? You're starting to rave, Richards. Enough talk. Time for you to go back to Cygnus 3. I'm turning the Isotron beam off, but I remind you, I have you covered. So don't try anything heroic. Get in that ejection capsule behind you. Move. I'll be back, Bishaya. I promise you. You haven't seen the last of me. Beginning to get on my nerves, Richards. Goodbye, rebel fool. Out of rotation to eject trajectory. Eject. In a different sector of space, a Dominion automated explorer probe discovers a tiny observation pod in orbit around a featureless moon. The explorer's data sensors lock on, noting sector time and location, as well as the absence of life. Inside, a crumpled form slumps awkwardly over the control panel. The orbiting mass has become an icy casket, a final resting place for a lonely fighter who could not speak. Lucan, whose escape led only to the cold graveyard of space. Lucan... Your spirit has passed over, and we mourn your loss. But a Delphian life is not taken without consequences. The Dominion will pay. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 9, Illusions. From the moment Stephen Richards learned of something called Emerald Tree and of the existence of a secret that could destroy the Dominion, he's been obsessed with the need to uncover it, 
What could it be, and how could it be found? This target practice may be necessary, Christina, but it's not one of my favorite things to do. Here comes your score, Steve. Thirteen out of fifteen. A point eight six 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 accuracy rating. Final target group in place. Fire five shots when ready. Oh, my concentration's off. I've got something on my mind. I can't seem to shake loose. Well, finish up here, and we'll go someplace and talk it out, okay? Commander, a comment, if you please. Angle your right shoulder toward the target a bit more, and your accuracy will increase by thirteen point four percent. Are you sure, Beta? Affirmative, Commander. It will place you directly on line. <coughs> One hundred percent accuracy on final target group. Total cumulative score nine six point five zero zero. Next, please. Oh, that did work better. Thanks, Beta. My pleasure, Commander. Let's walk back to base for lunch, Steve. I'm starved. You can tell me what's on your mind on the way. It's my parents' last message, Christina. It haunts me. You know, it might never be possible to put a definite meaning to that message. I can't accept that. My parents lost their lives trying to tell me the secret that could destroy the Dominion. I have to find it, Christina. Commander, as I recall, their message was to destroy the Dominion. First, you must destroy, and then the transmission was cut off. What did it mean? Destroy what? What could be so crucial to the Dominion system that to destroy it would mean an end to the whole thing? The key is probably in your Dominion past, Steve. But where? In what random combination of thoughts and facts? Beta, I wish I had memory banks to scan like you do. It is more convenient and efficient. If I might be permitted to observe, there are many deficiencies in the human brain. As you're forever reminding us, Beta. On the other hand, humans have some things I deeply admire. Ears, for example, wonderful parts. That's it, Beta. You're a genius. Why, thank you, Commander. But all he said. Was I to... think I finally know a way to get close enough to Dominion to learn the secret. It just might work. During lunch, Richards outlines his daring plan. I know I'm right, General. I've spent months trying to figure this out, and finally, I think I have a plan that'll work. Sounds interesting, but extremely dangerous. However, I'm willing to listen. Christina, pass the meat enhancer,、uh, the beef, and Beta. I believe I'll have a refill on the Opergian beer. Send out for Opergian beer, me. I'm not the service droid, really. I'm listening, Steve. Well, first a question, sir. How much do you know about Dominion Homeworld? Not nearly as much as we need to. We know it's on the planet Vega, that Igrathor appears to be in charge, and that the planet's surrounded by a deadly high-energy force field. As far as we know, no one's ever seen their leader. Precious little is known about Igrathor, and every attempt to penetrate the force field has resulted in death. Ah,、oh, Beta, thank you. Just set it down here. I've alerted the service droid. If you need anything else, have I missed anything? Quiet, Beta. General, when I was with Dominion, nothing of importance was decided without definitive orders from Vega. No questions asked. Vega, not Core Command. Correct. Now, if we could somehow penetrate Dominion home world. I feel sure we could learn the secret, the way to destroy this stranglehold on the galaxy. You're not suggesting a direct assault on Vega. It would be suicide. No, not an assault, sir. A way to eavesdrop on the planet's internal communications. A listening probe planted on one of the Vega moons. A space ear. An extremely bold and intriguing possibility, Commander. What exactly are you proposing, Steve? Well, the standard catalog shows that Vega has three moons. One of them. Luna One has an atmosphere tolerable for humans. Correct, Beta. Affirmative, Commander. But the atmosphere on Luna One is quite thin, approaching the dead zone, barely breathable for your life form. But breathable. 
Sir, a small landing party would plant a listening device on Vega. What it picks up could be monitored from our long-range scanners recently installed in the cartoon bunkers. It's a long shot, Steve. But is there any alternative, Father? If this works, it could be a major breakthrough. The mission is within the limits of probability, General. It's high risk, no matter what the probability. Sir, if the Dominion is vulnerable, if it is hiding a fatal weakness, it'll be found by listening in on Homeworld. All right, then. If you're convinced the secret can only be found on Vega, Steve, then we must try to find it. Get your landing party together. Permission to go to Luna One granted. On Dominion Homeworld, deep inside the caverns of Vega, a conversation between two familiar voices is in progress. You have done well, my friend. I sensed a change in tactics, but could not pinpoint the origin and plan. Transporting proton workers from Nitra to Cygnus III gave me perfect cover. Humans speak so freely. It is easy to discover their plans. They intend to come to Luna One. So be it. I will be waiting for them. Time is now a factor to be considered, sir. Yes, it will be costly to me, but it must be done. I will turn my attention toward Luna One, and away from the master plan for a time. These rebels cannot be allowed to play their game pieces out of turn. Only I decide the move. The Luna One landing party travels through the blackness of space, heading toward a small moon in the next star system. The long and perilous journey has just begun. Course plotted and locked in, Commander. Computer will course correct as needed. Estimated time to the Vega Moon, Beta? ETA, one day, three hours, 57 minutes. Let's put the time to good use, then. Dr. Close, as our mission scientist, what can you tell us about Luna One? Beta, scan the standard catalog for Luna's raw data, please. One of three Vega moons. Luna 1 is in the star system Cadulus Epsilon. It is barren, waterless, and cold. The atmosphere, a marginal mix of oxygen and nitrogen. Pressure equivalent to 18,000 feet of Earth's altitude. That's mighty thin air, Commander. Computer course correction. Zero, one, nine... Mark. Acknowledged, computer. An interesting fact. We are not the first Luna One landing party. You mean the moon is inhabited? Not exactly. Does the name Dr. Armand Brewer mean anything to anyone? Or the Brewer Expedition? Oh, wait. Uh, I came across that reference when Beta and I researched the Vega system. Um, an exploration team from Earth. Searching for possible colonization sites in the galaxy about... Forty years ago. Those expeditions to find settlements were common before Dominion came to power. My father was navigator for the one to Cygnus III before it was settled. Computer course correction. Zero, zero, eight. Mark. Acknowledged, computer. I don't recall seeing the findings of the Brewer expedition, though. That's the mystery, Commander. After making a verified landing on Luna 1, the entire expedition disappeared. All attempts to locate the team or its ship's log were a failure. No sign of the spacecraft or any of the crew was ever found. The Brewer expedition to Luna One vanished without a trace. The rebel mission begins its landing on Luna One. Okay, Baker, take her down in that clearing. Power to one-third. Port thrusters on auto. We're on final. Now, when we get down, Baker, you stay with the shuttle. Be ready to lift off in a hurry. Roger, Commander. Won't be too soon for me. This place gives me the creeps already, and we haven't even landed. Power hover. Steady over landing target. Fifty meters. Now, Dr. Close, we'll be relying on you and Beta for constant readings and analyses once we're on Luna One. I'll be paying special attention to respiration rates. 
Remember, there's barely enough oxygen to keep us functioning at normal performance levels. Take her down, Beta. Descent countdown. Ten meters. Five. Two. One. We have contact. Power off. Give me a quick scan of the surface, Beta. Planet's atmospheric and geographic readings match the standard catalog data, Commander. Subsistence conditions for human life forms, no more. What's that noise? Commander, I'm getting unusual energy readings. Some of it could be coming from the force field around Vega, but most of it's coming directly from Luna 1. Keep monitoring, Beta. All right, everybody, let's plant that listening probe and get out of here as quickly as we can. Baker, release the descent ramp. As the landing party leaves the safety of the rebel shuttlecraft... What was that? There it is again. I'm scanning. Indications of a large mass of energy behind those rocks, coming directly for us. Try to reach the safety of those boulders. A fire as you go. Phasers on kill. What is it? Must be 12 feet tall. Look at those claws. And its teeth. It's obviously some kind of mutation. Run. Run for it. Phasers don't seem to affect the thing. It just keeps coming. It... Wait. What's happening? It's gone. But where and why? We were at its mercy. Energy mass no longer readable, Commander. What was its composition, Beta? No known life form, Doctor. Just massive energy readings. Our phasers were useless against it. Why didn't it kill us? Commander... We've got to rest a moment. Respiration rates were reaching dangerous levels. We must breathe normally. It's important. Dr. Close, I feel lightheaded and nauseated. Oxygen narcosis, Christina. Don't be concerned. You're hypoxic, that's all. Commander, might I suggest we proceed to the coordinates you've chosen for planting the listening device and then get off this moon as soon as possible? Nothing about this place seems right to me. I couldn't agree more, Beta. All right, now stay alert. Follow me. Did you feel that? Yes. A seismic disturbance of some kind. Rock strata on Luna 1 is shifting. Tremendous pressure from below the surface. A rock slides deep, and it's heading right for us. Try to outrun it. Head for that clearing. away from her. Christina, answer me. Are you all right? Christina. Carefully, watch her head. It's bleeding. Move her as little as possible. Christina, it's Steve. Can you hear me? Beta med scan quickly. It's not possible, Commander. There are absolutely no readings at all. Oh, Christina. No readings? You've got to be mistaken. Dr. Close, scan again. Pulse, negative. Respiration, negative. Brain waves, negative. You mean she's dead? No, she is not dead. I would know. Not dead, Steve. But she isn't alive either. She appears to be in stasis, a suspended state of some kind. I have no other satisfactory clinical explanation. We've got to get her back to Cygnus 3. Maybe something can be done for her there. What about the listening probe, Commander? Oh, forget it. I dropped it back there somewhere. Beta, take Christina. We've got to move fast if she's to have any chance of survival. The landing party quickly returns to the shuttlecraft. But a surprise awaits them. I'm getting dizzy, Doctor, and my headaches. We've exceeded all limits for oxygen starvation long ago. 
I'm having the same symptoms, even hallucinating. Speaking of hallucinations... I don't understand, Commander. What do you see? Nothing. That's the problem. Unless my coordinates are off, our shuttle should be right in front of us. Can you confirm, Beta? With all that's happened, I'm a bit out of sync, Commander. But you are correct. That's where we left Lieutenant Baker and the shuttle. They vanished. Then we're trapped. Trapped on Luna One. While the Rebel landing party struggles with the unknown, unexplained events have also been happening within the Dominion system. Krieg, two of Dominion's top commanders are missing. Their ships simply disappeared from our observation scopes. You were paid to find out what happened to them. I've already given my report. The facts cannot be altered. The next move is not yours to make. You've given no report, Krieg. You just said, watch the scope, and your patience will be rewarded. Oh, you call that intelligence information? Why, if Major Connors were here, he would know how to deal with this incompetent fool. Unfortunately for us all, your humanoid is still being refitted and reprogrammed. Never fear, General. I can handle Krieg myself. Then do it. You will tell us what we want to know, alien. Are the Dominion commanders dead? Have they been purged by Homeworld? Is it possible to broaden our base of power and take command of their sectors, too? General Derrick, the missing Dominion command ships are back on the scope. Both of them, exactly where they were before they disappeared... And communications back online, too. I told you all would be as it was, and so I take my leave. <laughs> I don't understand. Were they really gone or not? Was it a trick for Shia? Probably just a communications malfunction. Don't waste any more valuable time on it. There's nothing in it for us. So where's Creed? No one dismissed him. I believe the alien is gone, General. He seems to have slipped away, as he so often does. On the surface of Luna One, what's left of the Rebel landing party counts its losses. Let's see. Baker's missing, along with a shuttlecraft. The listening probe's buried under tons of rock. And then there's Christina. We're alone, Dr. Close, except for something that's out there. This is how the Brewer expedition must have felt. What a barren place to end one's life. Wait, Commander. The energy field is receding. Readings show it's losing power rapidly. Beta's right. It's fading away. Should reach normal levels right about now. Christina, she's moving. Med scan, Beta, hurry. Her life signs are all returning. And the head wound and body lacerations have disappeared. It's as if she were never hurt at all. Amazing. Uh, why is everyone staring at me? Oh, Beta, stop hopping around like that. You're giving me a headache. Besides, you look ridiculous. <laughs> now, that's the Colonel Zane we all know. I'd say she's going to be just fine. Well, what are we doing out here in the cold anyway? Why aren't we in the shuttle? Christina, the shuttle vanished. We're trapped here. <laughs> you must be losing it, Commander. The shuttle's right behind you. What? Well, I'll be... This is all totally illogical and a terrible strain on my circuits. Commander, if you could manage to tear yourselves away from the beautiful scenery here, the shuttle is standing by for immediate liftoff. Is everything all right over there? Just fine, Baker. We're on our way. Did you plant the listening probe, Steve? You destroyed it in the rock slide. Or at least, I think it was. Come on, I've had enough of this place. Let's get back to Cygnus 3. Debriefing this mission's going to be interesting. How do we know what actually did happen to us on Luna 1? Well, the mission wasn't exactly a success. Without that probe working, discovering the secret seems as far away as ever. And yet... 
I have the nagging feeling that we did discover something of importance while on the Vega moon. The question is, what? In a small cave behind a pile of rock and debris, a ship's recorder transmits its log once every 12 hours, just as it has for the last 38 years. It will continue until its power source is exhausted. Captain Dwyer, final log, Brewer Expedition. I've told you everything. All dead. I am the last. I had to survive to tell the story. Horrible, unspeakable terror and power. And now you know the secret of this thing. It must be destroyed or Earth is doomed. The entire galaxy is doomed. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 10, The Search Party. Orbiting in space, a Dominion command ship shines golden in the reflection of the sun. Inside, General Derek confronts her enemy, Vashaya. You may have the ear of Igrathor, Vashaya, but I am not impressed with your performance, and I command this ship. General, you're overreacting. Just because I broke your toy, Connors. You dare refer to Major Connors as my toy? What then? A humanoid? An advanced robot at best? You behave as if he were human. You tore him apart. Yes. And I enjoyed it. Connors is my second in command. He is valued and trusted. Not is, General. Was. Major Connors is being reconstructed. Meanwhile, your actions have put my command in jeopardy once again. My actions? Your humanoid led the all-out attack on Cygnus Three that failed. He turned back. He was facing four armed transports. His decision was entirely logical. I disagree, General. I reviewed the log. Perhaps you should do the same. I'll put it on the screen for you. You better have your facts right, Vishaya. This is what Connors was facing. I'll use the multiplier and that enhancement. Now, look closely at the outline of those transports. I see. He should have caught that. They're unarmed. Notice the Malcon rails? Only one planet uses them. The Apergians. The alien informant Krieg confirmed their involvement. And they call themselves neutral. They must be taught a lesson. They will be. A lesson they'll never forget. With your permission, I leave within the hour. The Persian homeworld will be totally annihilated. Good. Vishaya, though I dislike you intensely, I must admit, you do your job with admirable enthusiasm. There's much to be done before I... Uh, General, I... Uh, Are you in pain, Vishaya? Uh, a knife being turned inside my head. Sit down. We'll apply Q system immediately. Uh, hurry! Unbutton your shirt. The applicator must be over the heart. Uh, relief. The sharp pain inside my head is almost... Uh, it's gone. Readout confirms a physical exam required. You must contact Dr. Ariel Jodma immediately. Is she the only doctor on board? Yes. Why do you ask? Let's just say we don't get along. An examination is a most unwelcome interruption. But I suppose it must be done. Nevertheless, expect Opergian homeworld to disappear from all scanners by noon tomorrow. Good day, General. Ah. 
little man is an overbearing fool. I hope his head explodes. It would be a pleasure to be rid of him once and for all. On the dark side of the rocky, wind-swept planet Cartone, Commander Richards marvels at the progress of the new launch platforms that will soon be used against the Dominion. Fantastic! The struts are up, liners are in. Hey, your crew's made remarkable progress, Baton. Thank you, sir. It's such a great feeling to be pulling out ahead of the Dominion for a change. Uh, are we talking about the same thing? I forgot, sir. You just got back from Luna One. Yes. What's been going on? While you were on the Vega Moon, sir, Rebel forces made tremendous advances on all fronts. Every gamble we took, every guess we made was right. And at the same time, Dominion aggression against us almost stopped. Did you say while we were on the Vega Moon, a noticeable decrease in a Dominion show of power? Are you sure, Baton? Positive, Commander. There were almost no patrols, no attacks, hardly a blip on the scanners for a week. Interesting. I wonder. Maybe we learned more about the secret while we were on Luna One than we thought. Commander, Commander Richards, urgent comlink. Can you come down, sir? Uh, right away, Sergeant. Give me a hand, Baton. It's General Zane, Commander, on full scramble. Richards here. What is it, General? Steve. We just got an urgent message from inside the Dominion. From inside the Dominion? Affirmative. It came through an old 20th century Morse code. Clear as a bell. On the same frequency we used to check Lotron tubes. Who sent it? We don't know, Steve. But the message said the Dominion is about to move against the Duchess. Their plan is to destroy the Opergian planet. Well, they must have found out about the transports, General. I've contacted the Duchess myself. She's taking the message seriously and evacuating the planet. Evacuating? Why? She's only got five hours, Steve. We owe the very existence of Cygnus III to the Opergians, General. They're in this trouble because of us. I agree. The location of the Opergian ship is on your computer in Sub-3. Leave immediately, Steve. You must get them out safely. Three Vagon-type Dominion cruisers thunder toward Opergian homeworld. Their mission? Total destruction of every form of life on the planet. In the lead cruiser, Dr. Ariel Jodma completes her examination. I'm afraid our tests show a few problems, Vishaya. I was aware of that when I came in here. Could you possibly elaborate on your diagnosis for me? You were exposed to ten years of neutron radiation while in prison on the planet Satar, is that true? Quite true. Your central nervous system has been extremely resilient. Unusually so. But radiation is radiation, my dear Vishaya. And the human body is only the human body. There is a point to all this, Doctor. Yes, there is. Your body is losing its long fight against the radiation effects. A reversal process is taking place. Will this reversal cause any severe damage to my normal functions? Quaintly put, eventually it will cause your death. Your concern is overwhelming. No doubt you've already calculated when my bodily functions will cease. The prognosis is that you have three... Years? Uh, more like three weeks. What? You heard me. Being a soldier of fortune, you should accept death quite easily, Vishaya. Only three weeks. Are you quite sure? I rarely miscalculate. But even if there is a remission, it will merely delay the inevitable. By the way, there will be side effects. What side effects? Odd feelings of heat centering about your heart... And your flesh will change, darken in color, becoming purple. Doctor, I really don't want the to hear this. It will increase inside your veins until... But no matter. You will be unconscious by then. I would suggest you put your affairs in order, Vishaya. Thank you very much, Doctor. Your diagnosis is painfully clear. My pleasure, Vishaya. Oh, on your way out... 
Would you tell the nurse to send in the next patient? An Opergian command ship slowly moves towards Cygnus III. Its outline reveals hundreds of spacecraft clinging like lice to its surface. They are Opergian workships crammed to capacity with refugees. Commander Stephen Richards approaches for rendezvous. Incredible sight. All those ships. Well, at least they're on their way. Let's see. Short line comlink is 23-9. The Duchess should be expecting me. Calling Opergian Command. This is Rebel Commander Stephen Richards. Violation of approach distance by intruder. Prepare to fire. Oh, not again. Duchess, this is Stephen Richards. On my command, fire. That was a warning, Stephen. Hold your present position. But, all right. All right, holding position as ordered. Because I agreed to help you and your friends, Stephen, we have been forced to evacuate our homeland, leaving everything behind. I am angry, very angry. General Zane has apologized to me and my people, but you, Stephen, have not. But there was nothing else we could have done. When the attack on Cygnus III came, we were forced to use your transports as a bluff. It was a costly bluff, Stephen. I know, and I'm sorry. Will you permit me to come aboard, Duchess? I'll try to explain what happened. Perhaps then you'll understand why. Never mind, Stephen. It's not necessary. It's just that it hurts so much. No further explanation is needed. Permission to come aboard. Use docking port number three. The bridge of the Apergian command ship is crowded. Duchess Bianca Azizi, a direct descendant of the Queen, is very much in control. Locator scanner to full. Screen 9 for Cygnus 3. Rebel planet up on 9. Full ahead. Full ahead, Excellency. Cygnus 3 in 12 hours, 41 minutes. This ship handles almost like a fighter, Bianca, in spite of its size. But with all those hitchhikers on the outside, Stephen, we're burning fuel at a fantastic rate. There are 17,000 people on this ship alone. If the Dominion finds us before we reach the safety of Cygnus There's 3... There's no way Vashaya could locate this ship. All personnel to battle stations. An enemy explorer probe just missed us, Excellency. A Dominion Seeker must be nearby. A Seeker? It'll launch more probes. Use the Null system to destroy the Seeker. Vectoring. All ships locked on. Two. One. Launch. You see, guidance on all ships target the Seeker, Stephen, and then launch missiles for the point where locator scans intersect. I get it. At the Null point. Null system on ready. Countdown. If that Seeker launched more than one probe, we could be in deep trouble. Seekers are automatic. It's just luck when they locate a target. Our luck just ran out. A probe has found us. Two. One. Well, that takes care of the Seeker. But now the Dominion knows our location. The probe reported back automatically. Get to communication, Stephen. I'll handle things here. Your people must know. Inside Vashaya's lead war cruiser, a young officer reports. Backup scanners confirm previous readouts, sir. Human life forms are totally absent from the Opergian planet. Only small mammals and gill breathers remain. Do you stand by your report, Lieutenant Kerr? Yes, sir. I checked the scanners twice to be absolutely sure. Where can they be? Where? I can't think with this headache. Are we still going to use the Criston cannons on the planet, sir? Naturally, Lieutenant Kerr. The Opergians may have eluded us for the moment, but we can make sure they have nothing left to come home to. Come, Link, sir. It's General Derrick. What can the old witch want now? Patch it. This is Vishaya, General. Vishaya. One of our seeker probes located a large ship near the outer limits of Opergian space. I thought you'd like to know. A large ship. 
Anything else? The report indicates the presence of over 17,000 life forms on that ship. The Apergians. We've got them. Their coordinates are on your screen, easily within range. We leave immediately. Mishaya out. Lieutenant Kerr? Yes, sir. Patch me through to the other Vagon cruisers. They're armed and ready, sir. Green lights on all the other units. And we're online, sir. Attention, Attention all, all units. units. This, this is Vishaya. We, we leave, leave immediately, immediately for the, the coordinates, coordinates on, on your screens. screens. Arm Priston cannons. Full destructive, destructive force. Prepare, Prepare to, to fire on the Opergian homeworld. Fire! <laughs> As Vashaya rushes to overtake the Apergians, General Derek pays a secret visit to the robotics lab where Major Connors is being reconstructed. Welcome, Exalted One. The General honors us. Show me Connors, technician. Where is he? Suddenly, General. He is being kept at zero degrees between working sessions. The chart indicates Connors is connected. He's stored in tray four. We are very pleased with our work. The reconstruction is excellent. Yes, he looks just as he did. His programming is all but complete. Do you require activation? I want to add a personal touch to his program. Certainly, but implantation must take place in the twilight state. A precondition that triggers an auto-sequence. You understand. Bring him to the twilight state now. It is always gratifying to watch them come to life, so to speak. Humanoid, class one, nameplate, Connors. Moments now, a few adjustments. Humanoid, class one. Nameplate, Connors. Technician, this is a very private moment between the humanoid and myself. Do I make myself clear? Oh, a thousand pardons. I shall wait outside. Twilight stay. Receptors targeted for programming. Connors, can you hear me? Voice recognition. Storage activation. Good day, General Derek. Programming receptors are available. Connors, this is a primary command. Primary command. Accepted. Motivational implant. Vashaya is dangerous. Vashaya is dangerous. For my protection, Vashaya must die. He must be eliminated. Vashaya must be eliminated. Action command. You will arrange for Vashaya to be killed when I give the order. I'll choose the time to implement. I will arrange to have Vashaya killed at your command. Programming complete. Complete. Welcome back, my pet. Unaware of Connor's new instructions, Vashaya races to a rendezvous in space. Fast and brutally efficient, the Vagon cruisers are nearing the intercept point. Closing. Visual in three minutes. Prepare for retrofire. Retros to computer positive. Hold the retros, Lieutenant Kerr. I just thought of something. A straight line from a Pergian home world passing through their last reported position would end at... Cygnus 3, sir. At our speed, delaying retrofire only four-tenths of a second will place us between the Opergians and Cygnus 3. They would be unable to get past us. Affirmative, sir. We would be directly in their path. Reprogram the retrofire. Yes, sir. Plus four-tenths. Retrofire in 20 seconds. Set Criston cannons for the Opergian command ship on main scanner. Retros to computer positive. Three, two, one. Give me open channel on comlink. Channel open, sir. This, this is Vishaya. Enemies, Enemies of the Dominion, Dominion must die. die. It's Vishaya. Dominion warship dead ahead. We're trapped. 
himself. He'll destroy us all. Death is the reward for treachery. All ships prepare to fire Briston cannons. Fire! What happened? I don't know. The cannons fired, but the charges never reached us. It's Devon from Delphi. Devon, what have you done? I have interfered with your world, Richard. For the moment, time has stopped, and all in the war machine wait with it. Stephen, we're moving past the Criston charges. They're frozen in space. Yes, my friend. And they shall stay frozen until your party reaches Cygnus Three. It is written, the hermits of Delphi may stop time, but there is a condition. We may not touch, may not harm, may not interfere. And you will not upset this delicate balance, Commander Richards. This act is coldly taken in direct retaliation against the Dominion for the brutal death of Lucan, our brother. Look, we're passing under the big on cruisers, and they can't do anything to stop us. Engineering to bridge. This is the bridge. Go ahead, engineering. There's a mystery here, Your Excellency. Suddenly, our fuel supplies have increased threefold. We have no explanation. For the brutal death of Lucan, our brother. Devon again. The fuel is to help us return to Cygnus Three. Remarkable. He's given us our lives. Engineering, full power. We're heading for Cygnus Three. And we're going to make it. Hours later, Time begins again for the Dominion. The Opergians. They've disappeared. Where are they? Where have they gone? The answer to Vishaya's question is home. Home to a new life on Cygnus Three. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emily Tree? More clues follow in episode 11, The Plot Against the Shire. Dominion, at times a sleeping dragon, seemingly vulnerable, less alert, only to erupt with fire and destruction, crushing the rebel forces. 1900 hours on Cygnus III. An event has already taken place that will have startling consequences. As Christina Zane opens the door to her room, she notices a familiar form on her bed. Oh! Beta, what are you doing lying on my bed? Is that an ice pack on your head? Christina... Auto-diagnostic data indicates a high-intensity filibration in my head plate. According to my memory banks, this is what you do when you have a headache. But it doesn't seem to be doing me any good. Well, that's not too surprising, Beta. Here, scoot over. Let me sit down. And get that ice pack off your head. The drop in temperature will cause your synaptic circuits to malfunction. I feel awful. Oh, Beta friend, you're a robot. Take my word for it. You can't have a headache. On the other hand, a dysfunction this strong could only be caused by one thing. Acting on conflicting primary commands. You're right, Christina. I had to choose, and I did. Oh. oh, now maybe it isn't as bad as you think. Just tell me what happened. Remember last week when we were all at the Club Tri-Space 17? I remember. Commander Richards was talking about needing more source information if the secret that could destroy the Dominion is ever to be found. Mm -hmm. He said the only way to get at that information was to go back to his old Dominion command ship, and then he would be able to search Philip's locker to see what Just was left. What I want to do. I want to go back to my old Dominion command ship. I've been thinking a lot about Phillips lately. He was aboard quite a while before he was killed. If I could get into his locker, 
there might be some clues in his personal effects. Just can that idea, Commander. The General would never agree to your going back inside a Dominion command ship, no matter what the reason. McCormick is right, Steve. It would be suicide. And there's no guarantee that Phillips's things haven't been destroyed, even if he did leave something behind. Order, order, I am your service droid. Punch up your favorite selection, please. Uh, give us a couple more minutes, okay? We're not quite ready. No order, human indecision. No order, human indecision. Commander, the odds against successfully completing a mission such as you are suggesting would be very high. But speaking solely from the standpoint of logical deduction... Oh, stop it, Beta. There's nothing logical about this idea. Oh, you can't resist quoting statistical probabilities, can you? I realize I may do that a bit too often. Commander, Phillips was an experienced intelligence operator. He wouldn't have risked notes or evidence You're or... You're saying Phillips was a professional. That's exactly my point. If a pro had found out anything about the secret, he would have figured a way to keep that information safe until he could get it out. Maybe it's waiting to be discovered, and all I have to do is go there and find... I don't believe it, Beta. Beta, tell me exactly what you did. Oh, Christina, I... I helped Commander Richards go back to the Dominion command ship. How could you, Beta? Your primary purpose is to protect me and all the rebels on Cygnus III. You might have sent Steve to his death. I know, but his reasons for going were so logical. If he found the secret to destroy Dominion, all the rebels would be saved. What could I do? Oh, I see. I understand now. A classic robotic nightmare. Conflicting primary commands. Oh, poor Beta. But I still can't believe you actually did it. I did it. But the course I plotted to Dominion Corps Command would conceal Commander Richards from scanners most of the way. We've got to tell Father. Maybe it's not too late. Steve wouldn't disobey a direct order to abort the flight. It's too late, Christina. What do you mean? By my calculations, if all has gone according to plan, Commander Richards is already on board the Dominion command ship. And if not? Then he's been captured, and the last thing he told me was he wouldn't allow himself to be taken alive. Aboard the Dominion command ship, in General Derrick's private quarters, a game of quadrimensional chess is being played. A game with moves made for keeps. Queen takes pawn. Check. It's time to eliminate the Shire, dear one. My plans for personal power must move forward. Your move. King takes queen. I will review the alternative methods and report my choice to you immediately. Rook to Rook 5. Check. I don't want to know how it will be done. Just when it's over. Understood. King to Knight 1. Perfectly, General. I will not disappoint you. Knight to Knight the shy has grown unstable, irrational. You will actually be doing the Dominion a patriotic service. Rook to Bishop 3. General, might I suggest an ingenious move? If the Shire simply disappears, his untimely demise need not be associated with us in any way. Rook to Rook. Eight. Check. Yes. I could report him missing in action. A term I've always found useful. King to Bishop Two. If we're clever enough, Igrathor and the leader will have no second thoughts about the Shire's death. Then see to it. I want the Shire eliminated permanently. Rook to Bishop 8. Check and mate. It appears 
I'm the winner this time, my pet. Deep in the labyrinth of passageways on General Derrick's command ship, Stephen Richards makes his way down a long row of storage lockers. His heart beat loud in his own ears. Richards checks the locker nameplates reflected in the glow of his hand light. Getting close. Let's see. Bennington, Peters, Phelps, Post. No Phillips. His locker must have been cleared out. Another dead end. What's that? His heart about to explode in his chest, Richards freezes and waits for his fate to be decided. Hold it right there. Hands over your head and turn around very slowly. Do exactly as I tell you or you're dead. The prison ship Rom in endless orbit around a dead sun in the outlands of space. On board, Major Connors, he was expected. No one enters the ROM without prior clearance. It houses the most dangerous of Dominion's convicts. Take me to the prisoner at once, Sergeant. Yes, sir. We'll take this elevator cage. After you, sir. Prisoner 91. He's a bad one, sir. You're the first visitor he's ever had, I think. Deck requested. Deck D, cell block 2. Stand clear of door, please. The cage moves down. Following his new programming, Connors is about to meet with an assassin. Prisoner 91, Grigory Roshan, age 52. In and out of prison most of his adult life. Sentenced to the ROM six years ago for a brutal murder. An attempted escape resulted in a one-year disciplinary sentence on Satar. Now serving the balance of his life term on the ROM. All parole denied. Destination reached. Deck D. Cell block 2. Follow me, Major. I expect to be left alone with the prisoner, Sergeant Troy. Do you think that's wise, sir? I mean, 91 is one of the most violent prisoners on the ROM. I assure you, I'll be quite safe. Remain outside the cell until I signal. Whatever you say, sir. This is his cell. I'll code you in, Major. Well, well. A visitor. And if I'm not mistaken, a humanoid. I'm here because I need your talent, Roshan. Which one? I have so many. <laughs> your speed, Roshan. Your deadly accuracy. And your knowledge. Knowledge? Of what? Not what, Roshan. Whom? Ah, you want someone eliminated. Do I know him? Your cellmate on Satar, the Shire. The Shire? That sadistic maniac. He's a crazed animal. You've made a good choice coming to me. He is fast and smart. He won't be taken out easily. If I agree to your plan, what's in it for me? Freedom, now, today, and the promise that you will become the richest man in the galaxy. Explain. Say a freighter loaded with rich cargo enters my territory. I could alert you. I'm sure an old pirate like you would know what to do with that information. Yes, that could be very lucrative. Uh, wait a minute. Why don't you just kill him yourself, humanoid? My programming does not permit it, and it is wiser to be once removed from an event of this nature. I owe this Shire. Eliminating him will be a pleasure. We have a deal, then? Deal. Back on Derek's command ship, Richards has been discovered. Stand perfectly still. 
I'm going to turn on the light. Colonel Richards? Lipton! Wait, I can explain. What are you doing here? How did you get inside? Lipton, believe me, it's not the way it looks. I was just trying Wait, to... Wait, quick. Get behind that partition. Someone's coming. He might recognize you. What do you mean? What's going on? No time to explain. Just do what I tell you. Lipton? Hey, Lipton, is that you? You look like you've just seen a ghost. Is everything all right? Well, sure. Fine. I... I was just leaving. You know your phaser's in your hand. Oh, well, replaced a photon cell. I was just putting it away. Well, I'm on my way to hoist a couple. Want to join me? <laughs> you look like you could use a belt or two. <laughs> I'll take a rain check, okay? I've got watch detail in a few minutes. Well, too bad. Take it easy, Lipton. Colonel. Commander. You can come out now. He's gone. Lipton. Lipton, I don't understand this at all. You had every chance to turn me in, and you didn't. Why? What are you doing back on the command ship? I'm not sure why, but I'm going to trust you. I came here looking for Carl Phillips' personal effects. Anything he might have left behind. Anything that we could use against the Dominion. By we, you mean the rebels? It's all right. I knew Phillips. You did? And I've got something that might be useful. His personal diary. It's in code, unbroken so far. When we learned he'd been tortured and killed, we raided his locker before the Dominion could get to it. We? What's going on here, Lipton? Why would you know where to find Philip's personal diary? He was an undercover rebel spy. I knew that long before you did. You see, Philip's organized a resistance group on board, a fifth column. I'm part of it. Was even when you were still here. Rebel sympathizers aboard Derek's command ship? Unbelievable. After your visit to Centiga, you were supposed to be our most important recruit, Commander. Listen to me, Lipton. I've got to have that diary. Will you help me get it out? Count me in, Commander. My days here are numbered anyway. I've been a little indiscreet sabotaging missions lately. Major Connors has his suspicions, I'm afraid. Well, then come with me, Lipton. Help get the diary where it belongs. You don't need to ask twice, Commander. But we're going to need quite a diversion to get out of here in one piece. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of everything. But I'll have to hide you until the night watch. Then you'll come back with the diary. You bet. It's my ticket to freedom on Cygnus 3. Cygnus 3, Mission Control. Lieutenant McCormick reports another unexplained disappearance in space. McCormick, it's obvious you're under stress. When you get back to Cygnus 3 for debriefing, a reason for all this will be found. With all due respect, General, you weren't here. You didn't see a 36,000 kilo protojet melt into space like so much fog. What's your status now, Lieutenant? We're still in Quadrant 4, sir. We were jumped by three Dominion protojets. We've lost Lieutenant Fosterman. They got her on the first pass. And Baker's protojet is badly damaged. But we blew two of them to space dust, General, and I had the third one in my sights, ready to take him out, when he just faded away. You're sure it wasn't a move into hyperspace? No way, sir. No boosters, no afterburn, no nothing. And even crazier, my scanner showed no trace of matter, just massive energy readings. All right, Lieutenant. We'll discuss it later. Bring your men back to Cygnus 3 immediately. We're on our way. McCormick out. Father? Father, is there any news about Steve? Nothing. We've been listening in on the Dominion Channel, but so far it's just the usual. I still can't believe that Steve would risk everything on an impossible mission. I'd really be angry if I weren't so worried. I know. However, we can be fairly certain he hasn't been captured. The Dominion wouldn't be able to resist parading a prize like Steve before the entire galaxy, alive or dead. On General Derrick's command ship, the greenery of a hydroponic garden exists side by side with the Dominion machinery of death and destruction. But even this oasis of peace and beauty may grow dangerous. All right, Connors, I'm here. But I won't be for long, so get to the point. I can barely breathe in this heat. Our business won't take long. Let's walk toward the waterfall. I won't be seeing you again, Vashaya. No? Has General Derek finally decided to get rid of you? <laughs> Where are you going? 
I'm not going anywhere, Vishaya. It is you who is being dismissed. Who are you kidding? Not another step, Vishaya. Well, my old cellmate, Roshan. Didn't you learn anything on Satar? You were never a match for me. Stop moving. Don't come any closer. Why don't you just shoot me, Roshan? You're not still afraid of me, are you? I told you to stop moving, Vishaya. You forced me to kill you too quickly. I've got the upper hand this time. I want to see you sweat. Plead with me to spare you. Like you made me do on Sata. Never. You'll just have to keep backing away from me, Roshan, because I'm coming for you. You see, I have nothing to lose. I'm dying already. But you didn't know that, did you? Did you? What are you talking about, Vishaya? Stay where you are. Roshan, look out behind you, the edge of the waterfall. What? No! So much for old cellmates. You never were smart enough to take me, Roshan. Now, I believe you and I also have a score to settle, humanoid. Wait, it wasn't me, General Derek. All this was her idea. I was programmed, Vishaya. Please! <coughs> You're attacking the wrong target. It was Bendu. That was long overdue, Major. Uh, oh no. Pain again. Exploding inside my head. This, this heat. I've got to get out of this hydroponic cesspool before I pass out. What to do with you, Connors? You have an annoying habit of rising from the ashes. Oh, I see the perfect final resting place for father like you. I'll just drag you over here to the compost masher. In you go. Fertilizer. Useful to the end. <laughs> brilliant, Vishaya. Positively brilliant. <laughs> Firefighting personnel and equipment to the bay on the double. That's it, Commander. The diversion. We'd better get out of here while they have their hands full. Ready for blast off, Lipton. All systems go. So long, Dominion. Next time I come back, I'll have the secret to destroy you and all you stand for. Three, two, one. Hang on, Lipton. We're going directly to hyperspace. Fire! All clear, sir. No immediate pursuit on the scope. Your resistance group is amazing, Lieutenant. General Zane is going to want to know everything about them. It could be an important tool. I'll help in any way I can, Commander. You already have, with Philip's diary. What a find. We've got to break that code. I'm convinced there's something important in there, Lipton. Maybe even a secret. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in episode 12, The Emerald Tree. Vashaya's protojet moves through Star Lane 47, half crazed from the unchecked effects of the deadly radiation sickness. His tortured mind is motivated by one thought, revenge, revenge against Stephen Richards. Time is running out. I feel like I'm 
boiling inside. I... Constant hammering in my head. Got to stay conscious a few more hours. Got to. The lone fighter heads toward a Dominion checkpoint. Sergeant Nick Perchek is the duty officer inside the control center. Suddenly, the bank of scanners in front of him lock onto a flickering dot that appears on the screens. He opens the comm link. Dominion checkpoint 8 to unidentified protojet. Unauthorized use of this star lane is forbidden. What is your security clearance? Repeat, you are entering a restricted area. Identify yourself immediately. This is the Shire, you fool! Are you challenging me? Code me through on my personal authority! I, I can't do that, sir. My orders are clear. I must have your security clearance. No exceptions, sir. I have no time to play your games! You can't stop me! No one can stop me from killing Richards! No one! Sir, I'm... I'm going to have to alert Corps Command. Authorization for your pass-through of this area does not show on today's log. I don't care what you do! It won't matter anyway! I'll be gone! Nick stares at his scope. In seconds, the tiny blip has evaporated. Reaching up, he rewinds the tape and plays part of the verbal exchange between Vashaya and himself. Fate is unpredictable, for Sergeant Nick Perchek is a member of the fifth column inside the Dominion and Lipton's contact, because he is on duty at this distant checkpoint on this particular day. The course of the war is about to alter forever. It won't matter anyway, I'll be gone! I've got to get this information to Lipton on Cygnus 3, but I can't risk a transmission until Nightwatch. Please, don't let it be too late. Commander Stephen Richards has been called to Cartone. Startling intelligence information has been uncovered. Nice to see you again, Commander. Oh, Sergeant Baton, I'd like you to meet Lieutenant Lipton. Pleased to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, too, Baton. So what's this information that's so sensitive it can't be transmitted to mission control, even on full scramble? Don't ask me, Commander. I build towers, remember? The intelligence work belongs to Bunker Room 1, and my orders are to escort you there on the double. Right this way, gentlemen. By the way, Lieutenant, that fifth column group of yours was great news. Thanks, Sergeant. I hope we made a small difference every once in a while. Our Lipton's being too modest. They've made a big difference. They warned us of Vishaya's attack on the Opergians and of the assault on Ventress water supply a while back. Here we are, sir. Bunker room one. Uh, Baton, all I see are solid rock walls. <laughs> That's what they all say. Just pull that lever, sir. Very impressive, Sergeant. One final security check ahead, sir. The double helix area. Follow me, gentlemen. Did he say double helix? Stand on the metal plates, please. This is the genetic scan, isn't it? That's right, sir. You see, Lipton, each person's cellular genetic code is like a fingerprint. Only this fingerprint is tamper-proof. Index fingers on the lighted panel, please. Reading dominant and recessive genetic configuration for two subjects. Scanning complete. Welcome to Bunker Room 1, Commander Richards and Lieutenant Lipton. You may enter. Bunker Room 1, a beehive of intelligence-gathering devices, listening to the secrets of a galaxy. Welcome to Cartone, Commander. McCormick, how's your squadron attack training and surveillance work coming? We'll be ready when you need us, sir. Lieutenant Lipton, pleased to have you with us. Likewise, McCormick. Commander, I'll get right to the point. We've had the planet Vega under intensive surveillance. Data's been collected that, well, just doesn't make sense. Exactly what is so mysterious, Lieutenant? Take a look at this readout on the screen, sir. These are the geoseismic readings from Vega for the last 14 hours. Have these figures been verified? Commander, 
I can tell you that this data was also recorded at Corps Command recently. I've seen it myself. Dominion home world appears to be undergoing major crust and plate shifts. Readings all the way up to factor six. Well, okay, tremors, volcanic activity. But I still don't see the mystery. I'll advance the findings. What do you make of this conclusion, sir? After seismic shifts of major consequence, the planet appears to repair itself? Impossible. A planet that repairs itself? Even more strange, Commander. The high-energy force field around Vega has been steadily diminishing. This was the level 12 hours ago recorded by our space probe. And this is the level right now. Explanation, Lipton? None, sir. I hate to say this, but there's still more, Commander. Actually, this is the real reason you were called a carton. Take a look. Vita scans of the planet Vega, capable of recording emissions of any life form, produce no readings at all. Nothing. What are you saying, McCormick? The life forms on that planet are not being picked up by our scanners. That can only mean one thing, Commander do not represent life form as we know it. General Derek arrives at home world seeking personal vengeance. Where is everyone, Igrithor? There was no one at the landing area. Security seems to have disappeared. Your concern is noted, General. But my security measures are none of your business. Why are you here? Ordinarily, I would have made this decision myself. But since you sent Vashaya to my sector, I felt I must put my case to you personally. What? What was that? Pay no attention. That's an order, General. Get to the point quickly. You have all my reports, Igrithor. You are aware that Vashaya has been incompetent, unable to produce results, and he's grown unstable, maybe going out of his mind. What is it you want? What I want, Igrithor, is permission to eliminate the bounty hunter. Igrithor, are you listening to me? Perhaps I should see the Consul of the Seven if you are too busy. Unnecessary, General. I speak for the Council and the leader. Are you all right, Igrithor? You sound different. Tired. Go! Leave me! Take your petty human vengeance any way you choose. I do not have the time. Be gone! Suddenly, the ash gray Vega planet convulses violently. Before Derek's terrified eyes, the walls around her crack and split into hundreds of fine spidery tracings. Then they begin to disintegrate. What's happening, Igrithor? Oh, help me! Somebody help me! The floor under Derek buckles and shifts, tearing a gaping hole in the surface. One moment, the general balances on the edge of an inferno. Then she's gone, swallowed up forever as tons of white-hot lava explode from the core of the planet in liquid fingers of death. Without warning, something extraordinary begins to happen. The Vega world appears to heal itself to cool, to repair the awful damage. Finally, not yet. It's too soon. More time. I must have more time. Returning to Cygnus III from Carton, Commander Richards learns that Philip's diary has finally been decoded. I've given orders that we're not to be disturbed. I need your best thinking. Please speculate freely on the diary's contents. 
The secret we're looking for could be right in front of us. Beta helped with the decoding process, and he's plugged into the cryptograph, ready to assist. A most fascinating code, based on cuneiform, space law, and a famous 21st century chess game. Not now, Beta. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as I see it, Philip's diary is actually two separate documents. That's correct, Commander. Part one includes the Dominion military intelligence he'd uncovered. Part two is what interests me, General. Philip seems to be searching for Dominion's essential mystery, its origin. And emerald tree is mentioned, the same words my parents used in the holograph. True, Steve, but there's no logical thought progression that I can follow. It's almost a code within a code. Not exactly, Christina. The human brain cannot instantly match the relationship of seemingly unrelated data. However, my higher functions have pinpointed some interesting probabilities. And were you going to share those probabilities with us, Beta? Why, certainly, Christina. To begin with, there are 42 references to a Professor Max Schumann. Didn't you know him, Father? Not very well. Odd fellow, if I remember correctly. Always talking about a utopia. 39 references to the QR-23 planet, and 56 references to the Emerald Tree Project. Then there are a number of other references. To... For five hours, the diary is probed for meaning. Two items recur, Emerald Tree Project and the name Professor Max Schumann, a former teacher on Centiga. He was a close friend of both Carl Phillips and Richard's parents. When the Dominion attacked the rebel outpost, he escaped. Opposed to war and violence in any form, he and his followers colonized the primitive planet QR-23 on the fringe of the galaxy. General, the connection is clear. Professor Max Schumann is the only person still alive who might know what my parents' Emerald Tree project was all about. I must go to QR-23 and talk with him. All right, Steve. Permission granted. But do it quickly, or it may be too late. Sixteen hundred hours on Cygnus III. After his evening meal, Richards returns to his quarters. Who's there? Hello, Richards. The Shire. I've come to kill you, Richards. And there's no way you can escape. <laughs> An urgent message for Lieutenant Lipton from inside the Dominion flashes across the vast emptiness of space in ancient Morse code. At mission control, the message is received and decoded. Emergency. Vishaya on way to Cygnus 3 to kill Commander Richards. Information received at 10 hundred hours today, Dominion time. Priority red dispatch. 10 hundred hours? Communications. Contact General Zane. Tell him I'm on my way to the commander's quarters and request security backup. Behind a locked door, Vashaya points his laser pistol at Richards. I'm going to kill you, Richards. Give it up, Vashaya. I'm dying, Richards. And you're going to die with me. You're crazy. Perhaps I am. But it's because of you, Richards. You did this to me when you sent me to Satar, and now you're going to pay. You need medical attention, Vashaya. You're barely able to stand. I've waited a long time for this moment. Nothing will stop. No. What's happening? My vision, clouding over. I can't see. Commander, are you in there? Open the door! Commander Richards, can you hear me? Stand back! I'm going to blast the lock! Commander, Commander Richards! It's all right, Lipton. I just need a few minutes to pull myself together. Is Vishaya... Yes, he's dead. He had me cold, Lipton. But the shots missed me when he collapsed and died. It was that close. Then it's finally over, sir. Yes. 
the last chapter in a long and twisted story. QR-23, a gentle, primitive planet on the rim of the galaxy. It's a forgotten place of strategic importance to neither side in the Dominion conflict. Locked in a time warp from another age, it turns slowly on its axis in a sea of stars. In a mud and straw hut facing the Sea of Ellipsis, Professor Max Schumann proposes a toast. We'll drink to my good friends, your father, your mother, and Carl Phillips. Hmm, delicious. What is it? Made from the wild grapes of the Cobra vine. We do not live an entirely deprived existence, Stephen. Professor, you've read Phillips's diary? I have. What do you want to know? What was the Emerald Tree Project? Ah, Emerald Tree. A vision of paradise or a nightmare. Can you explain, sir? On Centiga, Phillips, your parents, and I used to dine together once a week. We would sit and talk for hours about our work. Anything new on those propulsion boosters, Robert? We're making progress, Phillips. Slow, but sure. I wish our unofficial project was going as well as the boosters, Carl, dear. Max, where's the food? We're starved. Patience, patience, Patricia. Epicurean delights take time. You're not still fooling around with that energy theory, are you? You two are playing with disaster. We don't agree with you, Max. Our energy device would be a miracle worker. Wait a minute. What's all this about an energy device? Go on, Patricia. I can't stop you. Tell Carl about your emerald tree. Well, in a nutshell, Robert and I have a theory. Just a theory at this point. As you know, technology already exists enabling us to move matter, beaming objects from one location to another. Essentially, matter reverts to energy, then back to the identical form of matter again. With me so far? More or less. What are you getting at? Hypothesis. Why couldn't there be a machine that could reduce matter back to pure energy? Then instead of just reforming it the way it was, transform it, change it, make it reappear in a new or better form. But where does Emerald Tree fit in? Oh, that's Max's name for our energy theory. I used the example of the ordinary leaves of a tree being transformed into sparkling emeralds. A pretty image, don't you think? Really transformed? Or would the new form be just an illusion? And would the transformation be permanent? Good questions. We haven't gotten that far into the theory as yet. Max, as usual, sees sinister connotations in what we're proposing. It could produce chaos. In the wrong hands, it would completely upset the natural balance. But it could do remarkable good, Max. Anyone or anything damaged or flawed could be repaired, transformed, whole and better than before. But according to whose standards? Forming matter at will from pure energy would give the operator the power of creation. The ethical questions are staggering. No, it's a monstrous evil, and I, for one, am glad the technology doesn't exist. And I wish you two would just let the whole area alone. I don't understand. I'm still confused, Professor. Emerald Tree was just an energy theory? Reforming matter out of pure energy? Then how does the Emerald Tree project lead us to the secret my parents told me about? Like most answers, Stephen, they usually just produce more questions. I've told you all I know about your parents' work. Professor, before they were killed, my parents made the connection between their work on Emerald Tree and the secret that can destroy Dominion. Now, it's clear from his diary that Phillips was looking for the same thing before he died. Come back with me to Cygnus Three, Professor, and help the rebels find that connection. I cannot, Stephen. I can't understand your world. It frightens me. Perhaps when destruction and killing ceases, perhaps then there will be a place for someone like me. Farewell, Stephen. And God speed.
For 36 hours, Richards maintains radio silence. Using hyperspace, he races past the third stellar ridge, through the Aries constellation, and finally reduces speed around the Horn of Taurus. Approaching Cygnus 3, he makes contact with Mission Control. This is Commander Richards on Special Frequency X-19. Come in, Mission Control. Do you read, Mission Control? This is General Zane. What is your situation, Steve? Well, QR-23 provided some of the answers, General, but not all. However, I'm convinced we're on the right track. Come to Mission Control as soon as you land, Steve. We're in final preparations for the Cartone assault on Vega. We must strike soon. Roger, General. On my way. Richard's out. The secret's so close. I can sense it. Almost touch it. It's all connected. The Vega findings, our experiences on Luna One, the diary, and my parents' energy theory. I'm not exactly sure how, but in some way, Dominion is the Emerald Tree. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in episode 13, The Secret. Rebel Mission Control, the 11th hour. Final preparation for the all-out assault on Vega is underway. When suddenly, without warning... Intruder spacecraft entering Sector 4, Grid Area 8, sir. Identity type, Simmons? It's a Dominion command ship. Sound General Quarters, Code Red. Attention, this is not a drill. Condition, Code Red. All pilots to your fighters. Ground personnel to your support positions. Repeat, this is not a drill. This is General Zane. Come in, Cartone. Cartone, standing by. Launch your fighters, McCormick. Rendezvous with Richard's group. We're under attack. Code red. Understood. Commencing launch sequence. On the dark side of Cartone, a large camouflage nest of boulders silently splits open. The grid struts of a launch tower thrust their way into the Cartone darkness. Final countdown. Three, two, one. Launching. The rebel forces fan out, heading for the Dominion command ship. But an unusual twist of fate awaits them. General, the Dominion command ship has stopped. It's lowering all protective shields. Beta, infrared scan the command ship from your vantage point. What's going on? Scanning infrared now, General. All shields withdrawn. Bay area doors open. Entire ship exposed to our lasers. Steve, we're being hailed over the emergency comm link. I'll patch it through to all squadrons, sir. Dominion command ship to rebel forces. We come in peace and friendship. All defensive shields have been lowered. Identify yourself. Sergeant Nick Perchek of the fifth column. We have taken full control of this ship. Lipton, can you verify voice ID? Sounds like Perchek, sir. Ask him for today's code word, Simmons. Request today's code word, Sergeant. Roger. Code words. Emerald Tree. It's Nick, all right. This is General Zane. Explain your present situation, Sergeant. Former commanding officer, General Vera Derrick, missing and presumed dead on Vega after a Factor 7 geoseismic event there. We have confirmation of that event, Sergeant. Go on. The remains of Derek's humanoid were found in a compost masher on board the command ship. And Vishaya? Well, you already know about him. Loss of three commanding officers provided enough confusion to allow the fifth column to take control of the ship. Is your group able to maintain command? Affirmative, General. And we're offering the full firepower of a Dominion war cruiser for the rebel assault on Vega. Steve, you've heard all this? I copy every beautiful word, General. All attack fighters return to base, but maintain full alert status. Sergeant Pritchett. Yes, General. 
take your ship into standard orbit around Cygnus 3. Beam down as soon as possible for final briefing. Our assault begins in a few hours. Inside the trembling caverns of Dominion home world, a farewell takes place. What do you want, Kree? Master, the rebel assault on Vega will begin in a few hours. I humbly petition to remain and assist you, Master. Impossible, Krieg. I cannot afford to sustain your image any longer. You have served me well. One of my best creations. I... I do not wish to leave, Master. I've grown comfortable in your world of dominion. You are required to give back the energy that gave you life. I need it. Now, Krieg. Now. Do not destroy me, Master. You need me to intervene, to change the odds, to shift power and momentum. I will do your bidding in all things, Master. I feel your strength, Creed. The rebels will come, and I will be ready with one final. Vega's energy field continues to lose power. Finally, the listening probe left behind on Luna 1 breaks through. Lieutenant McCormick sits spellbound on Cartone as a tortured voice speaks to him from the dead. Captain Thomas Dwyer, Brewer Expedition, Luna 1. How to begin? There is something on this godforsaken moon, something terrifying, so real, yet not there at all. It torments, attacks, tortures, reduces us to whimpering slaves, begging to be spared. No defense, no escape, a different form each time. It toys with us probes and steals our thoughts. We do its bidding. We are nothing. Nothing. What's happening? Why are we losing the transmission? Sorry, sir. The probe switched to quadrant two. It's automatic. Covers Luna in four segments, sir. Be back to us in about ten minutes. Contact General Zane. Play back this section for him and patch them in for the next transmission. Yes, sir. The probe resumes transmitting. There is a captive audience on both Cygnus 3 and Cartone, straining to catch every word. We know now what it is, but the knowledge comes too late for us. I feel its power, an energy level beyond measuring. The visible forms disappear, but it's still here. Holding us, using us, killing our will. Don't come unless you can destroy. Ten more agonizing minutes, then the captain's final words are heard. All dead. I am the last. I had to survive to tell the story. Horrible. Unspeakable terror and power. And now you know the secret of this thing. It must be destroyed or Earth is doomed. The entire galaxy is doomed. The rebel leaders are meeting one last time to try to make the connection between Emerald Tree, the Secret, and the Dominion. For whatever reason, Dominion's power is at a low point. You can see evidence of it all over the galaxy. We took advantage of it when we seized the command ship. We've got to put all these clues together. 
a new way of looking at the evidence is needed. Duchess? There does seem to be a common thread running through all that's happened, General. The controlled manipulation of a powerful energy source, probably on Vega. And with that energy presence, terrifying illusions usually occur. Illusions? Wait a minute. Appearance and disappearance. Damage, then repair and healing. It's Emerald Tree. You mean the Dominion has a machine? Like your parents envisioned? A device capable of transforming pure energy into anything it chooses? Of course. Then it could create warships, whole armies, a show of force devastating enough to conquer and enslave a galaxy. If you were convinced it was real. Max Schumann was right. In the wrong hands, the Emerald Tree power has become a monstrous evil. And the proof is on the Dwyer tapes. It was there all along. Beta, cue up the captain's log to replay only the references to control or manipulation of the expedition members. Queuing up now. Editing. First reference. It torments, attacks, tortures, reduces us to whimpering slaves begging to be spared. It toys with us probes and steals our thoughts. We do its bidding. Holding us, using us, killing our will. Dominion must have used this energy source from the beginning, creating monsters, spacecraft, anything they needed to instill terror. We also have been doing its bidding. The line between reality and illusion was erased. How much of this war hasn't even been real? But I don't completely understand. Where does the Brewer expedition fit in? Logically, Sergeant, they were Dominion's guinea pigs, tested and probed to learn about the inhabitants of this galaxy before they attacked. To destroy Dominion, first you must destroy... destroy the energy source responsible for its power and control. That's the secret. If it is, then somehow we've got to get inside, find the energy source, destroy it and the device that controls it. But the force field around Vega, it's still deadly. That's no illusion. Too many have died trying to get through it. Perhaps I might have a solution. But you humans have neglected to consider a most important variable. Either the power source on Vega is diminishing simply because it's being used up, or Dominion's weakness is another illusion, luring us into a trap, a trap with no escape. The Rebel Strike proceeds on schedule. Beta's plan is to break through the energy field in a daring maneuver. One miscalculation and instant death. Commander Richards and Lieutenant Lipton in Protojet 1. Come in, command ship. Are you in position? Affirmative, Steve. The Duchess and I are orbiting outside the Vega atmosphere. McCormick's assault team is standing by. Launch the two drones. We'll fire boosters when we see them. Counting down. Three, two, one. Launch. From the port side of the command ship, two automated pilotless fighters emerge and are guided toward the Vega energy field. I have a visual on the drones, Commander. Protojet 1 to Protojet 2, ready to fire attitude correction boosters. Three-second burn, Christina. We'll tailgate each drone as closely as possible. Roger. Boosters ready on Protojet 2. Fire. Approaching energy field. Timing critical, Commander. No margin for error. Okay, everybody, hang on. This is going to be one wild ride. Running interference, the drones hit the energy force field. Ready hyperspace. Fire! Before the hole in the energy field can close, the two rebel protojets slip into the Vega atmosphere in a perfectly timed drafting maneuver. All right! Beta, you're terrific! Yes, I did do rather well, didn't I? Commander, what's happening? We're caught in some kind of giant vortex. Gyro's out of control. 
Stabilizer won't work. Spinning. G-forces. Crushing. I can't breathe. Like miniature tops spun by a giant hand in space, the protojets spiral down at a heart-stopping pace. They will incinerate if speed is not reduced. Pulling apart! Can't stop! <laughs> you still don't understand, do you? This game is mine. Is everyone all right? Christina? Okay here, Steve. Who or what was that? I don't know. Lipton, contact the command ship. Lieutenant Lipton to General Zane. Do you read, sir? I read you, Lipton. What's going on? Why are you holding position? Holding position? We were attacked. Tumbled and pitched in every direction, General. Not according to our readings. Your positions have remained unchanged since penetrating the force field. Not another illusion. You mean nothing happened to us at all? The landing party is on the Vega surface. The shapes of mountains, rivers, trees, changing and disintegrating before our eyes. Like watching a time exposure image. Whoever or whatever is holding these things together isn't doing such a great job anymore. Commander, this whole planet's shifting under our feet. Beta, have you pinpointed the source of the energy readings? Coming from that opening in those rocks, Commander. Definitely underground. All right, stay together. Let's go. Richard's group carefully picks their way through the crumbling passages inside Dominion Homeworld. Dust and debris choke the corridors. Commander, the energy source is behind this door. Laser pistols ready. We're going in. Empty. I don't see anything, but I sure do feel something. I feel it too. We know you're here. Rebel forces surround the planet. You have no chance to... <laughs> Your species continues to provide amusement. I will assume form. Don't move. Stay where you are. Your pitiful weapons are useless against me. Touch me and you die. Who are you? I am known as Igrathor. Where is the leader and the council of the seven? They are me, and I am them. Only I exist. I am Dominion. True or not, you're not doing it alone. Show us the source of your power, the machine that transforms energy into matter of your choosing. <laughs> How primitive. But then, limited intelligence was the reason I chose your galaxy for my game. There's no machine. The power comes from me. You? That's impossible. In your world, yes. Not in mine. Where is your world? In another galaxy. My kind ruled for millennia, creating whatever we wanted or needed from pure energy, from ourselves. We gave substance, and what we created gave us purpose. What happened to your world, Igrithor? Destroyed in an ion storm. My world and the source, a boundless fountain of pure energy to which we returned again and again continue the game of illusion. Why do you keep calling this a game? Your dominion creation destroyed whole planets, made slaves out of countless people. Your words have no meaning for my kind. Dominion is my purpose, my existence. Why Earth and its galaxy? After the destruction of my world, I wandered for thousands of your years, searching for the right time and place to undertake my greatest challenge. Here, I found what was needed. Here, I began, and I chose well. Human and alien alike were quick to pick sides. 
and give full substance to my final illusion. Commander, might I point out there's no longer a source for him to return to for more energy. He is using himself up. His power is coming to an end. If he is holding this planet together... I understand, Beta. Only moments left. Why didn't you just destroy us? We do not seek the ends of our creations. The game is to sustain and manipulate them until the last possible moment. Then return to the source to begin again. I will never begin again. Dominion's power will cease to exist. What gave you the right? In my world, there is no right or wrong. Only purpose no longer matters. I am no more. With no energy field left to stop them, the landing party escapes from Vega, and not a minute too soon, the entire rebel force watches the disintegration of Dominion home world. It's starting. Forces unnaturally held in check for years suddenly let go, and Vega explodes. Huge chunks of the planet break free. Hot gases from the interior hit the coldness of space and crystallize into a million splinters of light. Vega's core glows in its last brief struggle to survive. Then, nothing. It's over. Dominion's power is finally destroyed. This is not an end, my friends, but a beginning. We've been given a second chance, and we must not waste it. We'll call an immediate ceasefire and convene a council of equals to settle our remaining differences. Perhaps Professor Max Schumann will give us guidance for a better world this time, based on freedom and justice. New from old, order from chaos, peace from destruction, Emerald Tree, the way my parents thought it could be. That's the real secret of Dominion. I wonder, what are the probabilities that Igra Thor was the only one of his kind to survive the destruction of his world? Could there have been others? Interesting. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. Slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director, Dr. Maura Cassidy, and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority, ISA, watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. This week, the men and women of Star Lab become entangled in the adventure of the Egyptian necklace, an intergalactic detective story in the Sherlock Holmes tradition on 
alien worlds. British Museum freighter, Nile Delta, commanded by Captain Jack Lemus, is returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the priceless King Tut exhibit, sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier as part of an interplanetary cultural exchange program. Nile Delta to Starlab Control. This is Starlab. Go ahead, Nile Delta. Is that you, Jerry? Affirmative, Captain. Are you planning to dock at Star Lab on your way home? No, not this time. An ISA tanker came up from Cannabis 12 and refueled us on the other side of Saturn. No, I just wanted to say hello and invite you around for a visit if uh, you're ever in London. My wife's got quite a lovely sister she's trying to marry off. And I've got some 40-year-old brandy that'll lift you right out of your boots. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation, Captain. I'll take you up on it the first chance I get. I'll be looking for you. Nile Delta, clear. Star Lab, out. That alien ship's back again, Captain. 3,500 meters off the port bow. Have you tried to contact her? Uh, we tried, but she still doesn't respond. All right, let's have another look at her. Full magnification this time. Hey, she's a beauty, isn't she? All white and slim like that. Do you recognize any of the markings, Tony? Um, uh, wait a minute. What's that on the tail fin? The sun symbol. No, no, just below it. The blue and gold bird with its wings spread out. Isn't that the same? Hold as... on. She's dropping down a bit. Tony, she's been damaged. Top of the hull, amidships. There go the SOS flares. Let's get up alongside her and see if we can help. As the Nile Delta's navigator maneuvers the red and gray freighter into a side-by-side -side position with a damaged alien ship, Captain Lemus and first mate Tony Cargill put on bright blue pressure suits and enter the freighter's airlock. A moment later, an enclosed metal flex walkway slowly telescopes from the Nile Delta's airlock to an access hatch which has irised open in the hull of the fluorescent white alien spacecraft. You're very generous to give us your time and kindness. Well, hello. Who are you? My name is Piratep. I'm glad you didn't abandon us. Yours is the only vessel we've seen since the accident. When did it happen? Three days ago. And some of our mariners have been injured. Is there a healer aboard your vessel? Y yes, there is. And we have a complete medical facility as well. Then if you'll please follow me, we can begin transferring our injured to your ship. If you wish to remove your helmets, you'll be in no danger. We're oxygen breathers, too. Ooh, well, that's better, isn't it? Hi, it was getting a bit stuffy in there. This is Amontev. Which of you is Captain Lemus? Well, I am. A... How do you know my name? We know the names of everyone aboard the Nile Delta. We also know it carries the afterlife treasures and mummified body of Tutankhamun. Your ship isn't damaged at all, is it? No, it isn't. Don't look now, Captain. But I think we've been set up for a little of the old smash and grab. What the bloody hell do you want with the King Tut treasure? It only has value on Earth. It's worthless out here. We don't want the entire treasure, Captain. Only the beaded floral necklace. It's not mine to give you. And even if it were, I wouldn't. I have a rule against being overly charitable to anyone who makes a fool of me or my friends. Come on, Tony, let's get back to the ship. Please, Captain, don't force me to use this weapon. A weapon? A tiny little thing? Let's get out of here, Captain. I'm on tap. Stop them, Pirate. Oh. Oh. Tony! Tony!
to you. Get the sensation, the cool combination, chocolatey and mint. Drop peppermint patty. Cool the sensation, the perfect creation, chocolatey and mint. From Peter Paul. Cool as the snow falling light on the trees. Just take a bite for a cool minty freeze. Get New York, peppermint patty. And get the sensation. is returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasure of the Egyptian boy king, Tutankhamun. Midway between Earth and Saturn, a damaged alien spacecraft appears and fires SOS flares. Nile Delta Captain Jack Lemus and first mate Tony Cargill board the alien ship to offer assistance. But inside, they discover they've fallen into a trap set by the aliens who want a beaded floral necklace from the King Tut treasure. An hour later on Star Lab, Dr. Maura Cassidy and SET Captain John Graydon, not yet aware of the Nile Delta incident, enter the vestibule of Star Lab's visual media theater. How long has Buddy been in there? About six hours. Six hours? Was he watching the outtakes from Gravity's Rainbow? Oh, no, that was yesterday. Uh, Sunday, he sat through five old Stanley Kubrick films. And Monday, it was a Daffy Duck festival. Uh, what he's watching today is anybody's guess. Maybe he fell asleep. Well, I wish he'd sleep a little faster. We're going to be late. Hi, Maura. Hi, John. Buddy. Buddy, didn't your mother ever tell you that if you watched too many movies, your face would break out and you'd go blind? Very funny. Uh, I think you've got that mixed up with something else, Maura. I do? What? Uh, I'll tell you later. Uh, well, buddy, uh, what would you see today? The Guiding Light, All My Children, and Search for Tomorrow. They're television soap operas from the 60s and 70s. Soap operas? Why do they call them that? Were they musicals about people getting clean? <laughs> Not exactly, Maura. They were mostly about people getting dirty. <laughs> Dr. Cassidy, please contact the control bridge. Oh, we'll never make the lecture at this rate. Have they repaired the intercom terminal in the theater, buddy? Well, it was working this morning. Hmm. Be back in a minute. What did you think of those music tapes Ingrid brought back from Calibria? I was listening to one when I turned in last night. Uh, you know, the one with all the voices? The hymn to the vanished canal? Yeah. yeah, that's it. And I fell asleep while it was still running and I dreamed about kaleidoscope faces and stained glass animals all night. Incredible. Let's get up to the bridge. Something's happened to the Nile Delta. aboard the Nile Delta. The rest of my chaps were still knocked out, and the necklace and the aliens were gone. Is the necklace the only thing missing? Uh, we don't know yet. We're still checking the manifest. Have you notified the museum yet? I'm going to do that just as soon as... Stand by, Star Lab. Dr. Cassidy, our medical officer, Dr. Lomax, he's just come up from the cargo bay. He said the aliens opened the coffin, unwrapped the mummy down to the neck, and took a tissue sample from its face. A tissue sample? Is Dr. Lomax absolutely certain about that? He's positive, Dr. Cassidy, and he's holding up a little gold surgical instrument they dropped. We'll put it in a safe place and we'll analyze it when you get here. See you around midnight, Captain. 
Starlab out. Nile Delta, clear. Buddy, John, what do you think? Well, we've got about nine hours before the Nile Delta gets here. Let's go down to the library and pull the King Tut tapes out of the Egyptology section. Maybe we can turn up something. Why not? Meanwhile, at the Royal British Museum in London, Sir Dorian Bradford Gray, the museum's director, receives word of the Nile Delta incident. Fifteen minutes later, Sir Dorian reports the incident to British Prime Minister Lord Henry Gladstone Baggs. Within the hour, Lord Henry enters Buckingham Palace and conveys the news to Her Majesty, Queen Victoria III. And what about the aliens who perpetrated this awful crime, Lord Henry? Does the Ministry have any idea who they are? Um, I, I'm afraid we're still in the dark about that, Your Majesty. Hmm. Hand us the royal pen and ink, Lord Henry, and some royal stationery, too. This incident requires the services of England's most famous consulting detective. Agreed? Oh, yes, by all means, Your Majesty, by all means. Now, let's see. From Victoria Regina... The third. Yes, yes, you must. Do. Sonar T. Foom. Oh, without any shadow of a doubt. My dear Mr. Foom, a matter of some urgency has arisen, yes. which Pleasure, requires your immediate and undivided attention. Oh, Britannia. Meanwhile, in the heart of London's West End, Sonar T. Foom and his associate, Dr. McGuffin Drone, are spending a quiet afternoon in their rooms at 221B Pennybaker Street. say something, Drone? I really must protest, Foom. That instrument of yours had my London Gazette vibrating so rapidly, I could scarcely read today's news. Oh, please forgive me, Drone, but you know how restless I am when there's nothing afoot to test my keen powers of observation and deduction. And music does, after all, soothe the savage beast. Well, if it's savage beasts you're interested in soothing, perhaps you should consider taking up residence at the zoo. Careful, Drone. I think you're skating on rather thin ice with that one. Just a moment. Do my ears deceive me, or is that Mrs. Hudson's cat-like tread upon the stair? Yes, that's Mrs. Hudson, all right. No question about it. Come in, Mrs. Hudson. Why, Mr. Foom, how on earth did you know it was me? Elementary, my dear Mrs. Hudson. There are just the three of us in the entire house. The doors and windows are latched from the inside. Dr. Drone and myself are, as you can plainly see, here in this room, which left only you, Mrs. Hudson, unaccounted for. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Foam, you never cease to amaze me. I also perceive an envelope between the thumb and forefinger of your right hand, Mrs. Hudson. White, six inches square, addressed to me in violet ink. Oh, my, yes, I nearly forgot. It just arrived. May I have the envelope, please? Thank you. Hmm... A message from none other than Her Royal Majesty. You don't say. Her Royal Majesty. How did you know that, Foom? The return address, my dear drone. I recognize the royal zip code. Your powers of observation are absolutely uncanny, Foom. Yes. And now... Egad, drone. The Nile Delta's been set upon by alien beings, and King Tutankhamun's floral necklace has been purloined. 
Her Majesty requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. Mrs. Hudson, call the airfield and tell Smattering to prepare the Bellerophon. Right away, Mr. Foam. Let's get our equipment sorted out, Drone. The game is afoot and a new adventure is at hand. Alien Worlds will continue. Ooh, baby, I'm confessing, this man's got a fickle way. Now, maybe you won't like it much, but to explain, I gotta say. Sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. I'm a joy got nuts, now it's don't. I'm a joy got chocolate, Continues. The Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta is returning to Earth from Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasures of Tutankhamun sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier for exhibition. Midway between Earth and Saturn, the freighter is boarded by aliens who steal the King Tut floral necklace and take a tissue sample from the face of the boy king's mummy. When news of the Nile Delta incident reaches Queen Victoria III, she quickly notifies consulting detective Sonar T. Foom. Let's get our equipment sorted out, Drone. Her Majesty respectfully requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. At the Pennybaker Street tube station, Foom and Drone board an urban link train that carries them to a small spaceport near Croydon. Crossing the field to launch pad six, they board Foom's powerful multi-atmosphere cruiser, the Bellerophon, England's most sophisticated privately owned spacecraft. Thirty seconds later, the Bellerophon jets out over the gray waters of the English Channel, banks up into a glacier-like mass of white clouds, and rockets away towards Starland. finishes replacing the AE-35 module, huh? Will do, Dr. Cassidy. See you later. Let's see. Nine o'clock. Well, time to feed my fish. Hi, Winston. Hi, Emmett. Hi, Orpheus. Dr. Cassidy. Hi, Dorothy. Yes, Dorothy, what is it? I have a transmission coming through from ISA headquarters. It's Commissioner White. I'll take it here, patch him through. Mara, I just received a transmission from the British Prime Minister. Sonar T. Foom is on his way up to help with the Nile Delta investigation. Good. I've always wanted to meet that man. When did he leave? All oh, about an hour ago. He should be docking in a few minutes. He and his partner officially represent the British government in this case, Mara, so give them all the help you can. All right, Commissioner, I'll keep you posted. Star Lab out. Good evening, Star Lab. This is the Bellerophon. Sonar T. Foom at the controls. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Bellerophon. What is Star Lab's rotational profile? Mm, 18 per minute on a variable axis of 0 0.3 degrees, non-correctable. Thank you so much. At our present rate of speed...
speed and your present rate of rotation, I calculate our docking orbit insertion coordinates will be 208 degrees at subsector 671. Mm, uh, hold on a minute. That's right. Did you calculate that in your head? Of course. That's amazing. Uh, nothing to it, really. Now, what do you have in the way of empty docking bays? Uh, number 14. Thank you so much. And will you please inform Dr. Cassidy that we'll be there in one minute, 13 seconds. <laughs> will do. Starlab, out. Jerry, have Polly bring them to my quarters as soon as they dock, huh? Okay, Mara. Well, you two look more red-eyed than usual. Where have you been? We went back to the library after dinner and ran the King Tut tapes again. Did you come up with anything? Yeah. You know that blue and gold bird symbol Captain Lemus described? Uh, the one on the tail fin of the alien ship? Mm hmm We found one just like it on King Tut's ecclesiastical chair. Oh, what does the bird represent? Well, it's actually a sacred vulture, and it represents the goddess Nekebet, a guardian of Upper Egypt and protectors of childbirth. When Captain Lemus gets here, we should run his visual scanner tapes of the alien ship against the library tapes to see if the symbols match. And if they do? If they do, we've concocted a pretty bizarre theory to explain why. I'm listening. Well, if the symbols match, and this is strictly hypothetical now, if they match, then maybe the aliens aren't aliens after all. Maybe they're Egyptians. Oh, come on, you two. Modern Egypt isn't capable of the kind of technology Captain Lee must describe. That's the bizarre part of the theory, Mora. We're not talking about modern Egypt. We're talking about ancient Egypt. Good evening, Dr. Cassidy. Mr. Foam. Dr. Drone, welcome to Starlight. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Cassidy. Uh, Mara, please. Uh, and uh, who are these gentlemen, Mora? Space Exploration Team Captains John Grayton and Buddy Griff. Oh, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I believe you were discussing the possibility that the aliens who boarded the Nile Delta might in fact be ancient Egyptians. Something like that, Doctor. It's a theory Buddy and John dreamed up. Hmm. I think we're going to get on very well indeed, gentlemen. Dr. Drone and myself were discussing a similar hypothesis not more than 15 minutes ago. You were? Congratulations, Captain Green. Uh, thank you, Captain Griff. Uh, Mr. Foom, with all due respect to you and Dr. Drone, I find it hard to believe that we're dealing with 3,300-year-old Egyptians. Not 3,300-year-old Egyptians, Mora, but rather the descendants of the high priests and priestesses who departed the earth following Tutankhamun's death. Departed the earth? How? The King Tut library tapes were full of references to skyships, Mora. Tell me, gentlemen, did your theory arise from Captain Lima's description of the Nekhebit symbol on the tail fin of the alien ship? That and the way the aliens were dressed. Yes. Captain Lemus conveyed those very same descriptions to the museum. Fascinating, isn't it? All right. Suppose these aliens are what you think they are. That still doesn't explain the theft of the necklace or why they took a tissue sample from the mummy. The necklace is a puzzlement, Mora, but the tissue specimen isn't. It has long been our contention that the Egyptian kings were preserved for only one reason, so that in future their tissue could be rejuvenated for the purpose of monocellular replication. Cloning. You mean you actually believe these aliens intend to duplicate Tutankhamun? Ancient Egyptian religion was completely devoted to the concept of life after death, Mora. Most scholars and historians still maintain that the Egyptian afterlife was simply an abstract journey through an equally abstract underworld. Dr. Drone and myself think otherwise. We believe the Egyptian underworld was a metaphor to describe the very real fact of physical immortality. Thou art standing before Ra, who cometh from the east. His duration of life is infinite. His limit of life is everlastingness. Become one with Ra, 
and be received into the land of eternal triumph. A verse from the Papyrus of Ani, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, telling of a journey into the regions of life everlasting, immortality, the most beautiful and mysterious of all, alien worlds. One of the adventure of the Egyptian necklace was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Philip Clark, John Abbott, Joe Baker, John Galt, Carol Bilger, and Nora Denny. Associate producer Ron Thompson, music director Tom Rounds, engineer Stu Jacobs, assistants to the producer. Roger Brossi and Jim Cook, technical consultant Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen, and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of the adventure of the Egyptian necklace from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury chocolate bars. Hope you have enjoyed Alien Worlds. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury chocolate bars presents Alien Worlds. Slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Starlab. Here, Starlab Research Director Maura Cassidy and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. Last week's episode began when Captain Jack Lemus, commanding the Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta, notified Starlab that he was returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasures of Tutankhamun, sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier, as part of a cultural exchange program. Midway between Earth and Saturn, the freighter is boarded by aliens who steal the King Tut floral necklace and take a tissue sample from the face of the boy king's mummy. A tissue sample? Is Dr. Lomax absolutely certain about that? He's positive, Dr. Cassidy, and he's holding up a little gold surgical instrument they dropped. When news of the Nile Delta incident reaches Queen Victoria III, she notifies England's most famous consulting detective, Sonar T. Foom. Her Majesty requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. Meanwhile, on Star Lab, SET captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff research the Egyptology section of Star Lab's library. Did you come up with anything? Yeah, you know that blue and gold bird symbol Captain Lemus has described? Uh, the one on the tail fin of the alien ship? Mm hmm We found one just like it on King Tut's ecclesiastical chair. When Captain Lemus gets here, we should run his visual scanner tapes of the alien ship against the library tapes to see if the symbols match. And if they do? If they match, then maybe the aliens aren't aliens after all. Maybe they're Egyptians. A few minutes later, Sonar T. Foom and his associate Dr. McGuffin Drone arrive at Star Lab, and when Mora tells them about John and Buddy's theory... Hmm. 
I think we're going to get on very well indeed, gentlemen. Dr. Drone and myself were discussing a similar hypothesis not more than 15 minutes ago. All right, suppose these aliens are what you think they are. That still doesn't explain the theft of the necklace or why they took a tissue sample from the mummy. The necklace is a puzzlement, Mora, but the tissue specimen isn't. It has long been our contention that the Egyptian kings were preserved for only one reason, so that in future their tissue could be rejuvenated for the purpose of monocellular replication. Cloning. And now, the conclusion of the adventure of the Egyptian necklace, an interplanetary detective story in the Sherlock Holmes tradition on Alien Worlds. We ran the Egyptology tapes all the way back to the first dynasty, but we couldn't find a connection with any other civilization. A lot of theories, but nothing definite. What sort of theories? Well, some historians think dynastic Egypt may have evolved from ancient Samaria because of the similarity of their religious deities and astrological calendar. And a few renegade scholars even hypothesized that the Egyptians were the survivors of Atlantis. Look, before we get carried away by all these theories, I'd like to know one thing. Aside from religious deities and sky ships, did these civilizations share a common philosophy about where they came from? Yes, Mora, they did. They all believed they were the children of highly evolved beings who originally came down from the stars. The Limehouse Express to start out control. The Limehouse Express? Where do people come up with these names? <laughs> who knows? Uh, this is Starlap. Go ahead, Limehouse Express. Good evening. It's Jerry, isn't it? That's right. Who are you? What's your position? My position is that I never state my position. What's the problem, Limehouse Express? Uh, no problem, Dr. Cassidy. Now, if you don't mind, I wish to speak to Mr. Foom. Does he know you? Oh, my, yes. He knows me very well indeed. I'm Professor Moriarty. Alien Worlds will continue. Uh, pardon me. Isn't that a Cadbury chocolate bar? I've never tried one. Oh, that's too bad. Do you mind if I have a teensy piece? Hey. You took my bar. I'll just take a little bit. It was for my wife and me. Oh, she'll love it. See, this is great. You know you can get carried away with this stuff? Yes, I've noticed. Oh, come on. It's a big bar. It's getting smaller. When people get a taste of a big, thick Cadbury chocolate bar, they get very carried away. Because only a Cadbury bar is so rich, so creamy, so Cadbury. And with the big size Cadbury chocolate bar, you get a big choice. Cadbury fruit and nut, Cadbury almond, Cadbury caramello, and of course the big favorite, Cadbury milk chocolate. So remember, when you get your Cadbury, be careful. Because with Cadbury, people can get very carried away. Uh, can I have my Cadbury back now? Your Cadbury? Oh, well, I guess I got carried away. You'll get carried away with Cadbury. Alien Worlds continues. England's most famous consulting detective, Sonar T. Foom, and his associate, Dr. MacGuffin Drone, arrive at Star Lab to investigate the theft of the King Tut floral necklace from the Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta. Half an hour later, Starlab Control receives a transmission from the Limehouse Express, a mysterious spacecraft that refuses to give its position. Have you tried to locate him with a tracer beacon? He's neutralizing our tracer beacon with a scrambler beam that he's transmitting along with his radio signal. 
He's too far away for the scanners to pick him up. Very clever, Moriarty. Very clever indeed. <laughs> Nearly as clever as you, eh, Foom? Well, I wouldn't go quite that far, Drone. No, no, I, I suppose not. Open B channel, Jerry. Go ahead, Mr. Foom. So, Professor Moriarty, we meet again. Ah, my dear Foom, it's so good to hear your voice. Interplanetary crime is so boring without an adversary of your caliber. What exactly is on your criminal mind? I'm in the mood for a bit of cat and mouse with you, Foom. So I thought it might interest you to know that the Tutankhamun necklace is in my possession. And the aliens who took it are being held aboard my ship. You mean the Egyptians who took it, don't you, Moriarty? Very good, Foom. Very good indeed. Well, I see by the old atomic clock on the wall that we've run out of time. I do, however, want to leave you with these inspiring words. Catch me, if you can. Limehouse Express, out. <laughs> Limehouse Express, indeed. Why, does that name mean something? Moriarty's great-great-grandfather was the most cunning criminal genius of his time. His headquarters were somewhere in the Limehouse section of London. And like his great-great-grandson spacecraft, the location of the old professor's headquarters was a constant source of mystery. If the Egyptians are working for Moriarty, why is he holding them prisoner? It just doesn't make sense. I think it's safe to assume that they were cooperating with Moriarty rather than working for him. It's obvious now that he was using them to get the necklace for himself. Oh, and we're right back at the beginning, aren't we? The beginning? Of course. Mora, you're positively inspirational. I am? Indeed you are. Drone, I think it's time we contacted the museum and had a chat with Sir Dorian. Something tells me he knows more about the origins of this case than he thinks he does. Meanwhile, near Mars, the Limehouse Express, a huge metallic gray flying wing, moves into a parking orbit between the Martian moons of Deimos and Phobos. Imprisoned in a storage compartment near the flying wing's hangar bay are Piratep and Amentef, the two extraterrestrial Egyptians responsible for the theft of the necklace. It was foolish and undignified, Amantef. The two of us sitting in Sir Dorian's office, wearing those absurd Earth costumes, trying to deceive him the way the professor eventually deceived us. Perhaps we can still redeem ourselves. It is apparent from the way the professor talks about this man, Foom, that they are deadly enemies. If we could reach Star Lab and explain to Foom why we need the necklace, he might be sympathetic. But we'll never reach the hangar bay without a weapon. We have a weapon, Piratim. A photon pistol. I hid it in my boot as our ship was being taken aboard. Then you knew the professor was manipulating us. He's coming, Amantef. Hide the pistol. Well, how are the children of the sun this evening? Why have you brought the necklace here? I'll be taking it to Anshar in a few hours, and I thought perhaps you'd like to have one last look at it. Be very careful with it, won't you, my dear? Montez, there's only one guard in the corridor. All right. What is it? Who are you? Take the necklace into the ship. I'll open the launch doors. Hurry! I'm on test! The door! 
guards are coming. Take the necklace to stop it. Here I can. Stop him, you fools! He has the necklace! Meanwhile, on Star Lab, Sonar Chief Foom and Dr. McGuffin Drone sit in a conference room on G level, analyzing a video image Sir Dorian has transmitted from the museum's employee index terminal. Drone, there's something rather curious about this picture of Wilhelmina Hammersmith. Look closely at the eyes. What's your professional opinion? Well, the left eye is artificial. Now, Look at the ring finger on the left hand. Oh, here, let me magnify it. What do you see? A deep circular impression, as if a ring had been removed. A platinum serpent's ring, perhaps? Great Scott. Great Scott indeed, my dear drone. This is not a 70-year-old Egyptologist named Wilhelmina Hammersmith. This is none other than Professor Moriarty himself. What an extraordinary masquerade. Yes. Wearing this disguise, Moriarty appears at the museum and presents false credentials. Impressed with these documents, Sir Dorian gives Moriarty a post in the Egyptian antiquities section. And it is here that he learns the highly confidential facts of the Nile Delta's Thanatos schedule. Didn't Sir Dorian say that this Hammersmith woman was in his office when the Egyptian couple was there trying to buy the necklace? Yes, and two days later, Wilhelmina Hammersmith Moriarty resigns and the Egyptian couple are never seen again. Now, let me see. The two Egyptians who boarded the Nile Delta are obviously the same two who were in Sir Dorian's office. When they leave the museum, Moriarty follows them. Alien Worlds will continue. This woman's sorry For keeping you guessing You never know what I'll do That's why I'm here confessing it's because sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. I'm in joys that nut, mounds don't. I'm in joys that chocolate eaten, coconut and munchy nuts too. Mounds got chocolate eaten and chewy coconut. Sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. Escaping from a prison compartment aboard Professor Moriarty's Limehouse Express, the necklace safely in their possession, Piratep and Amantef dash to their ship in the hangar bay of Moriarty's huge, metallic gray flying wing. Take the necklace into the ship. I'll open the launch doors. But as the thick metal doors slide open, they trigger a series of security alarms. And before Piratep can reach the ship, a squad of Moriarty's guards enter the hangar bay and open fire with laser rifles. Piratep! As Piratep falls, blood streaming from her face, Amantef closes the hatch of the ship and blasts off for Starland. Nine hours later, Drove. Drove. 
wake up. Oh. Four. Is it time for breakfast already? I've just been having a chat with a very interesting and charming Egyptian gentleman. I thought you might like to meet him. What on earth are you talking about? The Egyptian ship, my dear drone. It docked 20 minutes ago. You're pulling my leg. The white beads of the necklace are data storage terminals. Here, look through the lens. Good heavens. Micro circuits. The beads are emanation scanners, Doctor, that sensed and recorded the spiritual aura of the kings who wore the necklace. The necklace was brought to Earth by our ancestors and passed from dynasty to dynasty in the hope that it would one day be worn by a spiritually perfect king. A king who would then be replicated and given immortality. Tutankhamun is that king. Look, you said you didn't know King Tut's tomb had been discovered until just a few weeks ago. How did your people lose track of its location in the first place? The last Egyptian dynasty ended with the death of King Nechneb. When he died, the necklace was sealed in his sarcophagus. One year later, on the first day of the new solar equinox, our ancestors returned from Nacheshem in a ceremonial funeral ship. As the ship orbited Earth, an inner circle high priestess went down in a small lander. She recovered the necklace, analyzed the white beads, and saw that of all the recorded spiritual auras, Tutankhamun's had been the most perfect and powerful. Placing the necklace in Tutankhamun's tomb, she returned to the lander, contacted the ship, and reported that it was Tutankhamun who would be given immortality. But before she could give the location of the tomb, her transmission was interrupted. She was never seen or heard from again. Limehouse Express to Starman. I'll talk to him, Mora. Well, if it isn't the notorious Wilhelmina Hammersmith. Don't be tiresome, Holm. I know Amantef is there. We tracked his ship. Now, as you said earlier, let's get down to cases. Karatep is alive and sealed in an airlock. If you don't return the necklace, I'll decompress that airlock and kill her. I see. How do you want us to proceed? Dr. Cassidy and Amantef will deliver the necklace in an unarmed ship. Amantef knows my location. And Foom, don't try any of your tricks. Decompression is a singularly horrible way to die. What are you going to do, Foom? Elementary, my dear drone. I'm going to beat Moriarty at his own game. Amontef, come with me. I'd like to have a word with you in private. Two hours later, Amontef leaves Foom's quarters and returns to Starlab Control. From there, he and Mora descend to Launch Bay 15, board the Deep Space Laboratory ship Octavia, and blast off for the Limehouse Express. Nine hours later, the Octavia enters Martian space and moves into a side-by-side -side position with Moriarty's huge flying wing. As the two ships float in the airless void between Diamos and Phobos, an enclosed metal flex walkway telescopes from the Octavia to the personnel hatch of the Limehouse Express. After pressurizing the walkway interior, Mora stabilizes its atmosphere. A moment later, the two ships open their airlocks. Amantef! 
Pirate. Your forehead. Don't concern yourself, Amentef. The wound is superficial. Thank Ra for that. Go into the ship now and rest. Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear a special adaptation of the unusual Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer motion picture, Forbidden Planet, a fascinating science fiction story set in a world of tomorrow. Starring in Forbidden Planet, you will hear Lionel Stevens, your producer, Cressick Jenkinson. <laughs> The Caltex Theatre presents Forbidden Planet, Act One. final decade of the 21st century, men and women in rocket ships landed on the moon. By 2200 AD, they had reached the other planets in our solar system. Almost at once, there followed discovery of hyperdrive, through which the speed of light was attained and later greatly surpassed. So at last, mankind began the conquest and colonization of deep space. Planets cruiser C-57D was more than a year out from Earth base on a special mission to the planetary system of the great main sequence star, Altair. When do we get a DC fix, Jerry? 30 seconds, Skipper. Ship on course, sir. We'll reach DC point at 1701. That's less than three minutes now. Chief, we'll drop back below light speed in about three minutes. Got your breakable gear stored? Aye, aye, sir. DC set and punched on, Skipper. All right, attention. Captain to crew. All hands squared away to decelerate. DC stations. Three eight nine six of light speed. The skipper, there's Altair coming up on the screen, right on the nose. Okay, Jerry, punch out an orbit on the fourth planet. Aye, aye, skipper. Ship in approach, skipper. Helical vector orientated. Attention, captain to crew. Attention. Our destination, Altair Four, is now visible on the main view plate. As you recollect from your briefing lectures, this is an Earth-type planet. Twenty years ago, the spacecraft Bellerophon landed here with a prospecting party of scientists. Our mission is to search for survivors. That is all. Well, that there it is. The Lord certainly made some beautiful worlds.
Look at it, Cookie. What do you think about that, huh? Ah, uh, not one of them new oils. No beer, no women, no poop parlors, nothing. Nothing to do but throw rocks at tin cans. We gotta bring our own tin cans. Attention, Captain to crew. We are now entering the atmosphere of Alts Air 4. No survival suits will be required upon landing. Oxygen content 4.7 richer than as standard. Gravity only 0.897. Adjust your equipment accordingly, that's all. All hands, check equipment. Jerry, can you make out anything down there? Well, maybe missing some individual structures, but as far as I can see, there are no cities, ports, roads, bridges, dams. There's just no sign of civilization at all. Mm. Sir, we're being radar scanned. Huh? Let me see that. There it is on the electronic equipment. Yeah, can you zero on it? No, oh, sir, but it seems to emanate from an area about 20 miles square. Boson, pass the alert. Aye, aye, sir. Combat stations, blast the men, activate your scopes. Radio contact, sir. There's a voice here. Human? Yes, sir. Sounds like it. Boost it on the speaker. Spaceship, identify yourself. You are being tracked. Cut me in, Quinn. Yes, sir. United Planets Cruiser C-57D, J.J. Adams commanding. Who are you? Morbius of the Bellerophon. Who? Edward Morbius. Jerry? Uh, yeah, yeah, here it is. His name's on the passenger list. Morbius E, Ph.D., Lit D, Expedition Philologist. What do you wish here, Cruiser? We're your relief, sir. We're very glad to find you alive. Dr. Morbius, are you there? Naturally, I appreciate your concern. But absolutely no assistance of any kind is required. Well, the red carpet treatment, huh? Dr. Morbius, my orders are to survey the situation on Altair 4. Let me repeat. I'm in no sort of difficulty here. Your best procedure will be to turn back at once, without landing. Sorry, sir, but those aren't my orders. Commander, if you sit down on this planet, I warn you that I cannot be answerable for the safety of either your ship or your crew. Dr. Morbius... I require landing coordinates. I'll be obliged if you'll supply me with them. Very well. And I wash my hands of all responsibility. You have standard charts. Yes, sir. You may come in at 83, 17, 4 north, 148, 21 west. Thank you. Got that, Jerry? It's right back there in the desert. Commander, I strongly urge you to reconsider. Quinn, cut him off. Please permit me to recommend... There's something funny going on down there, Skipper. Well, we'll soon know what it is. Okay, Jerry. I'll take her in. Yes, sir. No sign of any living being. Thank you, Boson. Look at the color of that sky. Most fantastic greenish yellow. Fantastic, Doc, but I'll still take blue. <laughs> oh, I don't know. The sky, the desert, the mountains. I think a man could get used to this and grow to love it. You uh, better check your command, Mike Skipper. Yeah, good idea. Chief. Sir. You're in command now, Quinn, back there in the ship. You keep right at those instruments while we look around. Aye, aye, sir. Hey, what's this dust coming? Dust? A column of dust sweeping towards us over the desert. Oh, must be a vehicle of some sort. Yeah, it looks like we're being met. Bosun, alert your men. Aye, aye, sir. Look at the speed he's traveling. That driver must be a madman. What driver? You're right. There's a mechanical creature in charge of it. It's coming over to us. Take it steady now. Welcome to Alpha 4, gentlemen. It talks. I am to transport you to the residence. 
If you do not speak English, I am at your disposal with 187 other languages, along with their various dialects and sub No, uh, colloquial English will be fine, thank you. Uh, this is no offense, but you are a robot, aren't you? That is correct, sir. For your convenience, I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. Hmm. Well, it's a nice climate you have here, Robbie. Uh, high oxygen content. I rarely use it myself, sir. With my metallic structure, it promotes rust. Uh, hey, Doc, uh, is it a... Uh... Is it a male or a female? (laughs) Cookie, I really couldn't say. In my case, sir, the question is totally without meaning. Will you get in the vehicle, gentlemen? Uh, Doc, Jerry, come along with me. Right, right. Quinn, trace this vehicle. If I blink red back to you, you... I'll bring the tractor in a hurry, sir. Right. Hey, you Skipper. Just room for you. will please fasten their seat belts. Looks after us like a mother. if you like. Have you ever seen a more gracious and attractive home? Exotic flowers, shady trees, pools of clear water? And there in the doorway, if I'm not mistaken, our unwilling host. I am Morbius. I'm Commander Adams. This is Lieutenant Farman, my executive, Lieutenant Astro, our ship's doctor. How ironic that a simple scholar with no ambition beyond a modest measure of seclusion should out of a clear sky find himself besieged by an army of fellow creatures all grimly determined to be of some service to him. I'm sorry, sir, if we're not welcome, but we do have our orders. Of course. And you must stay for lunch, gentlemen. Uh, Do forgive the ill manners of an old recluse, if you can. Well, gentlemen, won't you come in? Well, whatever that lunch was, it was certainly delicious. Simply some of Robbie's synthetics. He's your cook, too, huh? He even manufactures the raw materials. Uh, Come around here, Robbie. I'll show you how he works. Now, one introduces a sample of human food through this aperture in the upper part of Robbie's body. Down here, there's a small built-in chemical laboratory where he analyzes it. Later, he can produce identical molecules in any shape or quantity. Well, the housewife's dream. Plus absolute selfless obedience. But do not attribute feelings to him, gentlemen. Robbie is simply a tool. Tremendously strong, of course. He could quite easily topple this whole house off its foundation. In the wrong hands, mightn't such a, a tool become a deadly weapon? No, Doctor. Not even if I were the mad scientist of the thrillers. Because, you see, there happens to be a built-in safety factor. Uh, Commander, may I borrow that formidable-looking sidearm of yours? Thank you. Now, Robbie, point this thing at that fruit tree out there on the terrace. Fire! Hmm. The tree is disintegrated entirely. You understand this mechanism we're in? Yes, Morbius. A simple blaster. All right. Now turn around here. Point it at the commander. What? Now, now wait a minute. Aim right between the eyes. Fire! You see, he's helpless. His whole electronic being is in a most distressing turmoil. He's locked in a sub-electronic dilemma between my direct orders and his basic inhibitions against harming rational beings. Order cancelled. If I were to allow that distress to continue, he would blow every circuit in his body. Dr. Morbius, how did you come by such a a mechanism? Oh, I didn't come by him, Doctor. I just tinkered him together during my first few months here. You mean you made it? A useful enough toy, Lieutenant. But nowadays I have no time for such things. Dr. Morbius, you're a philologist, an expert in words and languages, their origins and meanings. Yet this robot of yours is beyond the combined resources of all Earth's physical science. My dear Commander, I think you overestimate both Robbie and myself. Uh, Gentlemen, let me now show you another bit of parlor magic. 
If I wave my hand over this beamer... They were trapped. Steel shutters over all the doors and windows. Now, forgive me, gentlemen. I did not mean to alarm you. I had Robbie install those steel shutters before I realized how altogether safe I am here. I just have to pass my hand over the beamer again, and they return to their original position of sight. Oh, that's better. Well, gentlemen, this has been very pleasant. You've seen how very comfortable I am here. No hardships, no special difficulties, and no need at all for military assistance. I dare say you have become impatient to get back to base. Yes, sir, the moment we've interviewed the other members of the Bellerophon party. The others? But there are no others, Commander. The what? Before the first year was out, they'd all, every man and woman, succumbed to a, well, in a sort of planetary force here. Some dark, terrible, incomprehensible force. Only my wife and myself were immune. And how do you account for your immunity, Dr. Morbius? Well, my wife and I differed from the others in our special love of this new world, in our boundless longing to make a home here, far from the scurry and the strife of mankind. I remember how, when the boat was taken to return to Earth, she and I were utterly heartbroken. Skipper, there's no record of any wife on the list of the Bellerophon passengers. And Lieutenant, look under biochemistry, Julia Marson. She and I were married to the skipper on the voyage out here. I thought uh, Robbie had made some very charming feminine touches. I take it Mrs. Morbius isn't at home today. My dear wife died a few months after the others. And in her case, it was of natural causes. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. Dr. Morbius, just what were the symptoms of all those other deaths? The unnatural ones, I mean. The symptoms were very striking, Commander. One by one, in spite of every possible safeguard, my co-workers were torn literally limb from limb. By what? By some devilish thing that never once showed itself. And the Bellerophon? Vaporized as the three remaining survivors tried to take her off. And yet in all these 19 years, you personally have never again been bothered by this planetary force? Only in nightmares of those times. Yet always in my mind, I seem to feel the creature is lurking somewhere close at hand. Sly and irresistible. Only waiting to be re invoked for murder. Father? Father! Father, I specifically asked you not to join us for lunch. Oh, but Father, lunch is over. I'm sure you never said a word about not coming in for coffee. Well, did you or did you not? A girl. A brother. Is she terrific? Take it easy now, Farmer. And gentlemen, this is my daughter, Commander Adams. Dr. Ostro. How do you do? Lieutenant Farman. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Oh, I've always so terribly wanted to meet a young man and. And now, three of them at once. That's very kind of you. Oh, you're lovely, Doctor. <laughs> of course, the, the other two are unbelievable. <laughs> well, that puts me in my place. Uh, could this one get you some coffee? Oh, I'm quite able to get it. Oh, of course you are, but uh, come over here. And I'll get it for you. Well, Commander, if I can be of any help to you in your preparations for the homeward voyage. Thank you, sir, but unfortunately, circumstances may keep us here for quite a while. Oh, circumstances? My orders don't quite seem to cover the Bellerophon fatalities. I'm forced now to contact base for new instructions. And that, Commander, suppose these new instructions require my return to Earth for questioning. Two years or more away from my work here? No. You know, I... Uh, tell me, just what is involved in your making contact with Earth base? Well, fundamentally, it's a question of crude power, how to short-circuit the continuum on a five or six parsec level. Of course, a transmitter of that sort isn't exactly standard equipment. No. To build one, we'd have to make use of about two-thirds of the ship's electronic gear, then unship the main drive to juice it. Just to construct a bunker to house the core would take us about ten days. Disabled here for ten days and ten nights? I tell me, would two-inch lead shielding do just as well? Sure, <laughs> it'd be fine. If we happen to be carrying about a hundred square yards of the stuff. I'll have Robbie run some off for you. We'll have it not later than noon tomorrow. Oh, well, it's very obliging of you, sir. Obliging? Look out there, Commander. The graves of the Bellerophon party. I dug those graves with my own hands. Believe me, I have no wish to repeat that experience. Uh, you 
can put it over there by the core. Thank you, Robbie. Wait a minute. That's solid lead he's carrying. Common lead would have crushed the vehicle, sir. This is my morning's run of isotope 217. The whole thing hardly comes to ten tons. Pardon me, sir. Oh, uh, hello, Alter. Hello, Lieutenant. Does your father know you're out here? Uh, he did tell me not to go near the ship, but uh, this isn't very near, is it? You'd be farther away still if we took a walk. Oh, Robbie might come back. Oh, he's occupied over there. Cookie's following him around like a shadow. Now, come on, a walk's just what you need on a morning like this. Hey, Robbie. Can I be of service, sir? Uh, never mind about the sir. Uh, come over here where the skipper can't see us. Uh, look, uh, I'm nothing by a cook, so you don't have to be that polite. Uh, but I'm a stranger on this so-called planet, and I was just wondering if, um... Uh, well, if you could tell me where I could get hold of some of the real stuff. Real stuff? Uh, just for cooking purposes, you understand? I, I take a big pride in my duties. Pardon me, sir. Stuff? Oh, uh, just about one jolt left in this bottle. Now, this is it. Genuine Asian rocket bourbon. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, I didn't say you could drink it. Why, you low-living contraption, I ought to take a can opener to you. Quiet, please. I am analyzing. Yes, relatively simple alcoholic molecules with traces of fusel oil. Would 60 gallons be sufficient? Gallons? Hey, Robbie, I've been from here to there in this galaxy, and I just want you to know, you're the most understanding soul I ever met up with. Tomorrow night, sir, it will be ready. Now, if you will pardon me, Miss Alka will be waiting. It's uh, nothing personal, Alter. Just a kiss. Oh, but, Lieutenant, why should people want to kiss each other? Oh, well, it's an old custom. All the really high civilizations go in for it. Oh, but it's so silly. Well, it's good for you, though. It stimulates the whole system. As a matter of fact, you can't be in tip-top health without it. Oh, I didn't know that. I'd only be too happy to show you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Lieutenant. Oh, it's no trouble at all. I... Oh. Is that all there is to it, this kissing? Well, you've sort of got to stick with it. Oh. Oh, could we try just once more? Do you mind? Oh, not at all. I... I don't know, Lieutenant. There must be something seriously the matter with me because, well, honestly, I, I haven't noticed the least bit of stimulation. Uh, honey, let's do this thing right. Uh, this time, let's really give it the works, huh? All right, honey, now just let yourself go and... Mm. Lieutenant Barr! Uh, uh, don't say another word, sir. I know there are a lot of pressing duties waiting for me back at the ship. You're right, Lieutenant. And rank does have its little privileges, doesn't it, sir? You can depend on it, Lieutenant, that those privileges won't be stretched into taking your kind of advantages. What, I... Dismissed! Was... Yes, sir. Well, what's the matter? Why did you both act so funny? Well, don't you understand, Al, of the... No? Well, look at yourself. You can't run around like that in front of men. It's... It was bad enough anyway, a girl like you, after a year in a spaceship, but when you're wearing nothing but that play suit, particularly in front of a space wolf like Farman, well, well, for Pete's sake, go home and put on something that's... Well, put on anything. What's wrong with my clothes? I designed them myself. Oh, well, don't you like the way I look? Stop looking at me that way. Elta, get out of here before I have you run out of the area under guard. Then I'll have to put more guards on the guards. Now get out of here, Alta. feeling, Joe. I stood guard over the spaceship before at night, but never with two moons in the sky. Yeah. Joe. Yeah? Do you hear something? Like what? Like a sort of big breathing. No. Well, that's funny. I, I did. 
There's no one around. You can see that. There's no sign of anyone or, or anything. Funny. Like a sort of big breathing. claimed to have been at their post in the way. Yet the ship was entered. The heavy-duty hatch was raised and the latch back. Equipment was sabotaged. All this without anybody seeing or hearing anything. Same story from everyone, Skipper. When I don't care how you do it, but this gear has got to be patched up. Otherwise, we'll never get the transmitter working to contact Earth Base. And we'll never be able to take the ship home again when the time comes. Yeah. No one actually saw or heard anyone last night. Strong says... He... Yeah, yeah, I know... He thinks he heard something like, like a big breathing. And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltech play, Forbidden Planet. In a moment we commence Act Two. The Caltex Theatre now presents Lionel Stevens in Forbidden Planet, Act Two. Well, you like my new dress, Commander? Well, I... It's long, you see. Nothing shows through. Also, I'm... I'm sorry about the way I spoke to you yesterday. I was, well, sort of bothered. I had this dress made especially for you. Though I didn't really want to see you. You used to look at me in that funny way. I suppose there's just something personally about me that, that, that you don't like. Alta, you always look quite beautiful. Well, then why don't you kiss me like everybody else does? Everybody? Hasn't your father taught you anything at all? Well, he says I'm terribly ignorant. But I've had poetry and mathematics and logic, physics and geology and... and bi Biology? Well, of course, that's mainly on the theoretical side. Oh, well, so far. But what's wrong with theory? This is what's wrong with it. Oh. Oh, that, that wasn't at all as I felt after the lieutenant kissed me. I feel different altogether. Oh, a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Well, let's go back to the house. I, I have to see your father. This is the situation, Dr. Morbius. Last night, the ship was entered and our Clistron monitor was sabotaged. And you suspect me? Then the time has come to clarification. Sit down, gentlemen. In times long past, this planet was the home of a mighty and noble race of beings who call themselves the Krell. Ethically, as well as technologically, they were a whole million years ahead of mankind. But in unlocking the mysteries of nature, they conquered even their baser selves. In the course of aeons, they abolished sickness, insanity, crime, and all injustice. But then, seemingly upon the threshold of some supreme accomplishment, which was to have crowned their entire history... This all but divine race perished in a single night. Perished? Yes, Doctor. In the 2,000 centuries since that unexplained catastrophe, even the cloud-piercing towers of glass and porcelain and adamantine steel have crumbled back into the soil of Altair IV, and nothing, absolutely nothing, remains above the ground. However, under the ground... Under the ground, Dr. Morbius? Behind this room there is a tunnel. Now come with me, and I will show you wonders of which the human mind could never conceive. Well, gentlemen, already you've seen a certain amount. You've seen krell metal with molecules so densely interlocked that your blasters make no kind of impact on it. You've seen mile upon mile of self-servicing, self-renewing machinery. 
still functioning as perfectly as when it was constructed more than 2,000 centuries ago. Utterly incredible. You've seen their laboratories? What's this, Dr. Morbius? On this screen may be projected the total scientific knowledge of the Krell, from its primitive beginnings to the day of its annihilation. A sheer bulk surpassing many million earthly libraries. I turn this knob, and as you see, the panel lights up. Hieroglyphics appear. You're able to read this? A little. It's my profession. I started on it some 20 years ago. Eventually, I was able to deduce most of their huge logical alphabet, so I began to learn. And the first practical result was that robot of mine, which you gentlemen appear to find so very remarkable. Child's play. Why, I've come here every day now for two decades, painfully picking up a few of the least difficult fragments of their knowledge. A thing like this, it's, it's too big to evaluate. Uh, Dr. Morbius, what's this device? Oh, one could describe that as a brain booster. And as a headset, electrodes at each end. You can see it was designed for something far bulkier than my human cranium. And a function? I'll activate it. Now, watch closely. A figure's appearing. It's Alter. Just a three-dimensional image, Commander. But it's alive. Because my daughter is alive in my brain from microsecond to microsecond whilst I manipulate there. I remove the electrodes from my temples, and the image vanishes. Ah, it's something of a strain. Here, let me try. I put the headset on, I pull the switch. Now, is that right? Stop. But I want to... Commander, you never survive. Our elephant skipper tried it. It was instantly fatal to him. Oh, so you're immune to this too, Dr. Morbius. In my first attempt at creating a brain image here, the shock rendered me unconscious for a whole day and a whole night. Yet you came back for a second go at it? It was a matter of science, Doctor. You can imagine my joy when I discovered that the shock had permanently, permanently doubled my intellectual capacity. Otherwise, my researches would have come to nothing, poor as they may have been. So that's how it happened. I have a great deal more to show you, gentlemen. Can you spare further time away from your ship? Yes, I believe so. I've left Lieutenant Farnham in charge. I've ordered him to set up a standard perimeter with a full tail of milk. All right. All hands tank clear of the magnetic fence area. Yeah. Have you tested it yet, Boson? Just about to do so, sir. Mm -hmm. Toss the branch at it. How you going to spark, sir? Uh, fine. I don't keep any unwanted visitor from entering the camp. See the full-scale alerts maintained, Boson. Aye, aye, sir. A lieutenant. Huh? Oh, what's your trouble, Cookie? Well, I haven't completed my washing-up duties after chow. I request the lieutenant's permission to take a little walk outside the perimeter, sir. But there's nothing out there. Oh, sir, I thought it might brighten up the boys' mess a little bit if, uh, if I could, um, find a few wild radishes or something. Look, Crookie, um, I don't know what you're lying about, but, uh, you better get back here before the skipper checks in or we'll both get skinned. Yes, sir. Uh, Quinn, this is Farman. Kill the power on the fence. All right, Cookie, off you go. Yes, sir. I thank you, sir. All right, Quinn. Put it back on. Bobby, I ain't never gonna forget this. Bottled stacks of them. Four hundred and eighty pints, sir, as you requested. Total... Sixty gallons. Oh, I gotta try it. Uh, wait a minute, Bobby. <clears throat> Genuine Kansas City bourbon. <clears throat> Smooth, too. Uh, like I said, Robbie, anything I can do. Uh, anytime you're hard up for a couple of gallons of loop oil, uh, you just let me know, huh? Hey, what's up? You see something? Somebody coming this way? <coughs> Sure. But there's no one coming through. Shall I have the current shut down, sir? No. No, it stopped now. Strange, that. Just shorting out. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, check over the whole system first thing in the morning, boss. Aye, sir. Hey, boss. That, uh... 
Vince, the way it was shorting. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're too arbitrary. Perhaps I do not choose to be dictated to in my own world. But Dr. Morbius, a scientific find of this magnitude has got to be taken under United Planet supervision. No one man can be allowed to monopolize it. The past two hours I've been expecting you to make exactly this, such an asinine statement. Asinine? Just one moment, Commander. For close on 20 years now, I've been constantly, and I hope dispassionately, considering this very problem. Now I've come to the unalterable conclusion that man is unfit as yet to receive such knowledge, such almost limitless power. Whereas Morbius, with his artificially expanded intellect, is now ideally suited to administer this power for the whole human race. Precisely, Doctor. Such portions of the Krell science as I may from time to time deem suitable and safe, I shall dispense to Earth. Other portions I shall withhold. In this, I shall be answerable exclusively to my own conscience and judgment. Dr. Morbius, in the absence of special instructions, you leave me in a very awkward position. I... I want to contact you from the ship. Adam speaking. Commander, this is Farman. Yes, Lieutenant. Skipper, the chief's been murdered. Quinn murdered? What? He was alone in the ship working on the monitor. The rest of us were all outside on guard duty. But how was it done? Done? Skipper, his body's plashed and all over the communications room. Right. Leave everything as it is. We're on our way. Come on, Doc. It started again. foot of whatever it was that killed Quinn last night. I made this plaster model from the footprints we found. 37 inches by 19. And the terrifying thing, Skipper, that this thing runs counter to every known law of evolution. It, it just doesn't fit into, into normal nature. Anywhere in this galaxy, it's a nightmare. Commander, are you ready to hold discipline on the cook? Yes, let's have him. Come on, cookie. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm obliged to remind you, sir, that I gave him permission to go out last night. Did you give him permission to get falling down drunk, Lieutenant? Drunk, sir? Me, sir? Well, anyway, why did that robot argue me into drinking all that whiskey in the first place? You were with the robot last night? Oh, yes, sir. Him and me, uh, we kind of got to toasting each other's good health. Uh, just for your cordial interplanetary relations, you understand? And that went on all the time, even while the chief was being killed? Well, certainly, sir. But you don't think I could have got that stiff in five minutes? All right, dismissed. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, come on, Cookie. Well, Doc, that just about washes the robot up as a suspect. And what does that leave us with? Maybe it leaves us with the same one we've always had. Morbius. But we were with him. Maybe you and I ought to drop over to the Krell Laboratory and get our brains boosted. Then maybe we could understand. Sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Dr. Morbius is here. Oh. Well, ask Dr. Morbius to come in. Yes, sir. Skipper, what do you suppose he's... Oh, good day, Dr. Morbius. Well, Commander, I dare say neither of us really slept last night. That's pretty close, guess. I warned you while your ship is still in space. I begged you not to land on the planet. Believe me, Commander, that's only a foretaste. The Bellerophon pattern is being woven all over again. What? Remain here, and the next attack upon your party will be more general and more deadly. Dr. Morbius, how do you know that? No. Well, I, I seem to visualize it. If you wish, call it a premonition. That is all I have to say, Commander. Well, Skipper, what do you make of that? I'd say it sounded like an ultimatum. We'll be ready. Tonight we'll be prepared for an attack. I want a clear field of fire in all directions. You've got it, sir. Fine, fine. Lieutenant. Sir. You get your trouble squad in hand. Yes, sir, they're in hand. But they're a little trigger happy. 
They're sort of edgy to see whatever's out there tonight. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, look, this uh, might be a big deal coming up. Could be uh, the biggest, Skip. Well, I want you to know that I'm sorry if I kind of leaned on you. You've got to understand that Stop I... knocking yourself out, Skip. She picked the right man. Huh? Oh. Skipper, radar just picked up something. Where away? At the head of the gully, heading this way. Automatic control. Batteries. Fire. Hold fire. Dead on target, Skipper, but it's still coming. I'll stop it. Get back, Lieutenant. Ah! Batteries, fire! Batteries, cease fire! Skipper, it's still coming. Our main battery finally stopped it. You believe that, Skipper? No. No, it just went away for some reason. It'll be back. Doc, an invisible being that can't be disintegrated by atomic fission. No, Skipper, that's a scientific impossibility. Hypnotic illusions don't tear people apart, and that's what this thing did to our men tonight. Doc, you saw its shape yourself standing right there in those neutron beams. It must have been made of solid nuclear material. Renewing its molecular structure from one microsecond to the next. Boston, I want the tractor. Ready, sir. So now we just pick up the girl and her father, whether they like it or not, do we? Section 86A, evacuate all civilians from disaster area. Yeah? You left out two very important words. Where feasible. Now, if you remember the Bellerophon expedition, their ship was vaporized trying to lift off. Which makes it a guilt-edged priority that one of us gets into that Krell lab and takes that brain boost. Well, I don't know of any other way we can hope to combat this thing. You remember what happened when the Bellerophon's commander took that brain boost? Yes, I remember that, too. Doc, in case we make it into the lab, I'll take first go at the booster. You hear me, Doc? I hear you, Skip. Bosun? Aye, sir. Leaving you in command while we visit Dr. Morbius. Get the ship operational. Do your best to wait it out for me and the doctor, but the second that fence starts to short again, you lift off. Right, Skipper. Let's go, Doc. How's sir. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. So glad. I've had the most awful dream that, that you... I'm all right, Alza. Why are you here? Tell me what's happened. We were attacked. Three men died, including Jerry Farman. Oh. Oh, darling. That's why I came here. Before anything else happens, I have to see to your safety. How were you attacked? By what? I don't know. Nothing human, just some kind of big outline in the disintegrator beams. Alta, you can't explain it. No. Anyway, we fought it, we lost, and I believe it'll come back. Well, then you must leave now. Darling, I'm not going without you. I can't possibly leave Father alone. I, I just can't. Then we'll take him with us. By force? I can't agree to that either. Also, you don't realize what's loose on this planet. But, but I'm immune, like both my parents. That's what your father says, but I don't believe it. Nothing could be immune to that thing up oh, there. Oh, darling, darling, please go. Please, if you love me, but go. Don't listen to me. Oh, go, are... darling. Doc, can you talk some sense into this? Hey, Doc. Well, where is he? The Doc was right here. Open, Robbie. The door's open into the tunnel. That's where Robbie brought him from. Doc, you took the brain boost. You ought to see my new mind. Up there in lights, on the indicator. But bigger than Morbius now. Easy, Doc, easy. Easy. Listen, Morbius was... Too close to the problem. The Krell... The the Krell had completed their final project. True creation. Creation of life. Come on, Doc, let's have it. But... The the Krell forgot one thing. Yes? What? Monsters. 
monsters from the id. The id? What's that? <laughs> well, talk, Doc. <laughs> Doc. Oh. oh, darling. How romantic. Oh, a fool, a middling idiot. As though his ape's brain could contain the secrets of the Krell. Father, he's dead. He was warned, and now he's paid. Let him be buried along with the other victims of greed and folly. Morbius, you've chosen for me. John, I'm ready to go with you. Hold her. No. Commander, she mustn't do this. She must be prevented. Morbius, what is the id? Young man, my daughter is planning a very foolish action. She will be terribly punished. What is the id? Id, 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 id. It's, well, it's, it's an obsolete term once used to describe the elementary basis of the subconscious mind. Monsters from the id, the subconscious mind. What? Monsters from the subconscious. That's what the doc meant. Morbius, those machines in there, 8,000 cubic miles of Clistron relays, enough power for a, whole, for a whole population of creative geniuses operated by remote control, operated by the electromagnetic impulses of individual Krell brains. But for what purpose? In return, that machine would instantaneously project solid matter to any point on the planet, in any shape or color they might imagine. For any purpose, Morbius, creation by mere thought. Why haven't I seen this all along? But like you, the Krell forgot one deadly danger. Their own subconscious hate and lust for destruction. The beast, the mindless primitive. Even the Krell must have evolved from that beginning. So those mindless beasts of the subconscious had access to a machine that could never be shut down. The secret devil of every soul on the planet, all set free at once to loot and maim and take revenge, Morbius, and kill. My poor Krell. After a million years of shining sanity, they could hardly have understood what power was destroying them. But the one obvious fallacy. The last Krell died some 2,000 centuries ago. But today, as we all know, there's still at large upon this planet a living monster. A monster created by the subconscious mind of someone. Your mind refuses to face the conclusion. Morbius. Morbius. What? Something approaching from the southwest. Breaking down trees in its path. Quite close. Father! The monster! That thing out there, well, it's you! It was your subconscious that created it! You're insane! You must be! How else would you have led it here, where Alta must see it torn to pieces? You still think she's immune? She's joined herself to me, body and soul! Yes! And whatever comes! Forever! Say it's a lie! Shout! Let it hear you out there! Say you don't love this man. Not even if I could. Stop it, Robbie. Don't let it in. Kill it, Robbie. He can do nothing, Morbius. He knows it's your other self. Adams, I'm not a monster. We're all part monsters in our subconscious. That's why we have laws and religion. Into the tunnel, quickly. Morbius, you listen to me. We don't have much time. Your mind was artificially enlarged. Consciously, it still lacked the power to operate the great machines. But your subconscious had been made strong enough. I won't hear you. Twenty years ago, when your comrades voted to return to work, you sent your secret in out to murder them. Not quite realizing, of course, except maybe in your dream. What man can remember his own dream? Well, at least when our ship was approaching from space, you remembered enough to warn us off. But then... When you thought you were threatening your little egomaniac empire, your subconscious sent its id monster out again. More deaths, Morbius. More murder. Even in you, the loving father, there still exists this mindless primitive. More enraged and more inflamed with each new frustration. So now you're whistling up your monster again to punish her for her disloyalty and disobedience. And if you don't do something about it soon, Morbius, it's going to be coming right through that door. Solid fill middle? Impossible. The machines are going to supply your monster with whatever amount of power requires to reach us. I'll just say you don't believe this of me. Tell me you don't. And it must be true. I must be guilty. My evil self is at that door. And I have no power to stop it. Father, you can help her. I've known you. Great and noble like the Krell? Yes. Yes, I can help you. I can. You! Come there! No further! I deny you! I give you up! I deny you! It 
it is finished. All finished. Father. Strain, it's been too much. Commander, throw that switch. This? Yes, throw it. In 24 hours, you and Alta must be a hundred million miles away out in space. The Krell furnaces. A chain reaction has begun. Can't be reversed. Go. Go quickly. <laughs> Ninety-eight million point six miles. We're clear now, Alta. That's Alta four on the viewplate. Yes, the bright speck below the star. In Fifteen seconds, and it'll all be over. Alta four would be destroyed. Your father, my shipmates, all the stored knowledge of the Krell. Five seconds. Four, three, two, one. There. The explosion. Alter. About a million years from now, the human race will have crawled up to where the Krell stood in their great moment of triumph and tragedy. Your father's name will shine again like a beacon in the galaxy. It'll remind us that we are, after all, not God. our Caltech's play, Forbidden Planet. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltech's theatre. Ladies and gentlemen, the producer of tonight's Caltech's play, Cresic Jenkinson. Thank you. Forbidden Planet was presented tonight by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Proprietary Limited. The script was adapted for radio by Richard Lane, and the special sound effects were devised and recorded for this production by Graham Moncrief. In the starring role, you heard... I played Dr. Morbius. This was Lionel Stevens. <laughs> the supporting cast was as follows. Robbie the Robot, Edward Heppel. Dr. Ostro, Leonard Teal. Lieutenant Farman, Richard Meekle. Quinn, Stuart Finch. The Cook, John Llewellyn. The Bosun, Al Garcia. And as Alta and Commander Adams, you heard Joan Lander and Hart McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Jenkinson. Next week in the Caltech Theatre, you will hear the saga of a family and of the famous shipping line they founded and struggled to keep afloat during years of depression and war. And in particular, it is the story of Caroline, daughter of old Sir Benjamin Hamilton, who with indomitable spirit and at a cost of personal happiness, fought to make the Hamilton Line the premier shipping company of Great Britain. Be listening for this fine drama, Big Ben, in the Caltech Theatre next week. Remember, too, Crispin's Day, another outstanding production shortly to be heard in the Caltech Theatre. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night. On behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltech Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world-famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil and Marfac Lubrication. <laughs> This is security police headquarters. We've just seen the photo print, and it's impossible. I said impossible. No matter what the evidence proves, no man can be two places at once. Two thousand plus.
Science fiction adventures in the world of tomorrow. 2000 Plus presents The Other Man. Ain't you home? Hey, when I come home, I want my wife to be here. Mary, in here. Hey, didn't you hear me? Scotty! Oh, my darling! Oh, Scotty! Scotty! Mary, if I had to say, what's the matter? When did you escape? How did you get away? Escaped? Would you mind telling me? You... Shh! Quiet. I thought I heard someone. Just a moment, darling. There, now. We can talk. Oh, Scotty, I couldn't understand what had happened to you. I was so worried, I, I couldn't believe it. Mira, I hate to stand here like an idiot. I, I just can't go on repeating your silly phrases after you. What are you talking about? Then you didn't kill the man in the blue turban? Where was I supposed to have killed him? In Cairo. Cairo? When? This morning. Look, darling, I know this is the year 2000 plus 120, but even in this age of super science, there's no jet plane fast enough to fly me from Cairo, Egypt, to Metropolitan City, USA, that fast. Scotty, I'm telling you the truth. Look, I'll show you. It's all over the front pages of the facsimile newspaper. See? There, the whole story in headlines. And your picture, too. Read it. Read it. The World Security Police in a daring action in Cairo, Egypt, today captured Scott Douglas, chief of the Eastern Zone Security Police Section, as the chief criminal behind a worldwide black market operation running into millions of dollars annually. In the struggle preceding his arrest, Mr. Douglas shot and killed a mysterious stranger wearing a blue turban. You see, darling, it is true. Not only in the papers, but all day in the Televox News. I've seen it, Scotty, with my own eyes. Being taken to the police, to the, to the airport, it was you, Scotty. I tell you, this is not true. It's not me. Look, call my office. Ask for the chief. Ask him what this is all about. They know you've escaped. They'll come here. They'll, they'll capture you They won't again. do any such thing because none of it's true. Look, if you're worried about it, don't tell him I'm here. If he asks you, deny it. But for heaven's sake, call him. All right, Scotty. All right. Mr. Enright? Hello, Mira. I was rather expecting you to call. You want to know about Scotty, don't you? I can't understand it, Mr. Enright. I've seen it in the papers on the telephones, but I can't believe I'm it. I'm afraid it's true, Mira. But are you certain it's Scotty? There's no doubt of it. But how do you know? By the obvious methods. It looks like Scotty. It talks like Scotty. It's wearing Scotty's clothes, carrying Scotty's wallet with your picture and his private papers in it. The small birthmark on the left arm, same blood type, same fillings in the teeth. And the fingerprints are exactly Scotty's. I had everything double-checked by audio from Egypt against Scotty's personal identification file here. And to top it all off, Mira, I talked to him by audio phone just a few minutes before the jet plane took off. I'm sorry. Huh. I see. Thank you, Mr. Enright. Oh, just one thing more, Mira. Yes? Scotty is due to land in about three hours. I'll send someone over in a little while to pick you up. I know you'll want to see him. Thank you. Thank you. It's unbelievable. It's fantastic. Mira, I can't... Who are you? Who are you? Who am I? I'm your husband. I'm Scott Douglas. I'm going to call the police. Oh, stop it. I am Scotty. Look at me, Mira. I am your husband. No one can fool you about that. Look at me. Good Lord, Mira, look, look. Look, here's my wallet. The one he talked about, see? It is mine. You know it, look. Touch it, thumb through it. There's your picture. There's the stitching where I had it repaired last October. Remember, Mira, when I didn't want to throw it away for sentimental reasons because we bought it that night last summer at the Little Bazaar? Who would know that, Mira, except your husband? Who would remember that except me? Here, look at this. Pull my sleeve up. The birthmark on my left arm. 
Nobody could fake that ugly thing. You know that, Mark. Every twist of it. Uh, uh, fingerprints. Fingerprints. I, I'll give you all you want. Have them checked any way you want. I am Scott Douglas. I am your husband. Then who... Who is the other man? <laughs> Police, Scotty. They're here to pick me up. And take you to the airport to meet your husband. Oh, Scotty, I'm frightened. You must never let anyone know that. It's the only way I'll ever be able to figure this thing out. I- I'll try, darling. Uh, just a moment, I'm coming. Oh, darling. Now, remember, this whole thing may be a trick. I don't know why or for what reason, but there's always the possibility that this was a deliberate deception. But they can't fool me. They did fool you, Mir- Mira. They, you believed all the publicity, all the newspaper reports, everything you saw on the telebox. That's what I can't understand. This whole thing's being carried out so openly, so boldly. They act as if they're so sure of themselves. I, I, I've got to go now. They'll be suspicious. Yes, yes. Now, remember our plan. Yes. After you leave, I'll get out of here. I don't know where I'll go, but I'll get in touch with you from time to time. You'll always know it's me and not the other man, because I'll use the code word bizarre. I know, darling. You don't have to tell me again. All right. And act toward this other man as if he really were me. At least do that for a while. It's obviously what they expect of you. Yes, yes, Scotty. You've told me a dozen times. I, I know what to do. Goodbye, darling. Yes, what is it? Plane from Cairo with Douglas aboard coming in, sir. Okay. Over here, Mira. We can see the plane land from this window. It'll be landing over there by that ramp. Who are those men? Security police. I'm sorry, Mira, but we can't take any chance of Scotty escaping. We've taken great care ever since his arrest. Uh, the plane's coming in now. Taxiing. I wonder what... what he'll look like. A little tired, perhaps, but it's Scotty. I told you that. Well, the plane stopped. You'll see him in a moment, Mira. Now, look, when he comes in here, don't break down. He's going to need all the courage and help you can give him. There, look. It... It does look like Scotty. Well, yes? Prisoner's coming up, sir. Bring him in the moment he arrives. Yes, sir. Do you like a drink, Mira? No, 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 thanks. Cigarette? Nothing, please. Oh, here they are. All right, men, outside. Leave Douglas with me. Hello, Scotty. Hello, Chief. Hello, Mira. Hello? Uh, I think I'll, uh... Look, I'll leave you two alone for a while. Thanks, Chief. I'm glad you're here, Mira. I was wondering if you would be. Were you? Mira, what's the matter? You're so cold, so distant. Darling, I, I don't understand. Don't you want to talk to me, Mira? I don't know. I'm... I I don't know. It's all been a terrible shock to you, hasn't it? What did you learn? Did the chief call you? No. I I first learned through the newspaper, then the telebox. You mean it's it's been published, broadcast? Good Lord, everybody knows then. That's right. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. I hardly know what happened myself. The last few days are a blur, a, a blank. All I remember is a room in a hotel in Cairo, a man with a blue turban, the police. I became panic-stricken. There was a fight, a shot, and then the arrest. And the talk about the black market. I don't know what that means. Mary, you look so strange. For heaven's sake, what's the matter? Don't touch me. Don't touch you. I'm your husband. Oh, you're not my Oh, husband. darling, darling. I, I can't pretend. You're not Scotty. You're not. I'm... I'm not Scotty. Amira, stop this hysteria at once. What do you mean, I'm not Scotty? It's a trick. It's a cruel hoax. I think you're serious. Called me. Tell them I know. Mira, what have they done to you? Said to you? I could ask you those questions. And I could also ask you, who are you? Who am... 
This is crazy. Let me see your birthmark. What? All right, look. It's me, Dolly. You know that's real. But I... I... Let me see the wallet. You mean this? There it is. Your picture. Even the stitching I had done when I, I wouldn't throw it away. You, you remember, darling? It is the wallet. It, it, it looks just like it. What did you expect? Well, they could fake it. They have ways. A wallet could be faked. Look, Mira, I don't understand all this. But I am your husband. I am Scotty. Let me prove it to you. Ask me anything about us, anything. Oh, where did we go last summer? To Paris for two weeks. We stayed at the Hotel George V. What did we do when we first got there? We opened the window and sang a silly song about Paris. We made it up as we went along, and then... And then I kissed you. We were alone. No one could have seen. We went out, had a drink. You ordered champagne in the afternoon. <laughs> the waiter tried to talk you out Stop of it. Stop it! Stop it! I don't know how you know these things. Oh, darling, it can't darling. Be. I, I saw you only a few hours ago at home. But I was on the plane. You saw that. You were home. home. All right, all right, darling, if you say so. Take it easy, honey. Don't cry. Don't, don't. There, now, if you say Scotty was at home, then that's where I was. Home. Home. <laughs> got the reports from Cairo, Chief. Complete? As complete as they'll ever be. They just came in via high-frequency telebox, and we had photo prints made. Here they are. Never mind. Just give me the highlights. Well, the man in the blue turban was Mustafa Cornelius. He made his living in art, sold pictures and things. What was he doing in Scotty's room? Oh, probably picking up some stuff. You know, the place was filled with pictures. Yeah, and Scotty said he doesn't know how they got there. He said that even when we showed him Egyptian police reports that he and Mustafa had been followed for two days. And on several occasions, Scotty was carrying pictures himself. So he was lying. No, he wasn't. We gave him a lie detector test and he came through 100%. I didn't know that. But it's true. And why was Scotty in Cairo anyway? He had no orders to go there. How do you explain he that? He didn't. He said he couldn't remember. Well, this is one for the books. Sounds like two other guys. That's not so funny. What do you mean that's not so funny? When Scotty got off the plane and came in here, I turned on the intercom and left him and Mirror together. I listened to their conversation from the outer office. Learn anything? I don't know. Except that Mira seemed to doubt it was Scotty. Now, now, wait a minute. It was Scotty. I know it was Scotty, and you know it was Scotty. But why wouldn't Scotty's own wife know it was Scotty? No, I don't know. I don't either. Two other guys, huh? Well, we know that the Scotty who got off the plane is safely locked up in this building. You and I are going to see his wife and try to figure this puzzle out. Come on. Hello, Mira. Mr. Enright. I want to talk to you. Close the door, Paul. Right. You, 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 you shouldn't have come here. Why not? I have some questions to ask you. I'm expecting someone. Please go. It'll only take a few minutes, Mira. I want to help Scotty, but I can't do it alone. I'll come to your office. But the chief wants some answers now, Mrs. Douglas. Oh, then come in here. Thanks. When my visitor comes, I must ask you to stay in here. Of course. I'm sorry to have disturbed you like this, but there are some very strange things about this man. Strange? I'm... What do you mean, strange? Why didn't you believe that was Scotty in my office? Then he told you that he isn't Scotty. He told me nothing. I listened in. And it was Scotty. It's the Scotty I know. Now, why don't you believe that? That's one of the things that puzzles me. One of the strange things. Where's Scotty now? That's your doorbell. The person you're expecting. Where's Scotty He's now? He's at the detention house in a cell. Why aren't you answering the door? Uh, you stay here. Uh, please stay here until I get back. Chief, she's as nervous as a radar scope. Shh, quiet. Put your ear to the door and listen. Hello, darling. Hello, Scott. It's a man. Can't make out what they're saying. Something vaguely familiar. Oh, no, it can't be. What do you mean, Chief? Take your gun. All right, now, just don't move. Hello, Chief. Mary was just telling me you were here. Scotty, I don't know how you did it. 
But escaping from detention is a very serious... I didn't escape. I've never been there. I've never been to Cairo. I don't know what's going on, Enright, but I'm glad you're here so this whole mess can be cleared up. Just don't move, Scotty. Get on the audio phone, Paul. Yes, sir. Call headquarters, have them check on Scotty. Right. Scotty, you and I have been friends for ten years. Now, what kind of a game are you playing? I don't think friends hold a gun. But what do you want me to do, let you get away again? Mr. Enright, I told you... No, you're as mixed up as I am. Admit it. You see, Scotty, I overheard the conversation you and Mira had at headquarters. But I wasn't there. Let's not argue about it. We'll know in a moment. Hey, Chief. Yes, what is it? I talked to headquarters, Chief. Well? Scotty, you're still there in a cell. What? Still there? Now, wait a minute. That's what they said. Get them to put Scotty on the phone. Yes, sir. We'll get to the bottom of this pretty quickly now. Let's go into the other room. Come on. Yeah, the chief wants to talk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all right. Call the line. The chief wants to talk to you. Here he is. Keep them covered. Hello? Yes, Chief. That you, Scotty? Yes, sir. I just wanted to be sure. Chief, what on earth is going on? You don't have to talk to me to be sure. Not when you've got me locked in a cell that dynamite couldn't blow up. Okay, over. Scotty. Scotty. Who are you talking to? To Scott Douglas, who got off the plane from Cairo this morning. But I'm Scott Douglas. Chief, have you seen Mira? I want to talk to her again. Just hang on a moment. Now, just repeat after me. I am Scott Douglas of the World Security Police. Now, look, you... Oh, all right. I am Scott Douglas of the World Security Police. Okay, let's hear you say that. Chief, are you crazy? Say what I tell you. I am Scott Douglas of the World Security Police. They sound exactly alike. Now what do I do, sing Mother McCree? What you do is what you've been doing all day. You wait for me in your cell. And you're coming along with me. What are you going to do? Mrs. Douglas, I'm going to take you and your husband to meet your husband. He's out here, Chief. Bring him in. Mira, Scotty, you stand over there. All right, Chief. Now, once and for all, tell... Mira. Oh, darling, I'm glad... Good Lord. Mr. Enright, I... I can't believe it. It's absolutely incredible. He looks just like me. What is this, Chief? What is... Have either of you two ever seen each other before? Every morning in the mirror. What kind of a gag is it? Now, be quiet, both of you. Yes, Chief. Have you got those reports? About two minutes. Let me know. Now, one of you two is an imposter. I will say this. The resemblance is fantastic. You, the one we had in the cell. We got your fingerprints, teeth identifications, birthmark, and so on when you were arrested. They all verified that you are the real Scott Douglas. I've told you that all along. I'm Scott Douglas. Chief, whatever is going on here... We'll know who you are in a few minutes. We'll have the results of the fingerprint and identification check we had you take before I brought Scotty up from downstairs. Yes? I've got the report, Chief. Well? Everything checks, sir. Now, come on, talk sense, will you? What do you mean, everything checks? Fingerprints, teeth identification, birthmarks, everything checks, sir. They're both Scott Douglas. All right. Now, remember, don't interrupt me. The only way I can tell you two apart is by the clothes you wear. You... You're wearing a tropical suit, the one you had on when we picked you up in Cairo. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to call you Tropical. And you with the Tweed, that's your name, Tweed. Is that clear? Right, Chief. The last two hours of questioning has revealed that the memory of your lives is exactly the same up to four days ago. Whatever questions you were asked separately, you both answered the same. Intimate questions, family questions, every kind. But as of four days ago, the police interrogators report that you, Tropical... You are hazy, almost blank, until the arrest and murder in Cairo. That's right, sir. On the other hand, you, Tweed, you have a clear memory except for a few hours three days ago. Now, here, let me read it. Pursuant to file 198, I was ordered to visit a Mr. David Eitner, suspected of dealing in black market paintings at 223 West 18th Street, and to pose as a buyer of rare paintings. Mr. Eitner conducted himself in a reasonable and normal manner and exhibited several paintings, allegedly genuine old masters. During our conversation, I heard a faint oscillating sound in the room and inquired whether it was the air conditioning unit. And then I blacked out. Now, at this point, your two memories separate. You both remember everything up to the moment Scott Douglas blacked out. 
But after that, Tweed's memory does not pick up until two hours has passed. Then he reports, The next thing I knew, I awoke lying on the floor. I thought I had been slugged, but subsequent examination by police medical authority showed no injury of any sort. The assumption was that I had fainted, but no reason for this possibility was advanced. The paintings, together with Mr. Eitner, were nowhere to be found when I regained consciousness. Subsequent police investigation failed to reveal any trace of Mr. Eitner or his paintings. So, there it is. And you, Tropico, you remember nothing for the next several days until we picked you up in Cairo. I remember that report very well. I wrote it. But he couldn't have known about the first part of that report. I went alone, no one else. I was there. That was my report. Stop it, you two. It's bad enough seeing double without you two talking double and remembering double. Two hours. Two hours. What happened in those two hours? Chief, I've got an idea. What is it? Probably nothing to it after three days, but why don't we visit 223 West 18th Street again? Let's see whether Mr. Eitner possibly left something behind when he fled with the paintings. This is the place. Looks pretty empty now. This is where he had several old paintings hanging on the wall. This is where I was standing when I blacked out. That's right, Chief. I walked over there from here and then it happened. What's that? That sound? Came from over there. That closet. Come on. Come out of there. Come on or I'll shoot. Do not shoot, Sahib. No, do not kill me. Who are you? Do not kill me, Sahib. What are you doing here in this room? Talk. Talk. Do not kill me, Sahib. I beg you. If you don't talk, I make no promises. I have children. I have a wife. And I've got a gun. Well? If I talk, you let me live. Talk. I come to destroy the instrument. What instrument? It is in here, Sahib. The instrument of Mustafa Cornelius. The man in the blue turban. I swear to come back and destroy it if he ever died. It is built into this closet behind the secret panel. It make Mustafa and me very rich. Let's see that instrument. Open the panel. Looks like a control board. What does it do? I do not know the words to describe it. Only Mustafa knew because he was very wise and very scientific. You know how to operate this? Oh, yes, Sahib. Mustafa showed me what to do, and I work long hours doing that, for I was both becoming very rich. Show us what it does. And remember, if any danger results, this man has a gun. You'll be the first to die. I understand, Sahib. Give me something for the instrument. What do you mean, give you something? I tried to explain. Give me something, a picture, perhaps... There are no pictures here. Then a ring, perhaps a watch, or a shoe, uh, a dog, anything. Does this make any sense? Play along with them, Chief. Here, here's a ring and a watch. Thank you, Sahib. I place them in here and close this small door. I turn on the instrument... That's the sound. The sound I heard. He's right, Chief. The sound before I blacked out. Now, what do you do? A moment until the bell sound. It is finished. Now, you see. There are now two watches, two rings. Let me see them. Great dynamos of Niagara. They're exactly alike. Even to the scratches, the the dirt marks, everything. Let me see them. You're right. Identical. Perfect copies. No, no, Sahib. They are not copies. All are original. But that can't be. The ones I gave you were the originals. The others are the copies. That's right. Uh, just a minute, Chief. Look at this marking. Molecular duplicator. What did you say? 
Molecular duplicator? That's right. That means that somehow... Well, it's possible theoretically, but it means that the molecules and atoms of the originals are perfectly duplicated. And we know that if somehow the atoms and molecules could be exactly arranged, you'd actually have two originals, where only one existed before. Yes, yes, Sahib. That is what Mustafa say. Those are the words that I do not know how to use. All right, now listen to me, you desert rat. Does this machine work on anything other than inanimate objects? Inanimate I do not understand, Sahib. Does it work on living things, dogs, birds? Human beings? It has worked on a dog, Sahib. Mustafa, he had a dog he liked so much. He make himself another dog like it with this instrument. Then, then it would work on human beings too. But the dog, one of them, I do not know which one of them. The dog, he died. Very horribly, Sahib. What do you mean, died horribly? One day, about a month after the first dog become two dogs, one day, the dog bark and whine. It is in agony, Sahib. And before my eyes, it... I, I do not know how to say. It, it is disappear slowly, as if it fall apart. And in a little while, there is nothing left. Nothing. Molecular disintegration. On living flesh, the effect of the machine lasts only a limited time. Chief. Which one of us? Him? Or me? Which one of us is Scott Douglas? Next week, 2000 Plus presents another exciting melodrama from the world of tomorrow. For thrilling, for thrillers that are different, join us again next week and every week. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and with Olson Productions, Incorporated. In today's cast, Ralph Bell portrayed Scotty, Joan Shea was Mira, Nat Poland was the chief, and Gilbert Mack was the Arab. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Sound, Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner. Engineer, Ed Formica. This is Ken Marvin speaking. Thousand Plus is a regular presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years. On a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X... X, 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 X minus... 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 One... 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 Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life... Intelligent life in some strange form that we can only imagine. Will we be welcomed with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday, a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now hear this, now hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits. Stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. Mr. Lustig. What do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. Steady as she goes, Mr. Lustig. As she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1,000. Radar indicates a level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. Four. 350. Three. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. the power. Masters, pipe battle stations. I said All secured, sir. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're now on Mars, April 20th, 1987, 433 Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, masters. I said Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. The first manned ship from Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. The next few hours should tell the story. 
And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. An inspection, Captain? Now? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now I hear this. Landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. It's now landing time minus five. Well, they're paging us. Uh, you ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I will ever be. Come on. Let's get in the lock. Hingston, Lustig, and Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. The captain will join you. Four minutes to go. At least the captain would get here. What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah, I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? I offer you, Horst. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? I've been giving it some thought. It'll be very interesting to find out. A very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you uh, find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they may have developed far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way up? After all, we are invaders. Now I hear this. Landing time minus two. All right, all right, we heard this. You know what I'd like to find outside that airlock? Good old Illinois. Ever been there, Rusty? Uh, only Chicago. You ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. <laughs> Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint it another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. Oh, tough. No, oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, masters, you can button it up now. I I sit. Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not rewarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well... 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters. Aye, sir. Battle stations are to be manned until we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. Aye, sir. Fresh air. Let's go. All right, now, take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything from this ground, Mr. Quiet. We don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the... Quiet. Captain, I can swear that... That sounds like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. Very homely but unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Hingston. Aye, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Aye, sir. What do you make of the ground, horse? Grass. 
plain grass. You can see some large foliage there where the mist's thinned out. What the... Reach them! Hold your fire, you fool! I hit it, Captain! What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the tracers, but it's still standing. Come on, Horst. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> it's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. Well, that... That's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars... Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's... It's beautiful Ohio. Oh, it can't be, sir. Horst. Horst, do you think that civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that porch swing of the piano and, and beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black... This looks like the town I was born in. Well, it it looks like my hometown, too. I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lustig. Oh, how else can you explain it? Suppose some scientists got together. They, they, they invented some spaceship and, and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. Been space travel, it couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps we might find out, Captain. The light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. I see. All right. Come on, horse. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. And there's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Are you sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If you're selling anything, it's much too early. No, 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 wait just a minute. What what town is this? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, no. We're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet, Earth. This is Mars. Now do you understand Mars? You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now go away. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. I call my husband. Now you go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Horst, is it possible that we got fouled up, made made some tremendous blunder, circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, it, this won't hold water. It's... It's not logical. We've, we we checked every mile. We went past the moon, out into space. We're, we're on Mars. Lustig out at point. Hingston in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. I said. First, there, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain. What? That, that, that house down the street, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought of... I never thought of... Thank God! Lustig! Lustig, come back here! He's running for that house. That crazy fool. After him, quick! Lustig, stop! Come down off of that porch! Stand up! Stand up! What the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! Oh, Grandma! Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what is going on here? Albert, it's, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. It's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig! Oh, Captain, uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfather. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is a friend of ours. <laughs> How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now, don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again, that's all. You mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. 
And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Well, I... Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I, I want to talk to my grandfather. Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. I see. Now, let's go. Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. <laughs> The ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration! They've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard set. You! You, Master! Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. He's not a bad guy for an officer. Upper Hingston! Uh, uh, what's it? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. I, uh, oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Hingston! I'll be right back, Captain Uncle George. Uncle George. What the devil is Don't going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. They're, they're all here. You're right, Captain. I found it. The whole crew's out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Captain in an order. You don't understand, Captain. I understand, Newtony. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. Johnny! Johnny! What? Johnny, you old son of a gun! It's you. Edward. Yes. It can't be. Oh, of course it is. Johnny, Johnny, Ed. you old... <laughs> Ed, what... Dr. Horst, this is my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to, to see you, Edward. <laughs> Look, I've... I've got to get back to my ship. Oh, Johnny, wait. I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too. Mom and Dad are alive? Then... Then you're real, Ed. Well, of course. Don't I feel real? How's <laughs> <laughs> that, huh? <laughs> Why, Ed! Ed! <laughs> we, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, no, Captain. I have nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Why, sure. Horst, Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. <laughs> By George, 35 years. So don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horace. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, eh? Huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horace. All three of our boys in the service. Yeah, Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific, too. What did happen, Ed? <laughs> What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. Next rocket coming out to Mars. Oh. Well, little Will, when does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September, but uh -huh. it depends on what we report. Oh, oh, yeah. There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christmas together again. That'll be something. Sure yes. will, yes, sirree. Well, uh, this calls for a celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's just a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomena. Oh, that's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. I have not had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Horst. What? Oh, I'll get it. That's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Nonsense. You stay the night. Uh, we insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Well, I'll be all right. Well, 
Good night. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. Uh, a message from Anna. Anna? I don't... Well, there, she must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? Uh, I don't... You sure it was for me? I don't remember any, Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who knew you at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you have to stay over. Yes, well, but... that uh... settles it, then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Yeah, but, Johnny, we thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you're used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the day bed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. Be plenty of time for talking, Ed. <laughs> yes, I... I guess so. Well, I suppose I better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed... Security check. What, why do you have to do that here? I, I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, suppose we skip it tonight, huh? Well, good night, everybody. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Black, hmm? You asleep? No, no, I've... I've been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians. All the time there was only Mom and Dad and... and Edward waiting. Now, it's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. You know, I've been thinking about Martians, too. Hmm? Captain, just suppose... Suppose there were Martians, no. and they saw us land, and suppose they thought of us as invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs, huh? Oh, I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first, huh? To wipe out all suspicion, to make us feel at home. Captain, mm. suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images, stolen from our own memories by Martians, created for us by telepathy. Hypnotist. Oh, that's, that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory, no real love person, not even my mother. I don't remember her. Only the piles of rotting corpses of Dachau. There was no happy emotion for these people to recreate. How about that phone call? Anna? Yes, Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remember. When I was freed from Dachau, sick, delirious... I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care of me. Well, there you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd been nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her, by reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horace. Why? A whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house, sleeping. Trust me. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a perfect trap, Captain. Who would suspect his own mother? His grandparents? How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But... We've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen. The crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to whatever they really are. All right, careful. Where are you going, John? Ahead. We, uh, we wanted to drink of water. That, that's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a His drink. His face! It's changing! He's a marshal! Run, horse! Run! You can't get away, John! This way, horse! Horse! Where are you? Ah! Hello! Hello! Can you hear me, Earth? This, this is Captain John Black, the XR-53 calling for Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now, the Martians. I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hingston, Lustig, Dr. Horst, poor Horst, he didn't even reach the door. Listen, listen. They're trying to break through the hull. 
Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks. But, but they're changing now. They're, they're melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand? Martians, not men. They, they made us think that Mars was heaven and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Listen, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother not to come. They'll trap him, too. They'll kill them all. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Tonight, X-1 has brought you the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horst. With Bill Zuckert as Masters, Bill Lipton as Hingston, Margaret Berlin as the old lady, Bill Griffiths as Edward, Ken Williams as Lustig, Ethel Everett as Mom, and Edwin Jerome as Dad. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Wayne as a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Minus one. 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 High above the windy blue skies of Earth, slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. On Earth's moon, a quarter of a million miles beyond Star Lab, Omega General Industries have uncovered the corroded hull of an ancient spacecraft during a lunar mining operation. Excavating further, they discover the mummified bodies of 50 extraterrestrial humanoids and a strange statue made of jet black crystal. Mining Operations Director Ray Farrell contacts the science complex at Lunar Base 12. Uh, Roger, Omega General, Mine Pit 15, 9 kilometers due north of Plavius. A research team is on the way. Don't touch anything until they get there. The Lunar Base 12 standing by. Two hours later, Professor Victor Conrad and his research team arrive at the excavation. They finish their preliminary investigation at 0830 the next morning. How's it going, Professor? Well, the spacecraft's been under the lunar surface for close to a thousand years. And the aliens were killed by something that turned their eyes and nervous systems into black crystal. Black crystal? Like the statue? The body samples and the statue samples are identical. Well, what do you make of that damn statue anyway? The thing gives me the creeps. I've seen that image a hundred times, Mr. Farrell, carved in stone on most of the Gothic cathedrals of Europe. It's a gargoyle, a supposedly mythical creature that symbolizes ultimate spiritual evil. A thousand-year-old alien spacecraft buried beneath the lunar surface, and with it, a four-foot-tall gargoyle made of black crystal. Mysteries from a forgotten time, waiting for a solution, as part one of the ISA conspiracy, The Darkbringers, takes us from the bright side of the moon into the unearthly light and shadow of alien worlds. Lunar Base 12 to Star Lab Control. This is Star Lab. Go ahead. Professor Conrad is standing by for Dr. Cassidy. She's right here, Professor. More, I have the statue arrived here. It'll be here in about a half an hour. We heard from the shuttle a few minutes ago. How is it being transported to Earth? We've got an SET cruiser standing by. Well, tell them to be careful with it, Mara. When we ran the thermal tests, it started to emit an ultraviolet glow that had all of us hallucinating. Hallucinating? What do you mean? For a 
few minutes there, we thought the statue was coming to life. Scared the pants off of us. Coming to life? How did you get it to stop radiating? Well, Arthur had the presence of mind to shut down the thermal generators, but the statue was still about 10% active at room temperature. We finally sealed it in a small liquid oxygen pot. As long as it's kept cold, it's completely inert. We'll be careful with it, Victor. Anything else? Yes, we're going to continue experimenting with the statue samples we've kept here. I'm setting up a photon saturation test now, and I'd like to interface our data terminals with your Mycroft computer so you can monitor the tests from there. Good, no problem, Victor. What will you need? A couple of standard mode multiplexer channels should do it. All right, I'll see to it right away. And Mora, would you mind setting up a visual link? Just in case. Just in case of what? I am not sure, but this whole business with the statue has everyone on edge around here. Even though it is gone, something about it is still here. Something quiet and dark. Something invisible that waits in silent shadow, watching. Something the pilot and co-pilot of the lunar shuttle carrying the statue are unaware of. Well, you'd better go ahead and start the pre-ignition cycle for the retros. It looks like we picked up about three minutes when I cleared the booster nozzles. Three minutes, 18 seconds to be exact. It just came up on the ETA monitor. I'll let Starlab know we're going to be... Oh, hello. Meteorite puncture. Right through number four cargo bay. I was just as an Ardalu. Oh, boy. How big's the hole? A little over three centimeters, according to the hull sensor. About the size of a marble. Marble, huh? Steely, cat's eye, or shooter? What? <laughs> Technical talk, Frank. I guess you didn't shoot marbles when you were a kid. <laughs> no, I lost mine by the time I was 13. <laughs> Give me my helmet. I'll go back and seal up that hole. Yeah. Yeah, well, the closest I ever got to marbles after that was Chinese checkers. Do you still play? Oh, once in a while. Well, let's have a game or two when we get to Starlight. <laughs> oh, all right. Five bucks a game. Make it ten and you're on. Sold. Lunar Shuttle 19 to Star Lab. Star Lab, go ahead. We're making better time than I thought. Our revised ETA is 10 minutes, 10 seconds. Roger. Your new docking coordinates are 08 Alpha. Approach vector 292. Thanks, Star Lab. How's it going back there, Lou? The meteorite sheared the top off the pond with a statue in it. The liquid oxygen is leaking out. Well, I told you it wasn't our day. Have you sealed the hole? In the hole, yeah. There's not much I can do about the pod. Well, they said to keep the statue on ice. Tell you what, flood the hole with chill vapor from the fire control system. That should keep it cold enough until we duck. Frank, there's something moving around back here. Well, uh, what is it? I don't know. It, it's hard to see anything through the chill vapor. <laughs> An ancient shadow creature is loose aboard Lunar Shuttle 19. The sound of its unearthly fury merges with a terrified scream of co-pilot Lou Stratton. Then, silence. Pilot Frank Hollister activates the visual scanner in Cargo Bay 4. Lou! Firing the shuttle's booster rockets, he accelerates toward the safety of Star Lab, bringing with him the demon spirit of an alien world. bodies of 50 extraterrestrial humanoids and a black crystal gargoyle have been found buried beneath the surface of the moon. 
the gargoyle is taken to the science complex at Lunar Base 12, where during a routine thermal experiment, it begins to radiate an ultraviolet glow that causes terrifying hallucinations. Discovering that the statue is inert when cold, Professor Victor Conrad seals it into a liquid oxygen pod and sends it to Star Lab aboard Lunar Shuttle 19. Ten minutes away from the giant space station, the hull of the shuttle is penetrated by a tiny meteorite that splits open the statue's pod. The shuttle's co-pilot goes to Cargo Bay 4 to repair the meteorite puncture and is suddenly attacked by something dark and unearthly. It's all there in the flight recorder, Dr. Cassidy. How many times do I have to go through this? This is the last time, Lieutenant, I promise. It won't work. What do you mean? What won't work? All this interrogation, you're not going to trap me into saying anything I haven't said before. Look, no one's trying to trap you. Oh, come on. Who do you think you're kidding? Yesterday it was the security officer, Major Wheeler. Last night it was Dr. Rosser. Today it's you. You're working up a psychological profile on me, right? You're wrong, Lieutenant. None of us had any oh, intention look, of... Lee Stratton was my best friend, Dr. Cassidy. But there just wasn't anything I could do. When did you realize it was too late? When I... When I switched on the visual scanner and saw him hanging upside down from the storage rafter. His face. The look on his face. What else did you see? Oh, the statue sitting there in the corner, looking up at him. Professor Conrad? Yes, I am right here. I've got Star Lab on Scrambler Channel F. It's Dr. Cassidy. Good, good. Patch her through. Victor, Lieutenant Stratton's autopsy report just came off the computer. I have the grid out here in front of me. Anything definite on the cause of death? No, there were too many variables. But the projections range all the way from six kinds of heart failure to terminal neuroinduction. Terminal neuro... You don't mean death by psychic suggestion? Uh, that's what it says here. What about the black crystals in his eyes and nervous system? They're identical to those you took from the bodies of the extraterrestrials. But Mycroft couldn't compute either the source or the structure. What else? His brain. It was 364 grams lighter than the average for a man his age. What about the size? Well, that's what's so strange, Victor. The size wasn't changed at all, just the weight. What do you think? I think I'll go ahead with the experiments on the statue samples we've kept here. I don't know, Victor. The statue arrived at the ISA lab an hour ago. Well, couldn't you at least wait till they've had a chance to look it over? We can't afford to postpone the experiments any longer. Whatever happened on the shuttle might happen again. Besides, we've got a 48-hour head start on ISA. We may as well take advantage of it. All right. Victor, have you come up with anything to explain how the statue got out of the pod? Not unless you're willing to accept the possibility that the statue really isn't a statue at all but some kind of transmorphic creature that feeds off the psychic energy of intelligent beings. Well, I'm going to have to think about that. Good luck with the test. And please, Victor, be careful. We will. You got a minute, Victor? Of course, Rachel. Come on in. We just finished the comparative analysis of the scanner tapes we made of the statue when it was here and the scanner data of the statue transmitted from Star Lab. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for this. We weren't. But the statue's changed. Changed? In what way? Well, the scan made after the shuttle incident shows that it's 60 millimeters taller than it was when it left here. Are you sure? Well, we cross-checked everything. What else? Well, the face. It's not looking straight ahead anymore. It's looking up. 
at an angle of 57 degrees. Go on. The statue's heavier by 364 grams. As the mystery of the black crystal gargoyle deepens, so does the urgency to discover and resolve its supernatural secrets. At Lunar Base 12 Science Complex, Professor Conrad and his research team prepare a photon saturation test on two small crystal samples removed from the statue during an earlier experiment. Rachel, will you please ask Arthur and Misha to meet me in conference room four? I'd like to have a word with them before we start. And you had better join us, too. Right away, Victor. Back aboard Star Lab, preparation of a visual link between Star Lab control and the interior of Professor Conrad's moon laboratory is supervised by Maura Cassidy. Sally, I think the visual feed from Lunar Base should be cross-linked with Mycroft. That way, if something goes wrong with the VTR, we can always retrieve the pictures from the computer. Okay. I'll have it programmed in about 15 minutes. On Earth, the statue arrives at the ISA Research Center and is locked in a refrigerated laboratory vault where ISA technicians begin their own experiments. All right. Let's shave off a couple of two micron specimens and get them under the electron microscope. Hideous damn creature, isn't it? I wonder what it's looking up at. Meanwhile, Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff bank the SET interceptor Solaris away from the freighter convoy they've been escorting to the Timian 3 shipping lanes and jet towards Starland. Did they ever figure out what it was? Not really. Scientific opinion was divided about 70-30. In favor of an alien spacecraft? No, in favor of a meteor. How many people saw the explosion? Well, there were quite a few villages about 500 miles away, and everyone living in them saw it. At that distance? Skipper, when that thing exploded, it lit up the sky as far away as London. And the sky stayed that way for three days and nights. Huh. When did all this happen? 1908. Amazing. Where do you get these books, anyway? Lingrid. The librarian on Starlight. No. She came across this one while she was looking for an Oscar Wilde novel that Mora wanted to read. And what made her think that you'd be interested? The title. It's called The Fire Came By. Star Lab Control to Solaris. Oh, this is Solaris. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, Mara would like to speak with you. Put her on. John, do you have enough fuel to take a side trip to the moon? Buddy? Yeah, we're okay. What do you want us to do, Mora? I've scheduled a conference with Professor Conrad. Pick him up at Lunar Base 12 and bring him here. He's starting an experiment now, but uh, he should be finished by the time you get there. Okay, we'll take care of it, Mora. Hello, buddy. Goodbye, buddy. Cute, Mora. Cute. In the science complex at Lunar Base 12, Professor Conrad places a sample of the statue into a Stellatron Systems PC-80 photon chamber. On Starlab, Mora watches by remote visual link as Professor Conrad seals the chamber, sits down at a control console, and presses a button. Radiant white light illuminates the chamber's observation ports as the needle-thin beams of six neothane zellium lasers penetrate the statue's specimen, a fragment of night chipped from the lightless atmospheres of an alien world. Alien Worlds continues as John and Buddy jet toward the moon aboard the Solaris. Professor Conrad and his research team move into the second stage of their photon saturation test with a black crystal gargoyle specimen. On Star Lab, Mora monitors the experiment by remote visual link. On one screen, a wide-angle interior view of Professor Conrad's moon laboratory. On a second screen, the bright metal pyramid-shaped photon chamber. 
until the spectroscope is starting to shift out of phase. Will you please check it? Right away, Big Jim. Arthur, what was your last refractive index reading? It didn't even register. The crystals are absorbing all coherent light up to 8,000 angstroms. All right. Let's switch over to the neon borazine lasers. Program them for a one milliradian beam, and we'll work our way up from there. All right. How are you doing, Mora? I'm not quite sure. I don't think I should have had whatever that was I had for lunch. I get some pretty weird food around here sometimes. Well, chew a couple of papaya enzyme tablets. They'll fix you up in no time. And if you wish to stretch your legs or anything, you'd better do it now. This next part of the experiment is going to take a while. No, I think I'll just sit here and plan my revenge on the Star Lab chef. <laughs> We're ready, Victor. It looks like intermission's over, Mora. All right, Rachel. Turn them loose. Oh, my God. Victor! Victor! Are you trying to see what's going on? I just saw some telemetry from Lunar Base. Look, there's been an explosion. Jerry, contact the Solaris and tell them to get to Lunar Base 12 as fast as they can. Starlight control to Solaris. Starlight control to Solaris. Sally, get hold of the ISA lab and tell them to stop their experiments with the statue until they hear from me. Uh, this is Solaris. Go ahead, Jerry. I'm on my way. I've got the Solaris, Mara. We're coming up on it now, Mora. Have you had any radio contact with him? No, not a word. Even the microwave safety beacon has stopped transmitting. Skipper. Screen 5. My God, what happened? John, buddy, what is it? What do you see? Mara, Lunar Base 12 no longer exists. What do you mean? It's been blown to pieces, completely leveled. The entire base. Skipper. Screen 6. Buddy, what is it? What's happening? A ship. Just above the horizon. It's moving away from us. Magnify it, buddy. Looks something like an old Tarantula-class gunship. Except it's about five times bigger. Jerry, record this. We're rolling. It's black. Stacked wings angle down about 60 degrees. Yellow markings that look like Cyrillic script, only upside down. Gee, Skipper, what do you make of that? Keep talking, buddy. These short black spikes are starting to bristle out all over the hull. Oh, uh oh Skipper, it's turning around. Mara, stand by. We're going in for a closer look at that ship. Open a close proximity channel, buddy. Let's see if they'll talk to us. You're on, Skipper. This is Earth Ship Solaris. Please identify yourself. Skipper, let's get some altitude before their aim improves. This is Earthship Solaris. Our intentions are not hostile. Please. All right. I'll try it one more time, but that is it. You better let me do it, Skipper. Every time you talk to them, they shoot at us. Solaris, there is still time. Time for what? Escape. From what? Ask your dead brothers and sisters on the wasteland below us. Damn you. You did that? You murdered all those people? But why? They were committing sacrilege. Just who the... Who are you? Disciples. Of what? Lightlessness. I've had about all of this I can take. Hold on, buddy. Skipper, lightning is pouring out of those spikes and crawling all over the hull of their ship. Activate the rest of the laser turrets, buddy. We're going around again. I didn't even phase him, Skipper. That lightning soaked up our lasers like a sponge. We're hit. Flame out on number four thruster. There goes number two. The starboard fuel pods are split open. Skipper, if we don't get out of here now, we'll have to set her down on the moon. I don't want to leave that ship to Starlab. Solaris, we are aware of the thing you name. Don't concern yourself with its safety. It is one of our destinations. Come on, Skipper. It's now or never. Use Dr. 
docking bay four, John. The crash barriers are up and the fire control crew is standing by. John, where's that ship? Right behind us. Turn your seat around, buddy. Here we go. John! Buddy, are you all right? We're okay. Come on, buddy. Let's get out of here. Mara, the alien ship. Screen 10. Listen to me, Starlab. Who are you? I am Stygos, high priest of the Trell. You have stolen the symbol of our redemption. The symbol? The statue? Narl is his rightful name. We have traced him to your moon. We know his presence has graced the machine you live in. Where is he? I don't know. Then take your last look at the stars. The Trell. A race of bloodless shadow beings searching for their symbol of redemption. An icon of lightless crystal representing the dark god Narl. An ancient demon creature creeping through the starless dimensions of alien worlds. of the ISA conspiracy, The Dark Bringers, was written by Ron Thompson. Our cast included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Byron Kane, Charles McGraw, Molly Dodd, and Ernie Anderson. Associate producer, Jeff Allen. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Roger Brossi. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for part two of the ISA Conspiracy on Alien Worlds. of Earth, slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Last week's episode began on Earth's moon, a quarter of a million miles beyond Star Lab, when Omega General Industries uncovered the corroded hull of an ancient alien spacecraft during a lunar mining operation. Carefully widening the excavation, the moon miners find the mummified bodies of 50 extraterrestrial humanoids scattered in grotesque positions around a four-foot-high statue made of glittering black crystal. Two hours later, Professor Victor Conrad and his research team arrive to investigate. Conrad takes the statue to the science complex at Lunar Base 12. 24 hours later, he contacts Dr. Maura Cassidy on Star Lab. Maura, has the statue arrived here? It'll be here in about a half an hour. We heard from the shuttle a few minutes ago. How is it being transported to Earth? We've got an SET cruiser standing by. Well, tell them to be careful, Aunt Maura. When we ran the thermal tests, to emit an ultraviolet glow that had all of us hallucinating. For a few minutes there, we thought the statue was coming to life. We finally sealed it in a small liquid oxygen tank. As long as it's kept cold, it's completely inert. About ten minutes later, the shuttle carrying the statue is penetrated by a tiny meteorite that splits open the statue's pod. And when the shuttle co-pilot goes to Cargo Bay 4... When the shuttle arrives at Star Lab, the co-pilot is found hanging upside down from a storage rafter, dead. And the statue is found outside its shattered pod, staring up at the co-pilot's contorted body. Victor, have you 
come up with anything to explain how the statue got out of the pod? Not unless you're willing to accept the possibility that the statue really isn't a statue at all, but some kind of transmorphic creature that feeds off the psychic energy of intelligent beings. The next morning, Conrad and his research team resume their experiments with the statue samples they've kept at Lunar Base 12. But as Mora sits in Star Lab control, monitoring the interior of Conrad's moon laboratory by remote visual link. Dr. Chastity, what's going on? I just lost our telemetry from Lunar Base. Look, there's been an explosion. Jerry, contact the Solaris and tell them to get to Lunar Base 12 as fast as they can. Lunar Base 12 no longer exists. What do you mean? It's been blown to pieces, completely leveled. Skipper, screen six. Buddy, what is it? What's happening? A ship, just above the horizon. We're hit. The starboard fuel pod split open, and two of its thrusters damaged by laser fire from the alien ship. The Solaris banks away from the moon and makes an emergency landing on Star Lab. A few moments later... Mara, the alien ship, screen 10. Listen to me, Star Lab. I am Stygos, high priest of the Trell. You have stolen the symbol of our redemption. The symbol? The statue? Narl is his rightful name. We have placed him to your moon. We know his presence has graced the machine you live in. Where is he? I don't know. Then take your last look at the stars. Star Lab's confrontation with the trail ship continues as part two of the ISA conspiracy, the Diatones takes us deeper into the mystery of the dark god Narl, an ancient demon creature from the starless dimensions of alien worlds. Wait. Please wait. I know where he is. But if you destroy us, you'll never find him. Because I'm the only one who does know. The secret of Narl's whereabouts is not yours to keep. And the lives of the 200 men and women at Lunar Base 12 were not yours to take. They were violating the sanctity of Narl by subjecting the fragments of his being to the light. But they didn't know they were doing anything wrong. No, is not a merciful divinity in the sense that you understand mercy. Neither is he forgiving in the sense that you understand forgiveness. But there's nothing about innocence to forgive. Where is he? I don't know. Suffer the darkness unto you. Mora! Mora! Mora, what the hell is happening to her? Don't touch her! Don't touch her! Buddy, you're not on alert. Which one? Which button? Sector 4, buddy. The yellow one. Mora, Mora, don't try to Just lie still. This is Medical 4. Stay where you are. An emergency unit is on the way. Jerry, your hands. Are you all right? Uh, I, I guess so. What happened? Well, she was watching the screen, talking to the alien. And then the screen threw off a tremendous burst of color. And then the lightning was all over her. It was so cold. It burned my hands. John? I'm right here, Mora. And so is Buddy. Dr. Rossiter's on her way. John, I'm lying. Sightless, visionless.
motionless, unseen, Mora's eyes eclipsed by a light-hearing intruder from an alien world. from a visual scanner screen in Starlab control. Filaments of sub-zero lightning lash out and curl around Mora, freezing her in a painful web of cold, crawling electricity. A web Stygos has somehow spun from his ship, which lurks near Starlab like a huge, dark spider. When the lashing ribbons of lightning finally release her, Mora falls blind. Your blindness is just a warning, Mora. How long it lasts depends upon how soon you tell me where Narl is. Shut down all the transmitter frequencies, Jerry. Now run a check on Screen 10's receiver circuits. Whatever they use must have come in through the outside lens. Okay. What are you going to do, Mora? They find out where the statue is. God knows how many more people they'll kill. I can't tell them. I just can't. Are you sure? Yes. No. I don't know. Why does everything depend on me? Can't anyone else make a decision? John, the receiver circuits on screen 10 are completely burned out. Okay. Shut the lures and all the outside scanner lenses. They're closed. Oh, Dr. Rossiter, am I ever glad to see you. Oh, Diane, Mara, what happened? I've been blinded. Oh, my dear God. There's a hostile alien ship outside. It fired some kind of energy beam in through one of the scanner screen lenses. All right, Mara. Now, let's have a look. I'm shining the light directly into your eyes. Can you see it? No. But I think I can feel it. I'm taking the light away. Now. I'm shining it into your eyes again. Yes. Yes, I can feel it. Let's get her on the stretcher and take her up to sick bay. Take her first. Okay. Jerry, Easy. you better have Dr. Rossiter take a look at your hands. No, I'm okay now. What do we do now, Mora? Tell Stigos you know where the statue is. But explain that it's going to take time to get it back here. If that doesn't work, use our photon injectors on his ship. Maybe they'll be able to do what the laser cannons on the Solaris couldn't. I'll contact Commissioner White and tell him what's going on. Now, well, come on, Diana. Communications first, and then sit back. Sound general quarters, Jerry. Okay, open a close proximity frequency. Let's see how good we are at telling the big lie. Stigos, this is Captain Graydon. Have you made a decision? Yes, we've decided to give you the statue. Our sensors indicate that Narl is no longer aboard your machine. No, he isn't, uh, but we've contacted the laboratory where he was taken, and our scientists are sending him back. You're lying, Captain Graydon. We've monitored no transmissions. Close the channel, Jerry. Now open number eight scanner lens and project a target grid onto the screen. All right, interface the coordinates of this ship with our photon injectors. We have a target interlock. Stand by. And for God's sakes, keep away from the screen. Four, three, two, one. No good, Skipper, no good. Their force field is deflecting everything. The ship's coming around. Jerry, shut down screen. Too late. There. The lightning. It stopped. What happened? Jerry, let's see what's going on. Skipper, the ship's moving away from us. Buddy, look. What is it? Magnify it, Jerry. My God. It's a city. A floating city.
as the black metal insect ship of the trail stalks away into the dark distances of deep space. A huge floating platform appears and slowly moves towards Starlab. On the platform, a dazzling architectural phantasm, a dream city of white crystal towers, transparent steel minarets, gleaming arches, and pale metal domes. As John, Buddy, and Jerry stand silently in Starlab control, watching the approach of the shining mirage-like metropolis, Mora tries desperately to contact Commissioner White at the ISA Command Center on Earth. I'm sorry, Dr. Cassidy, but it's a top security conference. Commissioner White left strict orders that he wasn't to be disturbed. Listen, you, we've got an emergency situation up here. I'm only following orders. Yeah, right, that's what they all say. Now, Mora, if you don't change your tune, I'm going to be forced to stick a tranquilizer syringe in your backside. ISA, please have him contact me as soon as possible. I will, Dr. Cassidy. ISA, out. If I could only see. Mora, we haven't even examined you yet. And already you're acting like a poor little orphan child who's got herself lost in the woods. I am? <laughs> yes, you am. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself now. We have too much to do. Attention all Starlab personnel. The emergency alert is terminated. Stand down from general quarters and return to your stations. Dr. Cassidy, please contact Captain Graydon and Starlab Control. John, it's Mara. What's happening? The troll ship has broken off its attack and left the area. What did you do to get him to back off? It wasn't anything we did. It was something else. What? A city. A what? A floating city. Are you serious? Mora, he's serious. It's holding a position two kilometers off Star Lab. A huge space platform with a fantastic white city built on it. It looks like something out of a futuristic Arabian Nights. I'll be right there. Come on, Diana, take me back up to the bridge. Still out there? Has moved an inch. Oh, Mora. It's so beautiful. Are you here, Jerry? I'm right here. Please open a close proximity frequency. Go ahead, Mora. This is Dr. Mara Cassidy. Would you please identify yourself? Dr. Mara Cassidy. Which of those three names do you have the greatest affection for? Uh, Mora. We are the Deodons, Mora. And we inhabit the star city of Imbria. I am Phaedra, Sky Priestess of the Before Time. We know your machine has experienced an encounter with the Trell. Did Stygos harm you? Yes. Yes, he did. I'm blind. Can you feel the light on your eyes? Oh, yes. Yes, I can. Then it will be my pleasure to restore your sight. It will? Of course. We have no vehicles of our own, so transport yourself here to Imbria. A projection of light will guide you. I'll be waiting. Oh, oh yes. Jerry, do you recall the short-range vehicle hangar and tell them to get a shuttle ready? John, Bonnie, Diana, let's go to Embryo. Embryo. A fantasy of gleaming crystal and bright transparent metal. A construct of light and serenity and magic. A floating star city, casting its radiance over all who grope their way along the blind corridors of alien worlds. Inside the white crystal city of Embria, which floats two kilometers beyond Starlab, Phaedra kneels in her meditation chamber 
listening to a sky mantra, the Diatan healing music she will use to restore Mora's sight. On Star Lab, Mora, John, Buddy, and Dr. Diana Rossiter enter the short range vehicle hangar and move toward the shuttle that will take them to Imbria. How's it going, Bobby? You might as well get aboard, John. We'll have her fueled in another ten minutes. Aboard the Black Trail insect ship, Stigos, alone in his quarters, receives a message from his tracking systems officer. Stigos, what do you want? As our ship withdrew from Star Lab, we monitored a transmission. It was the voice of the female who received the transmission. A laboratory on Earth. Ultra Chorus. That laboratory is our new destination. Meanwhile, at the ISA laboratory, Commissioner White and Julian Benedict, head of the World Council's Experimental Weapons Section, are debating over which of their two organizations should have possession of the Black Crystal statue now. Matthew, if we can take the energy that statue puts out and incorporate it into some of our experimental thought weapon hardware, we'll be years ahead of everyone else in that area. Don't you see the advantage of that? No, Julian, I don't. This is a science complex and not an arsenal. Matthew, weapons development is as much a part of science as molecular biology or celestial mechanics. Is it? When was the last time you heard of someone being killed by a microscope or a mathematical equation? The bomb started out as a mathematical equation, didn't it? Yes, and so did triple-yield agriculture and antibiotics and space flight. The bomb was created within the reality of a global war, Julian. That reality no longer exists, and I see no reason to encourage its return. The last thing we need is a repetition of the arms race of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Didn't the petroleum war teach you anything? That had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with this, Julian, and you know it. I want that statue. Julian, do you believe in the evolution of human consciousness? Of course I do. And what about immortality? Do you believe in that? Yes, I suppose so. Then would you mind telling me of what use weapons are to evolution and of what use war is to immortality? I didn't come here to discuss abstract philosophy. The statue stays here, Julian. Do you know what this is, Matthew? I haven't the slightest idea. It's a World Council directive signed by the Secretary, ordering you to release the statue to my section. Julian, we both know your section is being phased out. Why are you going through all this? It won't be phased out for another year. But if I can help it, it won't be phased out at all. After all, what if the statue should fall into the wrong hands? What would be our defense against it? Can I see that directive? Thanks. You'll have to excuse me now, Julian. I have things to do. And stay away from my people. I've already given them orders not to cooperate with you. As far as you're concerned, I'm the ISA, and this is between us. What is this, Matthew? Some kind of conspiracy? Yes, it is, Julian. A conspiracy of my values against yours. Everyone strapped in? Wait, wait a minute, buddy. Maura, shouldn't that strap go over instead of under? What strap? The one you're sitting on. Oh, I was wondering what that was. <laughs> Better? Yes, thanks, Diane. Okay, buddy. Let's run it down. Navigation and thrust vector systems. Check. Attitude gyros. Locked. Service propulsion and reaction control systems. Positive. Commissioner White on B channel. Thanks, Jerry. Punch him in, buddy. What's going on up there? More than I ever thought possible. How soon can you get here? Well, it all depends. Does it have anything to do with the statue? It has everything to do with the statue. All right, I'll leave right away. Now, where were we? 
Uh, ignition, Skipper? <laughs> Don't mind if I do. As John, Buddy, Mora, and Dr. Rossiter jet toward the Diaton Star City, Imbria, Commissioner White enters the short-range vehicle dome near the ISA laboratory and boards a priority shuttle. Five minutes later, the shuttle is towed from the dome to launch pad six. Then, as the setting sun slowly erases the day, the shuttle lifts off and disappears into the darkening sky, racing toward Starland on twin streams of fire. Meanwhile, 550 kilometers above and 400 kilometers south of the ISA laboratory, the Black Trail insect ship enters the Earth's ionosphere. We are approaching the laboratory, Stegos. Have precautions been taken? Our impulse deflectors will confuse the echo patterns of any detection beam that touches us. We will appear to them only as a flaw mirage. Leave me now. I sense that you are restless now, but be patient. The disciples are near. The deliverance is at hand. A Conspiracy, The Diatons, was written by Ron Thompson. Our cast included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Lucy Taylor, Michael Rye, Francis Bay, Robert W. Morgan, and Ernie Anderson. Associate producer Jeff Allen, music director Tom Rounds, engineer Stu Jacobs, assistant to the producer Roger Brossi. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so until next, inviting you to join us for The Light Storm, the conclusion of the ISA conspiracy on Alien Worlds. of Earth, slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Last week's episode continued with an attack on Star Lab by an alien ship commanded by Stygos, high priest of the Trell, a race of bloodless shadow beings searching for their lost symbol of redemption, an ancient Black Crystal Gargoyle. Narl is his rightful name. We have placed him to your moon. We know his presence has graced the machine you live in. Where is he? I don't know. Suffer the darkness until you do. Suddenly, a burst of color erupts from the screen displaying the alien ship. Filaments of sub-zero lightning lash out and curl around Mora, freezing her in a painful web of cold, crawling electricity. When the lashing ribbons of lightning finally release her, Mora staggers back and falls. Your blindness is just a warning, Mora. How long it lasts? Depends upon how soon you tell me where Narl is. But before Stygos can press his attack, a new image appears on a second scanner screen. What is it? Magnify, Cherry. My God. It's a city. A floating city. This is Dr. Mara Cassidy. Would you please identify yourself? We are the Diathons, Mora. 
and we inhabit the star city of Imbria. I am Phaedra, Sky Priestess of the Before Time. We know your machine has experienced an encounter with the Trell. Did the Stygos harm you? Yes, he did. I'm blind. Then it will be my pleasure to restore your sight. We have no vehicles of our own, so transport yourself here to Imbria. A projection of light will guide you. Meanwhile, at the International Space Authority Laboratory on Earth, ISA Commissioner White and Julian Benedict, head of the World Council's Experimental Weapons Section, are at odds over which of their two organizations should have possession of the Trell statue. Do you know what this is, Matthew? It's a World Council directive signed by the Secretary, ordering you to release the statue to my section. Can I see that directive? Thanks. You'll have to excuse me now, Julian. I have things to do. And stay away from my people. I've already given them orders not to cooperate with you. As far as you're concerned, I'm the ISA, and this is between us. What is this, Matthew? Some kind of conspiracy? Yes, it is, Julian. A conspiracy of my values against yours. Half an hour later, Commissioner White boards an ISA priority shuttle and blasts off for Starlab. Meanwhile, the Trell ship, guided by an earlier radio transmission from the giant space station, enters Earth's atmosphere and moves toward the ISA laboratory. I sense that you are restless now, but be patient. Your deliverance is at hand. And now, Lightstorm, the conclusion of the ISA conspiracy on Alien Worlds. Where are we now, buddy? How close? We're 1,700 meters away, Mora. There's the beam. Bright and beautiful. Who is with you, Mora? Three friends. John, Buddy, and Diana. Who is your pilot? I am Phaedra. A John. Just a moment. John, our scan tracings indicate that your propellant emits a lethal mist. Will you please terminate your engines? If I shut down the thrusters, we won't be able to maneuver. The light will control your vehicle and guide it safely down. All right. Shut them down, buddy. World Council Communications to ISA. This is the ISA. Go ahead. Is Mr. Julian Benedict still there? Secretary Stone is returning his call. Uh, yes, he is. He's in the laboratory complex. Uh, stand by, please. Mr. Benedict, I have Secretary Stone on the line. I'd like to speak to him privately, if that's possible. Conference room six is empty. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, Commissioner White ignored your directive, tore it up as a matter of fact. Well, if I had his sense of ethics, I probably would have done the same. What do you mean? I've had some serious second thoughts about this whole thing, Julian. I think we'll let the matter of the statue rest until the president and vice president get back from Draconia. But, Mr. Secretary... Was there anything else, Julian? No, sir. Thank you. You can let it rest if you want to, but I can't. Julian Benedict, a man slowly becoming obsolete in a universe that will soon have no use for his services. A weapons maker on the verge of taking his first desperate step into an alien world.
Alien Worlds continues. Julian Benedict sits alone in conference room six at the ISA Earth Laboratory, silent, sad, filled with resentment. The experimental weapons section he heads up is being phased out by the World Council. An attempt to gain control of the Trell statue and use its energy in a final desperate attempt to prove his usefulness has failed. Damn! Damn! It seems your political system has little use for you, Julian Benedict. Who's there? I am Stygos, High Priest of the Trell. What are you doing on this channel? It's a top priority frequency. We have access to whatever frequencies we choose. Where are you? Hiding in the darkness above. How did your ship get past our defense scanners? That's of no importance now. What is that? What do you want? What do you want? The icon of Narl. Is it yours? Ten thousand millennia past, our planet was visited by a nameless race of darkling beings with magnificent wings and eyes of fire. We were without intellect then, nothing more than restless shadows, hiding in the sea, crawling out at night to feed off the night mists. The darkling priests gave us the gift of Narl. And through him flowed the powers of redemption that transformed us. Then, a nomadic stealer ship came down from the air and took Narl away, thinking he was a construct of a precious gem called Nightstone. We know now that the stealer ship malfunctioned, causing it to impact on your moon. The Violators built a dome as protection from the lunar cold. But they made the mistake of taking Narl into the shelter with them. How did you know he'd been found? Our Parsec scanners have been probing the universe for centuries. Do you have access to Narl? Why don't you just take him? That was our intention. But now we know the chamber that imprisons him is small. If we destroy it, Narl may be harmed. Suppose I do have access to Narl. So what? Free him, and I'll give you the secret of his power. It'll take time. I understand. ISA Communications. Please put me through to the Security Bureau in my section. Right away, Mr. Benedict. Security. This is Julian Benedict. Find Major Ripley and tell him to meet me in my office in 15 minutes. Starland Control, this is ISA Priority Shuttle 1 requesting docking coordinates. Roger, Shuttle 1. What's your ETA? 10 minutes, 30 seconds. 10 plus 30. Roger. Your coordinates are Niner 60 at subvector 448, docking bay 9. Roger. Well, Jerry, this is Commissioner White. Is Mara there? Mara? No. Didn't she talk to you? Well, it was a short conversation. An alien ship attacked us about an hour ago. Mara was blinded. <laughs> blinded? Well, how is she? I don't know. She's not here. Where is she? On Imbria, the Diaton city that's floating just about two kilometers off Star Lab. Welcome to Imbria, Laura. Vedra, you don't know how glad I am to be here. I'm Diana, Phaedra. This is John. Phaedra? And this is Buddy. Wow. Are you ready, Maura? I... Yes, I am. You can't imagine what it's like being blind. Yes, I can, Maura. I'm blind. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. All dear tongues are blind. 
It's our legacy. But how can you see us? How did you manage to build this city? I sense you as clearly as if I had sight, Diana. And as for Imbria, it was dreamed into existence. Dreamed? No. When? During the final century of the before time, an age of radiance unified the minds of all dear tongues and transformed us into Shiva, the dreamer who never awakes. When did this age of radiance end? It ended with the coming of the Trell. They burned our fields and forests with terrible fire weapons. They suffocated our cities and canals with poison mist. Two thousand legions of Trell warriors. And before they went away, they blinded all of us. Oh, Phaedra. Why did they do that? The icon of their god had been stolen. They were angry. That damn statue again. Did they think you'd taken it? No. We were made to suffer their rage because we represented everything Nal had taught them to hate. Why didn't they destroy this city? It was orbiting behind one of our moons. Those of us who survived the travel invasion came here when we realized we'd never be able to rebuild our planet. Not even by dreaming? A dream can't always change what is, Mora. But it can create what isn't. Starlab, go ahead. Uh, has Commissioner White arrived yet? It's urgent. I'm right here. What's the problem? A security police unit from the experimental weapons section is in the laboratory. They say they have orders to take the statue. Damn it, Julian. Who's the officer in charge? Major Ripley. Call the lab. Tell Ripley if he doesn't want to spend the next ten years in Jastro prison, he'd better talk to me. Where are we, Phaedra? The Synergy Chamber. Who else is here? Hold out your hand. Oh, who are you? This is Aleph, the Avatar of Imbria. Welcome to our dream, Mora. Hello. There's a recliner in front of you, Mora. Turn and lie down on it. I am going to place three small Synergy prisms on your forehead now. So warm. In a moment, you'll hear the sound of a sky mantra, the music we use to heal those outside the dream. When the music begins, think only of your eyes and how they looked out upon the various dimensions of your life. If you would like to make direct contact with alien worlds, get a pencil and paper ready, and I'll have our star system coordinates for you at the end of the program. Alien Worlds continues. Deep within the star city of Imbria, Mora lies sleeping 
exhausted by the Diatan Sky Mantra ritual, which has not only restored her sight, but for one fantastic moment has opened her mind to eternity. Meanwhile, Aleph has led John and Buddy back to the Star Lab shuttle, which sits on an illuminated white crystal platform in the center of Imbria. Inside the shuttle, John contacts Commissioner White on Star Lab and learns what is taking place at the ISA laboratory on Earth. How did you find out about Stigos and Benedict, Commissioner? An ISA communications technician was filing the lab's hourly intercom recordings and came across their conversation. Well, where's Benedict now? An ISA security unit arrested him 15 minutes ago. Ripley, too. Uh, what's the present situation? Well, Stigos will probably move against the laboratory when he doesn't hear from Benedict again. John, uh, stand by, Commissioner. Yes, what is it, Aleph? The vault where Narl is. Do you know its precise latitude and longitude? Commissioner White does. Why? We're going to take possession of Narl before Stigos does. How you feeling? I feel wonderful. What's going on? Why are you two wearing your pressure suits? Well, we just talked to Commissioner White. Stigos is about that far away from attacking the ISA lab. We're going down for the statue. He'll never make it in time. Earth's an hour away by shuttle. We're not going by shuttle. We're going by light. Teleportation. Buddy, secure your health. Uh, this isn't going to hurt, is it? I think you'll find it a rather pleasant experience, buddy. Major, lower the cylinders. The dematerialization thresholds have integrated, Anus. Purge the cylinders. It really happened, Skipper. We're here. God, this thing is heavy. Come on, let's get a harness around it so we can pick it up. Okay, let's let's pick it up. Here we go. Raise the cylinders, Phaedra. Where is it? What happened? Where's the statue? Oh, no. We lost it. Phaedra. Nal was too powerful. He rejected the translocation process just beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Stigos. Stigos. Nara was free. A dear time translocation beam tried to take him. But he escaped. No. Take him aboard and bring him to me. Then set a course for Imbria. The trail ship is at 90 power spans in closing, Aleph. The scan tracers acknowledge that Narl is aboard. What can we do, Aleph? Begin the light storm cycle, Phaedra. What's going on? Imbria is now being enclosed by an aurora sphere of ionized winds, invisible to the trail sensors. As their ship penetrates this enclosure, their force field will be temporarily neutralized. At that moment, Phaedra will flood the aurora sphere with liquid light. The ensuing photon storm will destroy them. The trail ship is now ten power spans enclosing. Five power span and frozen. Barrier penetration. Phaedra, the liquid light injectors. Blinding, 
glance of light, a final scream, and the huge trell insect ship convulses and disintegrates. Its luminous fragments growing cold and dark as they pass like demon whispers into the deafening silence of the void. Are you going to guide us away from the city with another light projection? Yeah, I'm really into riding light feet. You may use your engines, John. We'll neutralize the exhaust vapors when we decontaminate the residue of the trail ship. Thank you, Phaedra. Thank you for everything you're doing. Goodbye. Goodbye, Phaedra. Goodbye, Ellen. Goodbye. 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 You didn't tell them, did you? I saw no reason. If they knew that we alone survived the trail invasion, and that our blindness makes the generation of life impossible, it would only make them sad. But we'll heal ourselves in time. And then perhaps, when we see them again, there will be more to the dream than just you and me. As the Starlab shuttle rockets away from Imbria, the radiant dream city slowly drifts away into a universe of stars and suns and secrets. Inside the city, a man and a woman in search of the miraculous, moving through the invisible dimensions of time and space toward other, more distant celebrations. Lightstorm, the conclusion of the ISA conspiracy, was written by Ron Thompson. Our cast included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guests Ernie Anderson, Robert W. Morgan, Olin Soule, Michael Rye, Rusi Taylor, Francis Bay, and Peter Leeds. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Roger Brossi. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. If you would like to make contact with the cast and crew of Alien Worlds, here's the address. Post Office Box 8170, Universal City, California, 91608. That's Post Office Box 8170, Universal City, California, 91608. Let us hear from you. And so, until again we meet, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us soon for further adventures into alien worlds. Adventures in Time and Space, told in Future Tense. Dimension Can you predict the future? Can you tell what will happen in a hundred years? Or in ten? Or in the next minute? Can you look beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown, Dimension X? Tonight we have a strange story to tell, a sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on Earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. Think it over. Suppose you were the last man alive on Earth. In the universe, for that matter. The last man sitting alone in a room. And suddenly, there was a knock on the door. What knocked on the door? You wonder, don't you? Your mind, faced with the unknown, supplies something vaguely horrible. But it isn't horrible, really. You'll see. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. 
There was a knock on the door. Hmm? What? what? Oh, what's that? Good morning, man. What? What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Who are you? I am Azan. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No, no, I, I guess I am awake. Who? What are you? I am Azan. Well, what's that? Azan is intelligent life. Why do... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven? You mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Well, then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. Well, how about the people? There is no longer any use for large numbers of lower life forms. Therefore, we have dispensed with them. Dispensed with... You mean you've... When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. Uh, what? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh, oh, uh... Well, I, I, I'm Walter Phelan, associate professor of anthropology at Nathan University. H how is it you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. Very type of auditory communication. Oh. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What will you want further in your room? Well, do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Well, then you better bring in my books. Uh, uh, I got to call you something. Do you, do you mind if I call you uh, George? It is immaterial. All right, then, George. You know, I, I can't really believe this. That is a characteristic of low-life form. I'm trying to take this in without going off balance completely. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. It's all right, George. Just call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. <laughs> Yes, the last man on earth sat alone in a room, a rather peculiar room. He just noticed how peculiar it was, and he'd been studying out the reason for its peculiarity. His conclusion didn't horrify him, but it annoyed him. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Walter. What can I do for you? Point one, you will please henceforth sit with your chair pointed the other way. I thought so. That plain wall is different from the other sides, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. That's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. I knew it. And if I persist in sitting with my back to it, what then? You'll kill me, I ask, hopefully? No, we will not kill you. That's too bad. George... Face the bars and perform for the people. I, I mean for the Zans. How many other animals do you have here in the zoo, George? 216. A male and female each of 108 kinds. Male and female of... of all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Anyone I know? Never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, George, you started out with point one. I suppose there's a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. What is wrong with them, Walter? Well, they must be dead. Dead? That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, sure, they, 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 they just died. But I have told you they were alone. Nothing stopped them. George, do you mean to tell me that you don't know what natural death is? Death is when a being is killed, stopped from living. Maybe these animals just died of old age. Old age. I do not understand. George, how old are you? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I'm still young. Now look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. 
here on Earth, we've, we've got somebody that's a stranger where you come from. Down here, our people and animals live until the Grim Reaper stops them. This uh, Grim Reaper stopped the two animals? That's right. He will stop more? Oh, he gets us all, George. This is a new factor we have not considered. But you can consider it. Because when the Grim Reaper gets through, there won't be very much left of your zoo. You mean he will stop more animals soon? Well, with your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. Oh, it looks like you made a mistake, George. I don't think there's very much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zan is a logical being. We will take action. <laughs> taking me, George. We will be there shortly. You mean, uh, it's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble. Go inside. Uh, be careful with those books, George. Don't, don't lose... Excuse me. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, I guess George didn't explain. George... Tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What is all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why. Why? You see, I, I, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of a... Sort of an advanced scouting party. Yes, I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Well, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the earth with some kind of vibration that destroys all sorts of animal life. They killed everybody. Oh, no. I was afraid. Well, the cheerful note is that you and I and 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You know that this is a zoo, don't you? Yes. I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing, shortages, wars. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, that is, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. If only they made one mistake. They overestimated us. I don't understand. They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can, they can be killed. But the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are more than two of us? No, no, no more of our species. The, the, these were merely brother animals. A rabbit and a canary. And by the Zans' way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece anyway. That's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in their zoo. But didn't they know that we'd all die eventually? No, I don't think so. See, George told me he was 7,000 years old and he's supposed to be young. When they learned how quickly we die, well, they were probably shocked to the core. If they have cause. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty teas. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo two by two. Oh. Sure, they figure we'll last longer collectively, if not individually. But if they think, that is, if you think, for one minute... No, no, don't, don't, don't worry. I don't. But are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? I'm afraid so. It's horrible. I agree with you perfectly, my dear. But all personal considerations aside, the least favor we can do the human race is to let it end with us. I don't see much point in continuing it just for an exhibition in a zoo. How can you just sit here and, and lecture? Have it, have it. But we've got to do something. Why? I don't know. It, it just seems we owe it to the human race to do something. You got a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. You see, I, 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 I figured it out, I think. George cut his... Well, I suppose you'd call it his hand when he brought in my books. It started to bleed, red blood... But I could see the cut closing just as he stood there. And by the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Don't you see? Whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zahn. I... They just go on and on and on until... Well, until they're stopped. Yes. 
But suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Well, but what would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put a sign out saying, Beware of the man, dangerous. I don't think they'd have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife, she died two years ago. I'm sorry. No, not at all. Oh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one, I have brought you books. Point one, hmm? Well, what else is on your mind? Point two, another creature sleeps and will not wake. A small feathered one called a duck. It happens, George, I warned you. Old man, death, the grim reaper. I told you all about him. Walter, the Council of Zahn has met... It has been decided logically that the only intelligent life to escape the vibration is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you're off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You boys are afraid you're going to lose the whole zoo? It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. Now, wait a minute. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, wait a minute, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. You should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more then. Then it's an ermine. This is the reptile cage. Here are the ducks. This is the male. The female has been stopped. <laughs> Lucky girl. What's the matter, fella? You lonely down there? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. You got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us how it is done. I told you, George, I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Well, what are you going to do, George? We have methods of action you will know soon. We will go back now to your room. What happened, Mr. Taylor? You can call me Walter. After all, George does, and we have more in common. Oh, please, what happened? Just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. What? Well, at least we can get back at them. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow, if you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? They've wiped out the whole human race. They've murdered everybody. I suppose they have, but we can't change that now, so why think about it? Well, we can't just sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. Oh, of all the men in the world they had to pick, don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting until the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? Well, I, 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 I can't really explain, but, Walter, if there was any good in man at all, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and in the end even against himself. But at least he, he kept on fighting for what he thought was right and, and we're all that's left. Walter, we just can't, can't end it by, by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. Oh, look, there isn't much left for us, but we could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend that there's a secret about death, and we could refuse to tell them anything. But there isn't anything to tell. Well, they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. I suppose the worst they can do is to kill us. Oh, Walter. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now, you will tell us how these animals are stopped? George, this may come as a great shock to you. But I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, call it a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. But that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Come now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight. Remember that, Walter. We've got to go out fighting. I think you're right. Come now, Walter. 
Goodbye. It's been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Come now, Walter. After you, my dear George. You will tell us now, Walter? That was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave, if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. You will tell us now? You know, George, I can't figure it out myself, but I'm stubborn. Maybe it has something to do about the dignity of man, the civilization such as it was that you wiped out. I do not understand. I didn't think you would. So go ahead. Vibrate. Vibration level two. It will be very painful, Walter. Walter? Walter? You are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us how you stop the animals. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels one through ten. There are still fifteen more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, 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 let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. That's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. You mean you're going to let me go? That is correct. That's real nice of you, George. I, uh, I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. Oh, no, no, George, you can't do that. Why not, Walter? It is the logical no, plan. No, 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 she, she couldn't take it. Yes, that is what we expect. Therefore, we will go and bring the woman here. No, now listen to me, George. There is no secret. Do you understand that? There's no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. And I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. Well, I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal caged next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. The animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no. Listen, George. George, do you want... You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you. Take me to that stopped animal, and I'll tell you how to save its mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Yeah, just, just... Just let me catch my breath a minute. What happened? Well, after a while, I told them what they wanted to know. You didn't? Sure. As George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. You gave up? I suppose you can call it that. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm buried. Yes. Uh, something might turn up, Martha. But, it, I... but they've beaten us completely, then. There isn't anything we can do with the human race. And we give up. We don't even die fighting. You call me? Hmm? Oh, I must have said Martha. I, I, I'm sorry. The Council of the Zan has met. Something wrong? Uh, she, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. Too late. For the whole... What now, George? Zahn has been stopped. What? Zahn is dead? That is correct. You didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zahn. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Oh, uh, you got it wrong, George. I didn't stop that Zahn. It's just death. It gets all of us here. You will be eliminated now. But, George, it won't do any good to kill us. It won't save you. Everything that lives on Earth must die. That is not logical. But it's true. The council has decided. 
This time, you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? They have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes, yes. And I... Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man. Well, there isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait, what's that? I have been told another Zahn has died. Now. Now will you believe me? The Council of the Zahn meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. And now what? The council has decided this is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the sun. Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George, and don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye. Walter. Goodbye, George. Well, they're all aboard now. Oh, it's so wonderful to feel the wind and the sun again. Close the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Sure, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this grace, the Zahn leaving Earth forever. Now they're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I still don't understand, Walter. What made them go? Oh, I, uh... Just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no. No, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know at 7,000 years he was getting to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Uh, look out for the step. Well, do you remember when the first animals died? Yes, the rabbit and the canary. Mm -hmm, and their mates just started to pine and waste away. Yes. Well, that worried us on. They... Wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So, finally, I broke down and told them about affection. Affection? Mm -hmm. And then I, I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? There we are. Oh. Come here. Grace, I want you to meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? Well, that's what the Zahn wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Mm -hmm. I even showed him how. Come here, fella. Come here. Come here. Ah. Yes, I held Donald in my arms and petted him a while. And then, then I let the Zahn take over with the animal in the next cave. What animal? Take a look. Hey, watch out. Don't go Water. too close. It's a rattlesnake. Yes, it's a rattlesnake. The Zahn's metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch they could be poisoned. Then it was the snake that killed the two Zahn. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. I suppose. And I thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so proud of you. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought at all if you hadn't pushed me. <sighs> Well. Well. We've got a world to plan, a whole new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones would be safer to keep in. But first, there's a much bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. Yeah, we've got to make a decision about that. It's a... Pretty important one. Uh, yes, uh, but... It hasn't been a bad race. 
course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but... Well, we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. Please, Walter. It's, it's the Garden of Eden. Oh, don't be All ridic- over again. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. <laughs> Funny. Even blush like Martha. Oh, 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 only you're stronger than she was. And prettier, too. I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear, if you'll only give me a little time. Now, Walter Fairley, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that, that we... Why, I, I, I thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. And so, Grace, if you could only... I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going <coughs> out. Well, all right, my dear, but but think it over and, and please come back. You see, I told you. It wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in. Come in. My dear... You see, it wasn't horrible at all. You have just heard the Frederick Brown story entitled Knock, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X, 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 X. Now, about next week. Next week, we tell the story of a robot. But a robot that was almost human. Tonight's adventure in Dimension X was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Arnold Moss was heard as Walter Phelan, Louis Van Ruten as the Zahn, and Joan Alexander as Grace Evans. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow, hear Sam Spade. Now it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. transcription. It's National Wheaties Week. (laughs) Yes, it's National Wheaties Week, and Wheaties present Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. It's National Wheaties Week, the week to buy Wheaties and eat Wheaties and enjoy them as never before. The time to really find out what difference a good breakfast with Wheaties can make. You know, you're getting protein when you dip into a bowl full of Wheaties. You're getting whole wheat minerals and vitamins. You're getting whole wheat energy. Yup, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. That's how a better breakfast, beginning with Wheaties, can help you step lively all morning long. And that's why all over this big country, folks are celebrating National Wheaties Week and stepping lively. So how about it? Get out the big cereal bowl and help celebrate Breakfast of Champions. Pour out those golden flakes, put on the milk, put on the fruit, and let's have National Wheaties Week. You ready? Let's go. Tonight, Dimension X presents The Martian Chronicles, a dramatization of the new novel by one of our most brilliant young science fiction writers, Ray Bradbury. The Martian Chronicles. (laughs) 
January in the year 1999. One minute it was Ohio winter with doors closed, the panes blind with frost, icicles fringing every roof, children skiing on snowy slopes. And then a long wave of warmth crossed the small town, a flooding sea of hot air. William McClellan, you come back here. You know you can't go out in winter without a cold. Do you want to catch your death of cold? But it isn't cold. It's warm outside. It's rocket summer. Rocket summer? You know, like Indian summer. The rocket lay on the launching field, blowing out pink clouds of fire and heat, cracking the icicles, melting the snow, making summer with every breath of its mighty exhausts. It seared the faces of the watching crowd and drove them back. And then they saw the red fire and heard the big sound as the silver rocket shot up toward Mars and left them behind on an ordinary Monday morning on the ordinary planet Earth. lived in a house of crystal pillars on the planet Mars by the edge of an empty sea. And every morning you could see Ila eating the golden fruits that grew from the crystal walls, or her husband sitting alone in his room reading from a singing metal book over which he brushed his hand as one might play a harp. Ila and her husband were not old. Once they had liked painting pictures with chemical fire, swimming in the canals when the wine trees filled them with green liquors and talking into the dawn together. But no more. Marriage sometimes makes people old and familiar while still young. And Ela was not happy now. This morning she sat dreaming between the crystal pillars and wished that somehow a miracle might happen. And then suddenly... Ela, did you call? No. I thought I heard you cry out. Did I? I was almost asleep and had a dream. In the daytime? Hmm. You don't often do that. How strange. How very strange. I dreamed about a man. A tall man. Six feet tall. Oh, how absurd. He'd be a giant, a misshapen giant. I know. And yet, somehow, he looked quite handsome. He was dressed in a strange uniform... And he came down out of the sky in a long silver craft. Out of the sky? <laughs> what nonsense. He spoke pleasantly to me in another language. But somehow I understood him with my mind. <laughs> Telepathy, I suppose. A really ill. And he said, I've come from the third planet in my ship. My name is Nathaniel York. A stupid name. Who ever heard of a name like that? Perhaps they have names like that on Earth. That's ridiculous, Hila. Everyone knows the third planet is incapable of supporting life. There's too much oxygen in their atmosphere. I suppose. But haven't you ever wondered if... Well, wouldn't it be fascinating if there were people there and they traveled through space in some sort of ship? Oh, really, Hila? You know I hate this emotional wailing. Well, let's get on with our work. <laughs> Evening came. The twin white moons of Mars were rising, and the house closed itself in like a giant flower. A wind blew among the pillars, stirring Ela's russet hair, crooning softly in her ear. And it was then that she began singing the song. Drink to me, only thine eyes. And I will pledge with mine. Ila, what's that song? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I've never heard it before. Did you compose it? No. Yes. No, I don't know, really. I don't even know what the words are. They're in another language. It was part of the dream I had, I guess. Oh, you know, you haven't been yourself lately. It might do you good if we went away to the Blue Mountains for a week or so. Uh, what? Did you hear what I said? I'm sorry. 
I was watching the sky. You're certainly interested in the sky tonight. It's very beautiful. Well, what about my suggestion? Shall we leave for the Blue Mountains in the morning? You mean go away now? Oh, no. No? Why not? Why don't you want to go? I don't know. I just don't want to, that's all. Oh, leave the kid in the cup and not ask who... Ela, I'm sick of that silly song. It's late. Let us sleep. From the crystal walls poured a soft carpeting of mist to support Ela where she lay down to sleep. But through the night she tossed restlessly until just at dawn the dream recurred. What? Ela! Ela, wake up. What? Oh, what is it? You've been dreaming again. You talked in your sleep. Did I? Yes. What were you dreaming? Oh, the ship. It came from the sky again. And the tall man stepped out and talked with me. <laughs> Telling me little jokes and laughing. What else happened? And then this this Captain York... Oh, I can't. It's all so silly. Tell me! He said I was beautiful. And then he kissed me. I thought so. What else? Why, Eel, you're so bad-tempered. It's only a dream. Is it? You know I can read your mind. You can't keep secrets from me. Well, all that happened was this Captain York told me... Well, he told me he'd take me away in his ship, into the sky. Take me back to his planet with him. <laughs> it's quite ridiculous, really. Ridiculous, is it? You should have heard yourself. Pawning on him, talking to him, singing with him all night. In your dream, he landed in Green Valley, didn't he? Please. And he told you he was coming today. Yes. But what's come over you? It was only a dream. You can't be jealous of that. No. No, I suppose not. Forgive me. I'm being childish. Ian, you're sick. You've been working too hard. No, no, I'm all right. But perhaps you're right. Maybe I could use a little relaxation. Yes. I think I'll take the morning off and go hunting. Hunting? Yes, in Green Valley. <laughs> Numbly, she watched him go to a closet and draw forth an evil-looking weapon. And then her husband was gone, walking toward Green Valley. And Ela waited, watching the sky for an unknown thing, trembling with a nameless fear. And then it happened. A whirring, rushing sound. The warmth as of a giant fire passing in the air. The gleam of metal in the sky. He's come! It's true! The dream is true! The rocket vanished over the hill. The sky was empty again, and trembling, Ela waited again, looking toward Green Valley and seeing nothing, listening for sounds and hearing nothing, until... A shot sounded, very sharply, the sound of the evil weapon. Oh, no. No, no, no. Her body jerked with the sound, and she wanted to scream and never stop screaming. For now she knew the dream could never come true. And there was nothing left but the song, the strange and fine and beautiful song. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Oh, leave a kiss within the <laughs> but still the rockets came. The next ship came down from the stars and the black velocities and the silent gulfs of space and landed by night near a Martian city. The men made their way to the outer rim of the dreaming city, and then Jeff Spender went in to reconnoiter while the others watched and waited. 
waited for something to stir in the haunted city, some gray form to rise, some voice to break the unearthly stillness. Where were the people? Where were the Martians? Nothing stirred to disturb the silence until... Halt! Who goes there? Don't shoot! Hold it, Parker. Let's spend her in this party. They're coming back. Captain Wilder! Over here! Well? Captain, we've searched the city. People were living here last week. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. Dead? What did they die of? You won't believe it, Captain. Chicken pox. Good Lord, no. Yes. No resistance to an Earth disease, I guess. So the other rocket did get through to Mars. It looks like it, Captain. God only knows what the Martians did to them. But at least we know what they did to the Martians. You mean they're all dead? Yes. This planet is through. Hey, you hear that, guys? We're safe. <laughs> Break out a bottle, Cookie. Let's have a drink to celebrate. Stop it, Parkhill. Put down that bottle. Ah, what's eating you spend to the planet's hours now? We got a christener, don't we? <laughs> I christen thee the city of... Uh, I christen... Hey, Park Hill City, huh? Park Hill, I warned you! All right, Spencer, that's enough. That'll cost you a $50 fine. Crooky McClure, take care of Park Hill. Spender, you come with me. All right, Spender, why did you hit him? I don't know, Captain. I was ashamed, I guess. Ashamed of Sam Parkhill and the noise and the spectacle the whole crew is making. It's been a long trip. It's only natural they'd want to have their fling. Yes, but where's their sense of what's right? Their respect for what's happened here? Captain, a race builds itself for a million years. Refines itself, builds cities like this one. Does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty and... And then... It dies. Of what? Not anything fine or majestic or fitting, but but a dirty little thing like chicken pox. And Sam Parkhill wants to celebrate. I know, Spender, but you've got to remember you've a different way of seeing things. I'm seeing things all right. I'm seeing what we'll do to Mars. We'll rip it up, rip the skin off, ruin it the way we've ruined our own planet. Captain... Look at the city. It may be the last time you'll ever see it this way. Beautiful in the moonlight, isn't it? Yes. There's a poem by Byron that describes it. And how the Martians would feel tonight. If there were any... any of them left to feel. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath and the soul wears out the breast. And the heart must pause to breathe and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the earth men stood and looked at the city. The bottle lay shattered at Sam Park Hill's feet, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. <laughs> Dimension X will continue in just a moment. It's National Wheaties Week. Yes, the week when everybody tries Wheaties, even an orchestra leader. And here he comes from behind the scenes in radio to help celebrate National Wheaties Week, Mr. Von Dexter. Thank you, Frank. Hello, folks. I understand this is National Wheaties Week. I can't get a kick out of that. The only breakfast food in the world with a week of its own. And I'm here for just one thing, to ask you to try Wheaties during National Wheaties Week. 
There are a lot of us whose voices you've never heard on the Wheaties big parade of radio programs, you know. Backstage people. Like musicians. Right, Frank, like musicians. We get great pleasure from knowing you like these programs well enough to buy a box of Wheaties tomorrow. Wheaties are good. They're nice to eat. I like them. I think you will. Try them once during National Wheaties Week. Will you do that? Vaughn, I think the folks will. Good. Thank you. Good night. The men of Earth came to Mars. They came because they were afraid or unafraid. Because they were happy or unhappy. Because they felt like pilgrims or did not feel like pilgrims. The government posters screamed, There's work for you in the sky. See Mars! And the men shuffled forward, all kinds of men, all coming for different reasons. The rockets came like drums beating in the night. They came like locusts, swarming and settling in blooms of rosy smoke. Mars was a distant shore, and the settlers spread upon it in waves. First the pioneers and builders, then the people of civilization. Some came because they were afraid of a coming war on Earth. Some came because they were afraid of nothing. Some came to escape from the smell of the subways and the cabbage tenements. And some came from houses like the one in Ohio. It was a good house, the house in Ohio. And for six years, the family had lived there contentedly, enjoying music and poetry and the rich, warm things of life. For the house had been built to be lived in in the year 2020. It contained all the latest automatic devices, from talking book recorders to singing clocks. As the family rose and dressed, the beds whirred electronically and made themselves. In the kitchen, the stove sighed and ejected from its warm interior eight eggs, sunny side up, twelve bacon slices, two coffees, and two glasses of milk. Seven, nine, breakfast time. Come and dine. Seven, nine. Beside the breakfast table, the facsimile machine clacked and deposited the morning paper on the table. The headlines today spoke ominously of the danger of a coming war. And the man frowned as he read the news. Today is August 4th, 2026. Insurance, gas, and atom heat bills are due. And today, remember, the family has planned a picnic. Gee, Dad, are we really going? Sure, Timmy, why not? It's raining out. It's not raining where we're going, son. Now run upstairs, pack your fishing tackle. We're going on our picnic, all right. Okay, Dad. Bill, are you sure we ought to go? Yes. Have you seen the headlines this morning? Looks bad, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. The rocket's ready. All we have to do is pack and take off. I know, but... Well, flying to Mars, it seems so crazy. Well, all right, then we'll go. Should we tell the children why we're going? No, not yet. Let them enjoy the picnic. (coughs) The house went on with its appointed tasks. 9.15, time to clean. 9.15, time to clean. Out of the molding darted hundreds of tiny mechanical mice, all rubber and metal. They sucked up the dust and dirt in the house and popped back into their burrows. In the walls, relays clicked. Memory tapes glided under electric eyes. Recorded voices moved under steel needles. 12 o'clock. Evening came. In the living room, the hearth fire bloomed out of nothing, and the phonograph spoke from beside the fireplace. Mrs. McClellan, what poem would you like to hear this evening? Mr. McClellan, since you express no preference, I shall select at random from among your favorites. Sarah Teasdale, There Will Come Soft Rains. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pool singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire, and not one will know of war, 
Not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. The phonograph finished the poem, but there was no one there to hear, for the family had gone to Mars. On the Martian desert beside the highway, there rose a blare of red and yellow neon lights that spelled the death of Jeff Spender's dream. Sam's hot dog stand is what the sign read. And Sam, of course, was the same Sam Parkhill who had fought with Spender years before. 10,000 rockets were reported leaving soon for Mars with 100,000 hungry customers. And Sam wanted to be ready for them. Hey, look up there, Elmer. Mm -hmm. See that green star up there? That's Earth. Ah, good old wonderful earth. <laughs> Makes you feel almost reverent, don't it? Yeah. Send me you're hungry and you're starved. Uh, something, something. That's a poem I learned in school. <laughs> Come on, Earth, send me your rockets. Here's Sam Parkhill with the only hot dog stand on Mars. Sam, what if the rockets don't come? What if there's a war on Earth? Ah, don't worry, they're coming all right. Ain't nothing gonna happen to spoil my plans, baby. I figured it all out. Sam! Hey, Sam, look up there! Earth! Oh, what? Oh, no. It's catching fire. It's burning. Oh, no, no, that can't be Earth. Helma, they can't do this to me. I got all our money invested <laughs> in this place. I... Go ahead, Sam. Switch on more lights. Turn up the music. Get the hot dogs on the fire. There'll be another batch of customers coming along in about a hundred million years. Oh, no, it couldn't be. What a swell spot for a hot dog stand. Let you in on a little secret, Sam. This looks like it's going to be an off season. The light beam radio crackled with the news. Whoa. By morning, the shelves of the luggage store were empty, and the rockets were blasting off, headed back to Earth. In a few days, everyone was gone, and the planet of Mars once more lay deserted and silent. And then, after all the rest had gone... One last rocket landed on Mars. A small, family-sized rocket come all the way from Earth. It seemed a long way to go for a picnic, but Dad had suggested a fishing trip, and Mother thought the whole family would enjoy a vacation. So here they were, floating down a Martian canal, with Timothy sitting in the back of the boat with Dad and Mother up front holding Alice the baby, and the deserted Martian towns drifting slowly by. Dad. What is it, Timmy? When do we see the Martians? You promised we would. Soon, Tim, soon. Oh, but William, the last Martians died out years ago. They're a dead race now. Not quite. Don't worry, son. I'll show you some real live Martians later on. Gee, this is swell. I wish we didn't ever have to go home. How long can we stay? A million years. A million years? Yes. It's time we told you, son, we're not going home. This is where we'll live from now on. But what about the rocket? What about Ohio? There's nothing there now but ruins. The last Earth radio just went off the air. That means the war is over and Earth is finished. We're going to blow up our rocket and start all over. See if we can't build a better world up here. You mean Mars is going to be our home? Yes. I hope you don't mind too much. No, sir. But what about the Martians? When do we get to see them? There they are, son. Look down at the water. I don't see anything there. Beside the boat. Look at the reflections in the water. But but that's us down there. Just you and me and Mom and the baby. Yes, son. You see, we're the Martians now. 
For a long, silent moment, Timmy stared down at the reflections of the family in the waters. And the Martian stared back up at him. Then he lifted his eyes to the deep ocean sky, trying once more to see Earth and the house he had always called home. But Earth was too far away, and the house was now only a heap of radioactive rubble. Only one wall remained standing, and within the wall a voice spoke again and again and again. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly, and spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone, 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 that we were gone. 2026. Today is October 5th, 2026. You have just heard The Martian Chronicles. A dramatization of highlights from the new novel by Ray Bradbury. Your narrator was Norman Rose, and featured in the cast were Inga Adams, Roger DeCoven, and Donald Buca. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Jack Cuny. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Go out and get the Wheaties. It's National Wheaties Week. Yep, this is the week everybody's trying Wheaties. See yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. A better breakfast beginning with Wheaties can help make a wonderful difference because there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. So eat happy, work happy. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Get yours. Get yours. It's National Wheaties Week. Next week, the strange and chilling story of The Parade. The parade that suddenly turned into a funeral procession for the world of tomorrow. The world of... Dimension X. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Saturday, that's tomorrow night, to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Remember, it's National Wheaties Week. Swing your partners right and left. It's National Wheaties Week. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties, a breakfast of champions. The preceding was transcribed. Coming up is Jack Late. Listen for Bill Bendix, October 6th on NBC. Exploring Tomorrow. Now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell. The term genius is fairly common in our language today. I wonder how many of you realize that the term originated with the old Arabian Nights concept of the genie. You know, the magical creature that came in a bottle and had such wonderful powers. The story is about a whole planet of geniuses. Genie. Uh, interesting people to try to enslave, you know. Laboratory scientists have as much fun as anybody else, you know. One of the laboratory laws, sometimes called Finagle's Law or Murphy's Law, goes, in any laboratory experiment, if something can go wrong, it will. Well, this is the story of a planet-sized laboratory experiment in which something could go wrong.
Professor Heim to His Excellency Marshal Gorham. The ship is now in orbit about the planet of destination. Good. Good. Have a lifeboat prepared for descent with an invisibility screen. Yes, Your Excellency. How many crewmen will you want to take along? None. There will be just myself and you, Professor Heim. Sir, you, the Marshal, landing on a barbarian world without even an, an escort, and begging your pardon, sir, but... Uh... Do you mean that the Grand Marshal of the Galactic Imperial Armed Forces can't carry out an undercover inspection on a backward planet without a dozen Marines clanking in his wake? No, sir. No, sir. And please remember that the people down there have no weapon more powerful than a bow and arrow. Whereas I will be carrying a nuclear blaster under my coat. Yes, sir. Of course, Your Excellency. And while we are down there on that planet, uh, Professor Heim, stand by for possible action. We may have to bombard the place with cobalt missiles. Wipe all the life off it. Sterilize the entire planet, sir? You heard me, Professor. I said we may have to. Not that we will. It depends on what I find down there. That peaceful, primitive world may turn out to be just another stupid scientific experiment. Or it may turn out to be the worst danger of the Empire and all its stars have faced for a thousand years. Now, I want you, Professor. I'm in my office at once. Over. Yes, Your Excellency. Over and out. Oh, there you are, Professor Heim. Yes, Marshal Gorham, here I am. You've arrived at your experimental planet. I know. I was just watching it float there among the constellations. I don't know a more beautiful sight in the universe. Well, break out the native costumes for us, too. We're going down. At once? I am a military man, Professor, not one of your psychologists. Now, so far, your people have spent 1,500 years studying that planet. But as for me, there's war on the Imperial borders, and I can spare three days. Three days to decide? To decide whether we can let your experiment go on or whether to... to discontinue it, shall I say? But only three days... Marshal, you don't realize it. it would take a week just to explain the statistics of... I know, I've heard it all. Fifteen hundred years ago, the Psychological Research Foundation decided to learn what makes human history tick by running controlled experiments. So it took a lot of uninhabited planets and put different kinds of people on them. Well, their memories wiped out, Marshal. The first generation started out knowing as little as animals. They, they had to discover everything for themselves. Fire, language, the wheel... Do you imagine that their descendants could have learned enough to menace us? To threaten an empire that for 3,000 years has controlled millions of planetary systems? We've been through all this before, I am. I've told you again and again, I'm not worried about your other experimental worlds. They're still cavemen or less. But this planet here, pure genius stock. A planet where nobody has an IQ below 150. And God knows how high they go. Well, I just can't tell about them. And His Majesty is worried, too. There have been rumors. He sent me here himself to decide whether or not those rumors could be true. But the people down there don't even know the Galactic Empire exists. Why, the men there are still farming with plows and sailing as teamships. Sure, sure, sure. What of it? Ordinary men on Earth with an average IQ of 100 needed maybe half a million years to get as far as your geniuses have in 1500. I understand they've already developed Newtonian physics, chemical batteries, telescopes, world governments. At that rate, they'll be visiting the other planets of this system in 50 years. They'll reach the stars in a century, and then they'll be loose in the Galactic Empire. Do you think they'd fit tamely into the caste system, like good subjects of the Emperor? Why, they couldn't even if they tried. They'd produce a new invention and a new philosopher every day. And that would mean the end of stability, and that, Professor, would mean the end of the Empire. So you say, but you're a soldier. You don't understand. Yes, I know. I'm a dirty militarist who can't see past the end of my own guns. All I'm good for is killing, huh? And you're a noble intellectual scientist. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that guff before, Professor, and I've gotten pretty tired of it. But I tell you, the genius people are, are cooperative in that. My orders are to inspect the place and decide for myself whether they're right or not. So that's what I'm going to do. Come along, I'm. <laughs> Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. When driving, luck can stay with you for years. But on the road, it can leave you in a split second, a tragic split second. So drive carefully. You will live longer and you will arrive alive. There's been considerable discussion of what constitutes good and evil over the last few millenniums. But... 
You know, there's an interesting comment someone made. I don't know where it did originate. Melodrama is the conflict between good and evil. And tragedy is the conflict between good and good. When two good men, each with a good point to make, get into conflict, that's where real tragedy starts. All right, Professor. I've got the lifeboat into the atmosphere and leveled off. So where do I head now? I'm... Wake up, you wool-headed dreamer. Uh, I'm sorry, Marshal. I, I was thinking, looking out the porthole and thinking. What about? How lovely the sky is. So blue. And the land below, mountains and forests and hopeful young farms. Oh, no, a poet yet. Well, I'm thinking about my job of inspection. Where shall we go? Fly north, northeast for 700 kilometers and you'll find this planet's largest city. It's also the capital of the world government. That'll do. I should be able to observe a pretty good cross-section of the genius race. Do you seriously believe you can decide the fate of an entire world on the basis of what you see in one city? How do you expect to learn anything even there? You don't speak any of the local languages, not even the international one that developed. You'll talk for both of us. We'll claim to be visitors from a long ways off, the opposite hemisphere. We'll just wander around town for a couple of days and I'll get the feel of the place. You, you mean you, you decide whether these people live or die just on the basis of a, of a hunch? Now, here we are. Landed in an empty meadow. You're sure nobody will happen by? Well, what do they do? The lifeboat is invisible. Well, even so. Well, we don't want the genius people learning the truth, uh, do we, Professor? No, of course not. And on that, you and I do agree. But my own motive is that I, I don't want to spoil the experiment. Come on, let's get moving. We'll have to hike into the city. Oh, it's nice outdoors. Sunshine. I don't know when I last breathed air that didn't come out of a tank. Then you turn all this into black radioactive ash. Come on, I said. Let's start walking. Well, there's a road. Hmm. It's pretty well paved. Oh, yes. Ten years ago, this was a livestock trail. Today, they're driving steam automobiles over it. I predict that ten years from now, the first airplane will use this for a landing strip. But where's the mass market to support all that progress? There isn't much of one. Actually, most people here are still riding around in buggies. You see, they have a unique social system. The average man on this planet would rather buy a new book than a new gadget. But at the same time, their engineers keep on making inventions because a mind of such power can't help being creative. And I tell you, the Empire can't afford what you call creativeness. So this is their biggest city. Right. There are about a million people in it. <laughs> you call that a city? Considering the small population of this world, yes. <laughs> it's backward, all right. Carts pulled by animals. Water pumped by windmills. Bearded men in clothes of vegetable fiber. Wood and plaster houses. Gas lamps. Well, that's what I, I keep telling you, Marshal. These people aren't demons. They're as human as you and I. They're born the same way as us. Grow up, learn, love, laugh, weep and die like human beings anywhere in all space and time. They simply happen to be more intelligent. Let them live. Seventy generations ago, they were savages. They didn't even know how to chip a flint. And now they've come to this. Yes. Our observers mingling with them in disguise have already learned more about historical dynamics than... I'm sure, this city is still primitive. But in another hundred years, they have schools, laboratories... They don't frown on artists and scientists and philosophers. They glorify them. So, in a hundred years, they'll be out among the stars. And we don't dare allow that. But they won't, Marshal. Not necessarily. If only you'd let me show you the economic data. For instance, the great uninhabited spaces they still have right on their home planet. Shut up. I'm thinking. Thinking? <laughs> I doubt if you're able to. What did you say? Uh, nothing. I have a knife, Grand Marshal Gorham. You don't know that, do you? You think I'm just another ineffectual little dreamer, don't you? Well, you may 
find out different. If by militarist we mean someone who believes that it is necessary to use physical force to carry out, to implement a theory, a belief, then uh, it looks to me like Professor Heim has become a militarist. He intends to use force, doesn't he? Hello, two solar. Third down. No, Saban Hostet. What did he say, that, that bellhop or whatever he was? He wished us good night in the international language. He thinks we're foreigners, you remember? <laughs> if he only knew how foreign. That's a cheap way to feel superior, isn't it? Oh, shut up, Heim. I'm still trying to decide what to do about this planet. There are too many paradoxes. The waiter in the restaurant wanted to ask you about the ethnology of the country he thought we came from. This is a nice, clean hotel room, but it doesn't have running water. And yet the clerk downstairs was reading what I swear must have been a mathematical journal. Does that make them monsters? Under the social system here, such routine jobs are done by students. And, of course, every person on this planet goes through at least five years of college. But that's all that amounts to, Gorham. A whole world of long-haired dreamers who are experimenting with aircraft and rockets, who developed the theory of evolution before they learned how to smelt iron. I don't trust them. Of course, you don't understand them. You're too... I, I, I mean... Too stupid? Isn't that what you're going to say, Professor? I'm just a dumb militarist who worked his way from private soldier to grand marshal of the Galactic Empire. No fine scientist, just a hired hand keeping the barbarian raiders off your scientific back. Well, Professor Heimer, I happen to be the man who will decide what's to become of this planet of geniuses. And have you decided yet, Your Excellency? Not yet. I can still take a couple of days to... Two more days? After the Foundation work for 1,500 years? Hey, what are you doing? This is a knife in my hand, Marshal Gorham. Don't move. If you reach for that blaster, I'll kill you. You're going, going, going crazy, Hyde? No. You're the crazy one. You're the lunatic who wouldn't blood out man's last best hope, this planet. You allow yourself three days to decide the whole future of a world. You unbuckle that blaster. Don't let your hand come near the trigger. I'll drop it on the floor. Kick it over to me. So. Now I've got you where I want you. Oh, but, Professor, I haven't decided anything yet. I might decide this experiment is safe. I might still report to the Emperor. There's nothing to be afraid of. He can forget your race. <laughs> you might. But I know you won't. I'm going to kill you, Marshal Gorham. I'm going to report to the spaceship captain that you died accidentally. And then I'm going to hope that the next Imperial Inspector will be more reasonable. Look out! Stand back, you fool! No! I only stabbed you in the arm that time, Marshal Gorham. But you're in a corner now. I'll get you this time. Go! Go, Varadan! Go along! I don't go along, you wreck! Who's done it, Schulte? Go! Go! You... You... You spoke... You spoke their language. You already know the language of this planet... Yeah. The attendant has the key, of course. He's coming in. Drop that knife, Professor Heim. He's a husky chap. Shalom, Arna. Yeah. Take the order. Drop that knife, I said, Professor. Yes, of course. Sit down, Heim. You look more shocked than I am. Come on, Arna. Do that. Yeah, He's gone after the first aid kit for me. Not that you hurt me seriously. I, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. And you, you're a native of this planet yourself. Yes. I was born here, though I've lived most of my life out in the Empire. <laughs> we thought we were keeping a, a planet full of geniuses and ignorance. How long have you known? We began to suspect the truth 500 years ago. And we discovered that all life had evolved from lower forms, but couldn't find a subhuman ancestor for man. Now, finally, your disguised observers were identified. We even used blind man techniques to spot those wearing invisibility screens. <laughs> Did you really expect you could go on fooling the race with twice your brain power? Well, we thought so. Yes, I, I suppose it was foolish. <laughs> Some of us wormed our way into space as stowaways or, or in disguise, that sort of thing. People here live quietly so as not to give the show away. 
We don't tell our children the truth till they're old enough to keep up the pretense. But meanwhile, for the past 300 years, our agents have been out on the empire learning everything you know, posing as citizens working up into the key positions of your government. We can do that by sheer merit. Yes, obviously, you can become imperial marshals. Quite. <laughs> and when the emperor got suspicious, he, he sent me, his trusted soldier, a notorious anti-intellectual, to check up for him. Naturally, I was going to give this planet a clean bill of health, but I had to string you along first to make it look good. Evidently, I put on a better act than I had planned. Yeah. And now that I, I know your secret... I'll have to report that you were accidentally killed here, Professor. But don't worry. All you have to do is uh, spend the rest of your life here as one of us. I don't think you'll mind that. Oh, no. Not personally. I, I, I'd enjoy it. I used to envy the people on this world. But uh, when you, uh, well, your race, I mean, when you've completely taken over the Galactic Empire from within, uh, what do you plan to do? Well, we'll remodel it, shall I say. I'm afraid you wouldn't understand exactly what we intend to do. It, it's a little beyond your grasp, but, but it will be for the benefit of the ordinary galactic citizen, too. <laughs> the poor, backward, benighted galactic empire. <laughs> They say that the first requirement for teaching a dog to do tricks is that you have to know more than the dog. If you want to teach a planet full of geniuses to do tricks for you, first make sure you know more than the geniuses. You can enslave some kinds of entities, but you can't enslave, you can't impose on entities who are more intelligent, more thoughtful, more wise than you yourself. Uh, what will happen is they'll turn out to be helping you in disguise. Fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight were Ron Dawson and Al Ruscio. Script was by Powell Anderson, produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Guy Wallace speaking. And now... Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. This is Lee Hansen. The next two episodes of Alien Worlds will not involve Star Lab or our friends in the ISA. This week, Alien Worlds pursues a new horizon. We're going to take you on a mystical journey through a science fiction fantasy adventure that explores the intergalactic origins of spiritual evil and how the inhabitants of the ancient planet of Alithia set out to neutralize that evil over 2,000 years ago. Here then are Olin Soule, Lorene Tuttle, Rusi Taylor, and Roger Dressler in part one of our special presentation, Earthlight. Something silent fractures the Alithian midnight clouds, and they slowly puzzle apart, releasing the ghostly radiances of three white moons. Brilliant lunar light shimmers down onto Alithia's night side. Darkness dissolves as far north as the ion refineries at Lahelia, as far south as the Aviara Sun Tower Complex. 
as far east as the Lusa Canal intersect, as far west as the domed windship port at Darmus. Huge cloud fragments break away and drift past the moons. There is a sudden eclipse of light. Then the cloud fragments narrow to smoky splinters, curl up into the fluorescent winds of the aurora sphere, and vanish. The moonlight returns, intensifies, expands. It sweeps across the starflight complex at Kalava, illuminates the celestial laboratories at Somari, seeps down to the Penumbrian shadow forest, and brightens the pyramid of Deus, which rests at the forest's perimeter. A canal of dark water flows between the pyramid and the forest. Iridescent nova blossoms on the canal bottom sense the moonlight and rise to the surface, the translucent petals shimmering with color. Docked at the edge of the canal is a slender Alithian wing ship. Its triangular sails folded, its 30-foot-long transparent metal hull low in the water. The huge main chamber inside the pyramid is illuminated by the pale yellow flames of a hundred thick white candles. Moonlight streams in through the stained glass sky windows at the chamber's peak. Delicately woven tapestries and intricate mosaics decorate the angled walls. Beneath the sky windows sits Deus, the father, Elithia's most highly evolved divine scientist. On the carved wooden table in front of him is an ancient voice book, its pages embossed with complex hieroglyphs. As he moves his fingertips over the hieroglyphs, the book voice tells him the future, reaffirming his dream about another expedition to the planet of Terra Lu. A beautiful woman is blinded by visions of immortality and falls to sleep in a flower field. A star machine floats down into the scented voids of summer. A child is born. A healer of spirits walks across the deep currents of a faraway sea. The suffering are comforted. The dying are healed. The dead are reborn. The healer of spirits ascends to the stars. Terra Lou sinks below the fiery horizons of an alien sun. Faces look up. The sky stands still. Terra Lou. So many expeditions. So little progress. So many of our sons and daughters lost. A thousand years, and it's just beginning. Deus? Oh, come in and sit with me, Sibella. Have you seen the sky, Deus? The clouds are gone and the moons are out. It's a perfect night for star flying. Mm -hmm. The book said it would be. Has the book reaffirmed that we're returning to the Veda sector of Terra Lu? Yes, and it told me about the woman. Her name is Aram. She's young and strong and beautiful. And she's never known the Darkbringer virus. Elisha Ba had never known the virus either. Do they share the same blood? Yes. And because they do, the embryon child implanted in Elisha Ba during the last expedition and the embryon child of this expedition will share the times to come. <laughs> the times to come. How are things progressing at Kalava? The ship was moved to Dome 3 at sunset for fueling and ancillary pre-flight maintenance. Has Aram's embryon child been taken aboard? Yes. Lyria took him into the ship's nucleus chamber at moonrise. She's holding him in the secondary genesis tank while Karmas finishes refocusing the convection lenses on the primary. And what about Zuriel? Has he installed the new Paratron refractor? He's still working on it. 
He would have finished by now, but there was a technical setback. Oh? When Zuriel examined the new refractor, he found that two of the waveform links were flawed. There wasn't time to send it back to Suma Ray, so he's correcting the flaw with a series of Nimbus filters. Nimbus filters? I wasn't aware that such things existed. They didn't until now. Zuriel synthesized them in the Spectrum Laboratory in Dome 6. <laughs> Is this the beginning of a new era in Alithian technology? <laughs> well, Zuriel seems to think so. You know how he is when he does something especially inventive. Yes. Yes, I know. Deus. Hmm? When Aram's embryon child evolves to his final form and begins his work, will he be alone? He will at first. But eventually there will be a multitude. How will it end? Tears, blood, a heart pierced with metal. And what will become of us? Will we return to Elithia? The book didn't know, Sibella, where the journey back should have been. It was only silence. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight will continue. This woman's sorry For keeping you guessing You never know what I'll do That's why I'm here confessing It's because Sometimes I feel like a nut Sometimes I don't I'll enjoy that nut Mounds don't presentation of Earthlight continues. Deus, was the book able to calculate the time lapse between our departure from Elithia tonight and our penetration of Terra Lu's gravity veil? Yes. Eleven solar days, nine phenomenas. When will we make contact with Aram? Three phenomenas past sunrise on the morning of the twelfth day. She'll be alone in a field near her village gathering red and white flowers. Red and white. Blood and purity. Yes. The two elements that will haunt Aram to the end of her days. Well, it's getting late, Sibella. We'd better start for Kalaba. As Deus and Sibella walk down the luminescent gemstone path leading to the canal, a swarm of fluorescent blue spider moths stream out of the shadow forest circle the canal's reflection of Olympia's three moons and streak away into the flower-scented night. Sibella and Deus board Sibella's windshield, move to the deep circular cockpit just behind the bow, and settle into thickly cushioned contour seats. Between the two seats is a narrow, transparent black systems console its surface glittering with multiple rows of brightly colored control prisms. Sibella touches three of them, interfacing the windship's guidance system with the central canal link encoder at Darmus, the huge domed windship port which lies 75 demivectors south of the pyramid. Your request for automatic guidance parameters has been received, Sibella. Your vessel will proceed from the Avatar Pyramid tributary through the Lusaw Canal Intersect to the Daniel Embrya Tributary Arch. Automatic guidance will be terminated and manual control returned as you pass beneath the arch and approach the Kalava Subcanal. Tiny windows fold open the wind ship's thin metal masts, 
releasing a quiet, magnetically generated wind which swells the translucent yellow sails. The small, graceful ship drifts out into the center of the canal, turns 45 degrees, and moves forward to the clean, clear water. Nova Blossom particles flaring in its wake. Deus, what is calorescent spectrocyte? I overheard Zuriel mention it to Karma. Spectrocyte was the liquid light fuel that powered our first starships. We terminated its use long before you were born. Why? Wasn't it efficient? Yes, it was the perfect experimental fuel, Sabella. Efficient, highly unstable, and extremely dangerous. During the third expedition, we killed 9,000 inhabitants of Terra Lu with it. 9,000? Deus, what happened? An accident. A circuit malfunction caused a fuel bay hatch to open, and an armed spectrocyte fuel pod was ejected. The pod exploded on impact between two wilderness cities that stood near the shore of a dying inland sea. When Carmus and Lyria went down in a lander to look for survivors, all they found was a young female in the nearby hills. Was she alive? No. Spectrocyte radiation had transformed her into a pillar of white ionic stone. She stood like a statue, looking back at where the two cities had been. The perimeter of the shadow forest slowly fades into the night as the winged ship leaves the Avatar Pyramid tributary and sails out into the Lusar Canal intercept, the vast artificial lagoon where all of Elithia's equatorial waterways converge. Deus settles back in his seat, looks up at the three moons through half-closed eyes, and slowly wills himself into a memory trance. A chill surges through his body. The nuclei of his secondary blood cells divide, releasing the organically stored experiences of another time. Then a bright rushing sound only he can hear takes his mind 1,000 years into the past. Sunlight and warm winds touch his face. He glides over the sea of echoes in a small windship. In the bright, pale green distance is Reliva Island. On it stands the great white dome of Elithia's Exobionic Observatory. The observatory has been receiving and analyzing scan tracings from two drone flyers which are exploring the void of the nine worlds in the far galaxy of Sirius. Both flyers have discovered something unexpected and ominous. Diabas, the observatory matriarch, is concerned. Have you confirmed it, Diavis? Yes. Sit here beside me, Deus. I'll transfer the visual data to the wall screen. An abstract three-dimensional scan pattern fluoresces onto the large triangular wall monitor and slowly becomes a geological image of multi-layered earth and volcanic rock. Embedded in one of the layers are the mummified bodies of three nude humanoid women Next to them are five black skeletons whose grotesque skulls resemble the heads of ebony gargoyles. Each skeleton lies against a secondary pattern of thin black bones, the bones of what were once large, bat-like wings. Another world contaminated by Darkbringers. Is it a planet in this star system? No. It's in the Sirius galaxy. Terra Lu, the only inhabited planet in the void of the nine worlds. Drone flyer Septus began transmitting these substrata images seven days ago. Was it a full-scale invasion? No. It was confined to a relatively small area near Terra Lu's equatorial meridian. When did it happen? 
19 light eons ago, just as Terralu was entering his third neuroevolution. They lived in caves, Andeos, and ate the flesh of things that crawled and flew. How large was the attack force? One Darkbringer Legion, probably an inquest unit. They invaded the cave settlement, killed the males and children, and then attacked the females. The same assault method they used here, and on Anianus and Telluria. Why didn't the assault extend beyond that one area? The region was destroyed during the attack by a first magnitude strata convulsion and volcanic eruptions. An enormous chasm reached open, and the entire settlement collapsed into it. The Dark Ringer Armada was probably in an observation orbit during the assault. But when they saw the instantaneous destruction of an entire legion, I think they became frightened and moved out into deep space. Yes, you're probably right. They always did become blind with confusion in the presence of unexpected planetary convulsions. Have the reproductive organs of the dead females been analyzed? Drone flyer Erebus transmitted its scanner analysis last night. The bodies of all three females contain traces of calcified Darkbringer insemination fluid. Have you received a retrospective survival projection? Yes. According to the residual biotime scan from drone Erebus, there were over 800 female survivors. All of them inseminated during the assault. None of their newborns had any physical Darkbringer characteristics. But they all emerged from their parent mothers, saturated with the Darkbringer anti-light virus. Has the virus evolved with them? This morning, from an orbital distance of 300 demovectors, Joan Septus Hemo scanned the entire population of Terra Lou. It saw the virus in the blood and bone marrow of every male and female, regardless of tribe or age. And has the virus affected them in the same way it affected us? There are variations, even some resistance at first. But in time, the virus flourishes and the inner light grows dark. Without any evolutionary interference from us, how much longer will the virus control Terralu? A minimum of 500 centuries. But by the end of that time, the entire Sirius galaxy would be contaminated. There's only one choice, isn't there? Yes, an expedition. We know the inner light can be resurrected through induced evolution meditations. We proved that here. We proved it on Anianus and Teluria. Diavis, do you see any reason why our spirit magicians couldn't teach the meditations on Terra Lou? I see two reasons. The Anilite disease wasn't as advanced on those planets. And where Anianus and Teluria were both entering an age of radiance, when the invasions came, Terra Lou is still hyper-primitive and superstitious. It would be impossible to land ships there without terrifying. Our teachers will have to come to Terra Lou from within, not from without. Embryons? Yes. Created from your blood and implanted in their females. It would take time. It would be difficult. It would be dangerous. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. Many expeditions. It will take time. So little progress. It will be difficult. So many of our sons and daughters lost. It will be dangerous. A thousand years. But in the end, the virus will be neutralized. The light will be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. I was just remembering an old friend and a hundred other nights like this and a hundred other expeditions. So much time has passed. 
So many of Alithia's sons and daughters have been lost. A thousand years. And it's just beginning. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight will continue. Uh, pardon me. Isn't that a Cadbury chocolate bar? I've never tried one. Oh, that's too bad. Do you mind if I have a teensy piece? Hey, you took my bar. I'll just take a little bit. It was for my wife and me. Oh, she'll love it. See, this is great. You know you can get carried away with this stuff? Yes, I've noticed. Oh, come on, it's a big bar. It's getting smaller. When people get a taste of a big, thick Cadbury chocolate bar, they get very carried away. Because only a Cadbury bar is so rich, so creamy, so Cadbury. And with the big size Cadbury chocolate bar, you get a big choice. Cadbury fruit and nut, Cadbury almond, Cadbury caramello, and of course the big favorite, Cadbury milk chocolate. So remember, when you get your Cadbury, be careful. Because with Cadbury, people can get very carried away. Uh, can I have my Cadbury back now? Your Cadbury? Oh, well, I guess I got carried away. You'll get carried away with Cadbury. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight continues. What did you do after the dog bringers killed your parent, mother, and father? I escaped into the wilderness of Bas with a group of scientists and technical magicians from the city of Tialin. We thought we'd be safe there. But three days after the initial attack, Darkbringer annihilation squads began saturating the atmosphere and waterways with the virus. Eventually, we all became infected to some degree. The effects of the anti-light disease have never been described to me, Davis. What actually happens? It begins with an underlying discontent with the ceremonies and celebrations of life. Intelligence is corrupted. Emotion displaces logic. Imagination ceases to evolve. The ability to separate the symbols of existence from existence itself disappears. And so does the belief that all life is sacred. The effects are irresistible and inescapable, even in the unconscious sanctuaries of sleep. How long were you in the wilderness? Twenty-five years. Do you know the story of Vershila? Oh, some, but not all of it. Vershila was a mantric high priest who came to us in the wilderness during our 25th year of exile. He told us he had cured himself of the anti-light disease through a series of induced evolution meditations. He had discovered the meditations in the Persana Utvalya Jewel, the ancient Alithian poem of creation. He taught us the meditations, and we healed ourselves. Then we went out from the wilderness and secretly taught the meditations throughout Alithia. And the revolution against the dark bringers began 50 years after that? Yes. Our technical magicians built secret subterranean laboratories where they created ships armed with powerful liquid light injectors. One year after our ships rose up against them, the dark bringers abandoned Alithia and the Age of Radiance began. The winged ship approaches the Tamil Imbria tributary arch. It passes a sun tower complex construction site on the lagoon's northern shore. Polished metal, saucer shaped hover drones lower huge white sun tower obelisks onto thick pads of fluorescent synergite. Giant constructed tripods stand in front of the huge synergite blocks. Their long, flexible arms coiled around the 400-foot-tall sun towers, guiding them into place. The complex is surrounded by multifaceted solar energy domes and power dispersion pyramids made of thick, white crystal. Did you see Shiva today? Yes, we walked in the forest this morning. How does she feel about the new sun tower complex? It looks as though it's nearly finished. She's delighted with its progress. The iron refineries at Lahilia and the floral hatcheries at Vianatet are already drawing power from it. She estimates it'll be fully operational in another six days. Mm. We'll be halfway to Terra Lu in six days. Sabella, 
Are you concerned that the book didn't know if we'd be coming back? What will become of us, Deus? If the ship should fall into a star. The prospect of death doesn't disturb you, does it? No. No, I thought not. Then, what does? Rebirth. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to be reborn on some other planet? One that wouldn't care about our secrets or understand our ecstasies or forgive our failures? There's no such planet, Sibella. Not in this universe. Part one of Earth Life was written by Ron Thompson and starred Olin Soleil as Deus, Rusi Taylor as Sibella, and Lorene Tuttle as Diabas. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Music director, Tom Rollins. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and was distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next week, this is Roger Gussler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of Earthlight from the elsewhere and else when of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury Chocolate Bars hope you've enjoyed Alien Worlds. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. This is Lee Hansen. Again this week, we continue on our mystical journey through a science fiction fantasy adventure that explores the intergalactic origins of spiritual evil and how the inhabitants of the ancient planet of Alithia set out to neutralize that evil over 2,000 years ago. Here, then, are Olin Soule, Lorene Tuttle, Rusi Taylor, Mel Wells, Byron Kane, Susan Silo, and Roger Dressler in part two of our special presentation, Earthlight. <laughs> Inside his pyramid on the ancient planet of Alithia, Deus, Alithia's patriarch, listens as the voice of a sacred dream book reaffirms his sleep visions of another expedition to the planet of Terra Lu. A beautiful woman is blinded by visions of immortality and falls to sleep in a flower field. A star machine floats down into the scented voids of summer. A child is born. A healer of spirits walks across the deep currents of a faraway sea. The suffering are comforted. The dying are healed. The dead are reborn. The healer of spirits ascends to the stars. Terra Lu sinks below the fiery horizons of an alien sun. Faces look up. The sky stands still. Terra Lu. So many expeditions, so little progress, so many of our sons and daughters lost. A thousand years, and it's just beginning. Deus? Ah, oh, come in and sit with me, Sibella. Has the book reaffirmed that we're returning to the Veda sector of Terra Lu? Yes, and it told me about the woman. Her name is Aram. She's young and strong and beautiful. And she's never known the Darkbringer virus. Elisha Ba had never known the virus either. Do they share the same blood? Yes. And because they do, the embryon child implanted in Elisha Ba during the last expedition and the embryon child of this expedition will share the times to come. How are things progressing at Kalava? 
The ship was moved to Dome 3 at sunset for fueling and ancillary pre-flight maintenance. Has Aram's embryon child been taken aboard? Yes. Liria took him into the ship's nucleus chamber at moonrise. How will it end? Tears. Blood. A heart pierced with metal. And what will become of us? Will we return to Alethea? The book didn't know, Sibella. Where the journey back should have been, there was only silence. Well, it's getting late, Sibella. We'd better start for Kalava. At the edge of the wide canal that flows past the pyramid, Deus and Sibella board a slender, transparent metal windship and settle into the deep cockpit behind the bow. Touching three small fluorescent prisms on the control console, Sibella interfaces the wingship's guidance system with Alithia's central canal link encoder. Your request for automatic guidance parameter system receives Sibella. Your vessel will proceed from the Avatar Pyramid tributary through the Luzal Canal intersect to the Tanil Embryo tributary arch. Automatic guidance will be terminated and manual control returned as you pass beneath the arch and approach the Kalava sub -canal. Half an hour later, the wind ship sails out into the Nusa Canal intersect, the vast artificial lagoon where all of Alithia's equatorial waterways converge. Deus settles back in his seat, looks up at Alithia's three moons, and slowly wheels himself into a memory trance that takes his mind 1,000 years into the past. Two Elithian drone flyers have been orbiting Terra Lu, the only inhabited planet in the void of the nine worlds. During their 13th orbit, the two laboratory drones have discovered something unexpected and ominous. Deus is called to Elithia's Exobionic Observatory, where scanner data from the two flyers is being decoded and analyzed. Have you confirmed it, Diavas? Yes. Sit here beside me, Deus. I'll transfer the visual data to the wall screen. A geological image of multi-layered earth and volcanic rock fluoresces onto the large triangular wall monitor. Embedded in one of the layers are the mummified bodies of three nude humanoid women and the remains of five long black skeletons. Each skeleton lies against a secondary pattern of thin black bones, the bones of what were once large bat-like wings. The skulls resembled the heads of ebony gargoyles. Another world contaminated by darkbringers. When did it happen? Nineteen light eons ago. Just as Terralu was entering its third neuroevolution. They lived in caves then, Deus. And ate the flesh of things that crawled and flew. How large was the attack force? One Darkbringer Legion. Probably an inquest unit. They invaded the cave settlement, killed the males and children, and then attacked the females. Why didn't the assault extend beyond that one area? The region was destroyed during the attack by a first magnitude strata convulsion and volcanic eruptions. Have the reproductive organs of the dead females been analyzed? Drone flyer Erebus transmitted its scanner analysis last night. The bodies of all three females contain traces of calcified darkbringer insemination fluid. Have you received a retrospective survival projection? There were over 800 female survivors. All of them inseminated during the assault. None of their newborns had any physical Darkbringer characteristics. But they all emerged from their parent mothers, saturated with the Darkbringer anti-light virus. Has the virus evolved with them? This morning, from an orbital distance of 300 demovectors, Don Septus Hemo scanned the entire population of Terralu. It saw the virus in the blood and bone marrow of every male and female, regardless of tribe or age. 
And has the virus affected them in the same way it affected us? There are variations. Even some resistance at first. But in time, the virus flourishes and the inner light grows dark. There's only one choice, isn't there? Yes, an expedition. We know the inner light can be resurrected through induced evolution meditations. We proved that here. We proved it on Hanayanas and Teluria. Diavis, do you see any reason why our spirit magicians couldn't teach the meditations on Terra Lou? I see two reasons. The Anulite disease wasn't as advanced on those planets. And where Anianus and Teluria were both entering an age of radiance, when the invasions came, Terra Lou is still hyper-primitive and superstitious. It would be impossible to land ships there without terrifying. Our teachers will have to come to Terra Lou from within, not from without. Embryons? Yes. Created from your blood and implanted in their females. It would take time. It would be difficult. It would be dangerous. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. The Avis. The Avis. Deus. Deus? Ah, Sabella. I was just remembering an old friend and a hundred other nights like this and a hundred other expeditions. A thousand years. And it's just beginning. Alien World Special Presentation Earth Night will continue. Pardon me, isn't that a Cadbury chocolate bar? I've never tried one. Oh, that's too bad. Do you mind if I have a teensy piece? Hey, you took my bar. I'll just take a little bit. It was for my wife and me. Oh, she'll love it. See, this is great. You know you can get carried away with this stuff? Yes, I've noticed. Oh, come on, it's a big bar. It's getting smaller. When people get a taste of a big, thick Cadbury chocolate bar, they get very carried away. Because only a Cadbury bar is so rich, so creamy, so Cadbury. And with the big size Cadbury chocolate bar, you get a big choice. Cadbury fruit and nut, Cadbury almond, Cadbury caramello, and of course the big favorite, Cadbury milk chocolate. So remember, when you get your Cadbury, be careful. Because with Cadbury, people can get very carried away. Uh, can I have my Cadbury back now? Your Cadbury? Oh, well, I guess I got carried away. You'll get carried away with Cadbury. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight continues. Was the book able to calculate the time lapse between our departure from Elithia tonight and our penetration of Terra Luz gravity veil? Yes. Eleven solar days, nine phenomena. When will we make contact with Era? Three phenomena past sunrise on the morning of the twelfth day. She'll be alone in a field near a village, gathering red and white flowers. Red and white. Blood and purity. Yes. The two elements that will haunt Aram to the end of her days. Deus, Sabella, you are now approaching the Taniel Imbria tributary arch. As you pass beneath it, automatic guidance will be terminated, and manual control of your wingship will be returned. May the spirits of the twelve lords of light be with you on your journey to Daralu. As the canal link override terminates, Sabella touches a control prism, which activates a triple row of bright rectangular lights in the bow. Then she steers the windship through the wide Tanil Imbria tributary and enters the narrow Kalava sub canal. A few moments later, the slim, transparent vessel glides across a small lagoon and docks at the edge of the Kalava Starflight Complex. The 
complex is a vast, circular plain, flawlessly paved with interlocking triangles of white gemstone and red fire crystal. Hundreds of hexagon-shaped lamps free float around the perimeter, focusing brilliant light on six enormous copper-colored domes, a triple row of sun towers, and the primary launch arena. At the Calava dock, Deus and Sabella secure their windship and board a small hover drone which takes them across the gemstone and fire crystal plain to Dome 3. Inside the dome's airlock, Deus and Sabella remove their long dark cloaks and fold them into a small compartment in the wall. Later, they enter the dome's asepsis chamber and close their eyes and stand motionless as antiseptic light and sound sterilize their hair, skin, and outer garments. Then, a large circular hatch irises open in front of them, and they step through into the dazzling light of the dome's interior. In the center of the dome is Alithia's most powerful and complex starship, a huge overloid spacecraft created from organically grown metals. It rests heavily on three massive pneumatic parking spheres and dwarfs the 50 technicians who move over its seamless polished metal surface. Parked in front of the starship are three teardrop-shaped tug crawlers. The transparent canopies slid open. Six technicians string thin metal cables between the rear of the crawlers and towing rings on the ship. What do the inhabitants of Terra Lux think happens to them after death? They believe that if they live lives of kindness and affection, their dream selves transmigrate to the serenities of Empyria. And if they live negative lives? Then their dream selves transmigrate to the fires of Stygia. But those regions were destroyed during the subvoid annihilations. The Darkbringer Archipelago had its genesis in the fires of Stygia long before the annihilations. But as life was evolving on its surface, the archipelago left its orbit and passed through Empyria. And in this passing, Empyria's light began to destroy the Darkbringer primitives. But they survived and continued to evolve under the delusion that physical and spiritual light were their deadliest enemies. In the center of the starship's nucleus chamber, the primary genesis tank floats one meter above the floor. Inside the transparent egg-shaped tank, suspended in a shimmering mist of chill vapor, is the tiny embryon child. He floats on his side, Delicate fingers curled against his face, eyes closed, dreaming of the warmly scented summer voices that lie ahead, and the beautiful woman who will end the chemical winter in which he sleeps. Just look at him, Sabella. He's beautiful. He takes after his father, Dave. Lyria, is 12 solar days still the maximum span he'll be safe in cryosleep? I was able to extend it to 15 days by altering the inversion factor of the chill vapor crystal. Uh -huh. But 15 is the zero time maximum. Any longer and the altered crystals will begin to neutralize his cellular divinity. Zurio, have you calculated our time to Terra Lure's gravity veil? 11 solar days, 9 phenomenas. Is that... An absolute calculation? Absolutely. Why are you so amused, Deus? Eleven solar days, nine phenomenas is precisely what the book said. It also said we're returning to the Vita sector for an encounter with a beautiful young woman named Aram. Suriel, have you synthesized a copy of the book? I don't synthesize books, Sibella. I only synthesize Nimbus filters. <laughs> so I've heard. Suriel, how did you know about Aram and the Vita sector? Aram's neuropulse is the only one in the bio-index terminal free of viral contamination. 
when I scanned the pulse, I found a first magnitude Vita sector imprint. It seems you've finally become as wise as the book, Surio. Surio, are we coming back from this expedition? I don't know. You're right, Lyria. He has become as wise as the book. It didn't know either. <laughs> Deus, may I see you for a moment? Yes, Carlos. Where are you? I'm in the system's index chamber. Zuriel, you and Sabella go into the guidance chamber and begin the pre-launch procedures. Lyria, we'll have our usual talk after void entry. Is there a technical problem, Thomas? No. The problem isn't technical, although technology was involved. I don't understand. I know we're returning to the Vita sector of Terra Lu, and I know the woman's name is Aaron. Mm. Zuriel? No, I... I knew before Zuriel did. I was so curious to know where we were going that I got carried away and synthesized a copy of the book last night. Carmas. Yes, Deus. Is nothing sacred. <laughs> Alien Worlds special presentation of Earthlight will continue. From Peter Paul. Cool as the snow falling light on the trees. Just take a bite for a cool in the breeze. Daddy York, government party. And get the sensation. Get the sensation. The cool combination. Drop the element. Your peppermint patty. Cool the sensation. The perfect relation. Drop the element. From Peter Paul. Sends a shiver of cool right there. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight continues. Inside the dome, the three tug crawlers inch forward, tightening the thin towing cables that connect them to the ship. A huge section of the dome wall slides open. The tug crawlers move through the opening toward the brightly lit launch arena. Behind them, the giant starship rolls forward on its massive parking spheres. In the guidance chamber, Deus, Sibella, and Zuriel sit in cushioned pod chairs, facing a massive instrument console. Its dark metal surface, alive with control prisms, regulator diodes, sequencer jewels, interface crystals, and iridescent decoder keys. Start the pre-emanation cycle on the artificial gravity radiator, Sibella. Interior gravity is stable at E.3. Grav factor links are sequenced to convert to E.9 during corridor penetration and E.12.1 at void entry. Deus, an ion storm is forming in the penetration corridor over Illyria. Carmos, we need a revised launch velocity. Just a moment. A launch velocity of KPS 0. .660 will take us through the storm before its primary spectrum collision phase. KPS 0. .660. Sibella, engage the exterior hyperlight coils when we launch. Ion storms are too unpredictable not to take precautions. Yes, Deus. The ship is in position, Deus, and the towing vehicles have cleared the launch arena. Engage the ancillary pulse drive reactor, Sabella. Reactor engagement confirmed. Solar power matrix is stable at multiple sublinks 8, 18, and 80. 
All ship register encoders, guidance optics, and inverter grids are hyperlinked and scanning. Release the parking spheres, Sibella. A hexagon-shaped hatch irises open in the bottom of the ship, and a huge green tripod slowly telescopes down. Thick metal flex shock pads unfold from the tip of each tripod leg and press against the launch arena's white gemstone floor. The ship raises slightly, releasing the parking spheres which slowly roll away into the anchoring depressions at the arena's perimeter. Pod chair emergency ejection hatches are armed. Pod chair floater cone nozzles are in phase. REM scale time to launch is Tricon 0.3.1. Retract the tripods, Rail. The bright metal tripod withdraws into the ultraviolet glow of its storage bay, leaving the huge lithium starship suspended 25 meters above the arena. Nine round ports iris open around the concealed tripod hatch, releasing thin beams of dazzling white light. Lubricant exhaust fans blast raw magnetic waste against the arena floor, raising a translucent wave of fine white dust which rolls out over the anchored parking spheres. Reactor interlock at binary 2.3.1. Three ribbons of crimson hyperlight blink on around the edge of the ship. Then the huge spacecraft slowly rotates 90 degrees and begins its majestic ascent. of 30 demo vectors, the ship is a tiny overloid shadow and nine pinpoints of light. At 120 demo vectors, the starship backs 18 degrees, angles up, and races toward the penetration corridor over Illyria. Suddenly, as it began, the crisis is over, and the ship accelerates out through Elithia's shimmering aurora sphere into the starlit serenity of deep space. Is our embryon child safe, Lyria? Yes, it is. Safe and sleeping. Have you decided what his name will be? His name is the word the ancient thought magicians used to describe the power of the inner self. The word is Jesus, and it means I am become the healer of worlds. Thompson and starred Olin Soleil as Deus, Lucy Taylor as Sibella, Mel Wells as Karmas, Byron Kane as Zuriel, Susan Silo as Luria, and Lorene Tuttle as Diabas. Associate producer Ron Thompson, engineer Stu Jacobs, music director Tom Rounds, assistant to the producer Jim Cook, technical consultant Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, The Seeds of Time, 
from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury Chocolate Bars hope you've enjoyed Alien